<laughs> Lance singing in German never, ever, ever, ever gets old. Welcome, everybody. John and Lance on this Wednesday morning, through next three hours, along with Dell, here with you on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 if you want to get in someone. 3780-3776. Busy night for our teams last night. One win, one loss. And uh, it just is uh, heartbreaking to see this. I don't. I didn't even. I, do you know what a Wander Swero is? I'd never heard of a Wander Swero before nope. last night. I had never heard of a Wander Swero. I swear, I have never heard of that. And then he comes in and just bam, crack, and it's over. But you got to score with a runner on second base and nobody out. It, it, you know, um, more. Away teams win in extra innings now. Have you seen? Have you seen that stat? No, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I guess if you jump out, and you're supposed to jump out when you have a runner on second and nobody out, you're supposed to jump out right away. And I think that's been happening more for the visitors. And uh, yes, yeah, so um, the Astros didn't score in their top top half of the tenth, and uh, boom, bang, bing, it's over. Of zero pitches or zero outs, uh, one run. It's not earned, but bing, boom, bing, it's over. And the Astros lose it 4-3. to three. Jordan is the only, apparent, apparently the only guy that is, I mean, this guy is just such a monster. And he's the only one that's woken up. His, his last uh, three or four games have been just fab- fantastic. There's just no consistency, though. I mean, you're getting hits. You got guys on. Tucker's two for five. You got a hit out of Bregman, Yiner, McCormick, Abreu. Everybody's getting hits. Jeremy got two, uh, one for three for Dubom. I don't know why you would ever pinch hit Jonathan Singleton for Dubom, but that happened again, and that's bothersome. Um, but here, you know, you're, you're getting all these all kinds of hits. You're just not coming up with, you know, there's no merry-go-round. You got to get some runs. Come yeah, on. it's not. They're not putting it together. I think they could. You know, they could really use – it's so many singles and homers. Singles and homers is what you're looking at. I mean, they could really use uh, a leadoff walk and then so many doubles in the gap and just – I don't know. It's They're just missing that crooked number ability that we've seen in the past with the Astros. Now, it's, it's come up and it's gone down, but the single run innings are great if you're scoring a bunch of them. But And, of course, you know, I don't want to be the one who – because we talked just the other day about, hey, you got to score multiple innings. You can't just – put up numbers in one inning and be done with it. Well, you know, it's it's both. Like, Christian Javier did enough. He's still not where you want him to be. Three walks yesterday, four strikeouts in, what, five and a third? Yeah, five and a third. It was okay. This is not a vintage Christian Javier game. Gave up five hits, three walks. So he gave up eight uh, base runners in, in, in five and a third innings. Not great. Four strikeouts. Christian Javier is better than that. So I can't say he's on his Christian Javier stuff because he's not. But it's, you know, you'll take it. You'll take it to earn runs. Um, and the bullpen, once again, did their job for the second night in a row. They they did what they were supposed to do, which was get you through it. I mean, Montero was able to actually get out. Uh, Ryan Presley only allowed two base runners in an inning, which is a positive. You know, one walk, one hit, and one inning. I mean, I feel like that's... We're making progress. No here. runs, okay. No runs. I know. I know. I said I feel like we're making. He's got his ERA down to eleven fifty seven. Josh nice. Hader continues his dominant run. He still has, uh, well, it's a six ERA, but uh, he got to he he was able to start a a, a streak of an inning scoreless, which was good. Actually, I think it's two straight appearances where he hasn't allowed. Yeah, run. yeah, two yeah. straight. So yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, no, Stop. no, no, no. That's not two straight. It's one straight. Well, one in a row. There you go. It's off one to a start. One in a row after no, having no three strikeouts. in a row where he had given up runs. And no strikeouts in that run. What did you think of, and now all of a sudden, man. Yeah, he ended a strikeout in his last three appearances, three innings, no strikeouts. What did you think of uh, Caratini batting for Abreu? Pinch hitting. I liked it. I know, right? The guy had a home run the game before, so good yeah. enough for me. That's that. Uh, no, he's and he dude can he can rank a little bit. A left-handed bat. You're not getting any production out of those two. If Caratini all of a sudden now there is a lot of talk about Joey Loperfido now. He's he's uh, he had another big a nice night last night. I think he walked three times. 
uh, but he is his OPS is over a thousand. He's playing first base now. He's got a couple, three or four starts now at first base, and there's a lot of talk that maybe. I mean, you're going to have to eat two more years of Abreu, two years of this at 19 and a half each. But, I mean, what do you want to win or do you want to just have him make outs? Boy, he looks awful. I mean, it is awful. The pitches that he's swinging at, it just is – it's sad, really. Well, I mean, look, you don't – the problem you, you run into, if, if you're a cover-your-ass organization – then you let a mistake beat you twice. And the mistake is the contract, and then the second mistake is playing them all the time because you're trying to validate the contract. Don't let a mistake beat you twice. If he's not the right guy, if you decide he's not the right guy, then suck it up and just deal with the money part of it. But don't let him beat you on the field, too, with bad at-bats. So well, um, I, I don't think – now, John, I don't think Jim Crane, I don't think Jeff Bagwell – I don't think uh, Reggie Jackson, I, you know, I'm going with the power trio. I don't think Dana uh, Brown, and I don't think that uh, Joe Espada are going to give up on on, on a Bray right away. They're not going to do that. But the reality is most of the time that Jose Abreu has been an Astro, it's been below average to bad. And I know we can all live with that one six-week run, you know, seven week run and think that that's who he is but everything else will tell you that was the outlier you're four and eight okay and i know it's early it's 12 games in you're not even you're not even a 10th through the season yet we haven't I, even hit the we have it's four yeah, and eight we haven't even hit the lead story lead yeah. story is from Valdez went on the il yesterday yeah so what yeah. they were hoping was going to be just a short little everything's fine now he's on the 15 day il so the the lead story is you're four and eight with Verlander's not back yet, you already know Garcia. Well, but look, what you need to know is three guys who are supposed to be there pitching for you this year. Verlander's out. Fromber's now out for 15 days. And Urquidy, we don't have new news on it, but it doesn't feel good. It, we know he's going to be out for a while at least. Well, There's three it, of yeah. your five who are gone. Yeah, and now you got Spencer Arigetti coming up. So you got some Italian. It starts in today. Yeah, he, I mean, everybody's he's immediately back. starting. It, yeah, he, everybody else gets pushed back, and thankfully so. I guess Arigetti was on. This was on his schedule, so he gets to come up now. I, who knows who's who's in schedule on, in Sugarland next? Because the other day we got a Henley or a Handley or whatever he was, and Blair, and we got and it was his day to pitch in Sugarland. So today's his day to pitch in Sugarland. So he gets to pitch today for the Houston Astros. That's how we're doing it now. Whoever was supposed to pitch in Sugarland gets to pitch now for the Houston Astros. Ari Alexander with Channel at. Two, who does a good job of hustling out there. Um, I think he's a former baseball player. He put scouting report on Eric Gerdy. Four seam fastball with good vertical action. Think Javier style, ninety three to ninety four miles an hour. Big sweeper, twenty seven hundred plus spin rate. 79 to 80 miles an hour. High spin curveball can get to 3,000 oh. reps, uh, 3,000 rotations. Average uh, 2,800. Cutter at 87 to 88. Change up at 85 to 86. Gets swing and misses. Can nibble and get in trouble with walks. So, well, that's all I hear when you give me spin, a high spin rate on his fastball and curveball. Tommy John, that's what I hear. That's all I hear. All right, because that's what every that's what's what, what the kid all the kids are doing these days. Yeah, that's what they're all doing. Little Tommy John, uh, Spencer Arigetti tonight. But you know what? Uh, uh, everybody was really pleased with them early on at spring training. So we'll see whether or not Spencer Arigetti can come up and do the you know do some damage here at the big league level. The, the Royals are playing good baseball right now. They're the Royals. We know where they'll be. The Astros are not playing good baseball right now. We but we know where they'll be at the end of the season. Uh, but it's just uh, it's a, it's so frustrating. This the, yeah, look at your look at the rotation. I mean, we talked about this yesterday with the, the, the five guys that you've got on the IL. Uh, the, that rotation is as good is is probably seventh, eighth, ninth best in big league in the big leagues. With Garcia, if he was back to uh, or Keedy, with McCullers, with Fromber, and with J, uh, JV. I I mean, are you kidding me? That's all IL. Uh, and the and the Astros now they're still they still got a nice rotation if you want to know the truth but it's not 
And Hunter Brown better start coming through. That's that's uh, that's going to be a key to this season. Hunter Brown actually uh, being able to pitch a little bit this year. He's got he's he, he's got to be wearing on him a little bit um, because he, you know last year he just wasn't good. He's coming into this year uh, with a horrible start to start his season. So he's got he's got to be better. And we got the American League pitcher of the well, we got the American League player of the week in Rennell. So. Uh, here we go. Astros lose again. Rockets win. That's a pretty good basketball team over there, the Orlando Magic. And the Rockets just took care of that business. Jumped out early to an 11-point lead and just cruised uh, the rest of the way and beat uh, beat the Magic by 12. Um, we'll, we'll hear from Ime a little bit. We, we talk about about this team, Lance, and the, and the toughness that they've, got, they've gotten. Uh, Ime addressed it. He, you know, we got another technicals last night, and you know he's leading the world in technicals. Um, Ime is, and so that's 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 our, the coach, and the team takes on his tenor, and he ain't afraid of it. He he's not afraid of technicals. We'll hear from him on the other side about about his team's toughness and the technicals. Uh, but first, let's qu- let's break it quickly here. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Anybody wants to get in here, you got to talk about uh, Vanderford. Yeah, Vanderford Air. They came out to my home a couple of weeks ago, and it was great. I got the uh, the checkpoint system that they have. It's something that's very affordable, but it's also very necessary because they will go through your entire system and give you a report on everything. Take pictures. I mean, it's really Will did a did a great job of running me through everything. There were some small things where <clears throat> a bracket had come loose in my actual system. And there was something that, that – so they had to put the bracket back on to put the – whatever this thing was back in place. Then they showed me exposed wires I had where I had a yard guy come out and he used, I guess, whenever he had his his little, uh, you know, his 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 clippers that he uses to, to cut around the area, it cut into a protective, a protective shield that were supposed to protect the wires, and there were exposed wires – and I was very, very close to just shorting out the whole system, which would have been a disaster. They rewrapped it. I'm glad they found that. They cleaned out my uh, emergency system, which was full of – I hadn't done that in three years. It was full of just mold and just – or whatever. It was, algae. It was, it was gross. And that was just on the verge of backing up and becoming water all over my attic. I mean, it's little things like that that you really need to look into. And, of course, I had them uh, – I had them uh, – uh, install a whole home dehumidifier, and now my humidity in my home is sitting at about 52%. That's a low dew point, ladies and gentlemen. That means I'm comfortable in my home. They can fix your air conditioning issues, or they can get a new one installed for you completely from the ground floor up so that you are comfortable, and not only that, you're efficient coming up this this uh, nasty summer we're going to have. So make sure that you have an efficient system with a brand-new unit, if that's what you need, that fits your home or you get fixed what needs to be fixed at a very fair and reasonable price. Never any emergency fees, never any overnight, you know, overtime charges. That's not the way they work. 281-557. Cool. I finally found you an air conditioning system or, or a company that you can trust. It's Vanderford Air. 281-557. C-O-O-L.
Free Rain Coffee. Free Rain Coffee. R E I N. Free Rain Coffee. Love it. I wish I, I'm not home, so I, I can't have my free rain, and I, I do miss it in the morning. I do, I do miss it here. Coming back today, so I will be able to get some. I'll have it tomorrow morning before the show. But I love waking up with that free rain coffee. It's it, it, They've got, you know, a saying over there, wake up, uh, free rain coffee, uh, work, repeat. Dream coffee, work, repeat. Dream coffee, work, repeat. Get up and get after it with free rain coffee. Slow roasted in small batches, unbeatably smooth and full, rich flavor coffee. I mean, I'm telling you, I like it. I, I, I really, really enjoy my free rain coffee, and you will too. It's different. It's not that bitter taste in coffee that you just accept and pay $7 a cup for. This is different. This is Texas, okay? America loves America. Free rain coffee loves America. So go to 975coffee.com. 975coffee.com. Order yours. Put in promo code ESPN20 for 20% off site-wide. I'm telling you, you will love it. Tweet me about, or X me, whatever, uh, about about your free reign experience. 975coffee.com. Promo code ESPN20. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. So for the first time, I heard Dell this morning, Lance, when he said uh, 30 seconds, all right, to your commercial. Yeah. I was trying to get on for uh, most of the morning, and nobody was there. You have a theory about what was going on there? I think there's an outside chance that Dell may have at a CVS attacked a homeless man who was laying he, too close to the red box and he was trying Del to get a movie out of box, the red uh, box. Uh, yeah. He's trying to get a movie out of red box and he may have pulled a little Terrence Jones and just <laughs> gently nudged the man away with his foot and leg so that he could get the notebook starring Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams. I don't have do that. You, I don't need to do that. I have a hard copy of that at home. Oh, well, Joe, so do you have any proof of this, or you just think this is it's what It's a theory, happened? right? Now. It's I'm a theory he's working on. It's a theory on. I'm working on right now. Do you want to report me to the police for n- gently nudging a homeless man? Not yet. You never do that stuff until you have enough evidence. How are you I've learned come? this from watching shows, Dale. You know this, too. Mm-hmm. You don't go too quickly until you have enough to get the conviction. So how are you going to get, gather evidence? I'm going to head out to... You don't Baytown, even know it's CVS. Where you live. I'm going out to the Baytown CVS's. It's, oh, sure, you should do that and see what you gather. <laughs> Go out to the Baytown CVS. And see what I... Uh, a CVS I've never been to no, in my life. No, he's from Alvin. I'm not he, from, Alvin. from Alvin. I did go to school in Alvin, but I'm not from Alvin. <clears throat> so, well, that, then you're from there. You missed, man. There was a bad storm in the middle of the night. Oh, yeah? Woke me up. Yeah, lightning, thunder. It was... Yeah, it was It was bad. Supposedly, there were going to be tornadoes in it. and all. Hopefully, I don't know. I haven't heard anything, but... Hopefully everything ended up okay with that storm. Uh, I don't know. So you missed that one. You haven't missed anything else. Just been overcast, humid. Oh, we had an eclipse while you were gone. I uh, I saw it. I had did. an eclipse here. Oh, did you? Oh, was it yeah, where we you had were one, too? Okay. We had one here too. Yeah, we yeah. had an eclipse. It was kind of and a actually, baby eclipse. And then I, I s- was hoping they'd sure run it back, it but they didn't run here. it back yesterday. We saw it better here in uh, Dallas. I speak fluent Dallas now. By the way, you're uh, – uh, pictures of you showed up on uh, TV last night. So I heard. I see. Yeah, I heard about that. I see. Yeah, I saw it. Where, I see where the, were his seats? Uh, literally right behind the glass. Behind, behind the, his cousin. Behind his behind the dugout. Yeah. What do you mean the baseball? I thought he was at a hockey game. Yeah, it is. I call it a dugout. For it's our, not really the, a dugout. You mean the bench? The yeah, bench. they, you they call also bench. call it. They also use no, the phrase. No, dugout. They, no they, they don't. Really don't. No, they don't. Well, they should. Right. Right. But um, you were no, right behind were, the glass, behind the bench. I was, yeah, I was right behind. Right, I mean, he was standing in front of me the whole game. Yeah. Why would visiting team get that good of seats? Friend of the the uh, opposing coach. When you go no, the online, the opposing coach, the opposing coach gets seats that good. The, he didn't get those seats. I we went online and bought them. We? Yeah. Who's me we? And Justin. You and Frankie. 
<laughs> me, no, Frankie didn't go. Frankie was at the Jer- the Devils game last night. Um, what are so, you a hockey yeah, family now? Yeah, For the first always, family of hockey in Houston. I don't first family I, of hockey. In I'm not sure if you know this, but yeah, got a Hall of Famer in the family. Well, we're got talking another, about your particular. Well, family. the Granado name. Well, sure. Oh, but there was a guy. There was a guy behind me. That was just screaming about the the entire third period at Donnie. Granado, you suck. You suck. Do something. Do you know he was talking about Donnie or you? Yeah, I'm not sure. I wasn't sure. Was that a Houston listener? Granado. He kept saying, Granado, you suck. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, I, you're, you're a little aggressive listener. Was it Yanni? It wasn't Yanni. Okay. It could have. It could have been. Could have been one of your friends. But, but this guy was bowed up. I was gonna. About, I was gonna say something like, like, what the? Would you like him? Was to it do? Rowdy Yates? It wasn't Rowdy Yates. Okay. But the dude was pretty bowed up, and he was screaming at him, and I, and he's like, "Do something!" And I'm like, "Okay, do you want him to go out on the ice, or what would you like him to do? Switch exactly. up the lines or something." Hey, that, you, you guys. You, you've never seen this, but it is amazing, the line shift changes. It is – I mean, it's 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 amazing how quick and – it, it, and you're on the ice for for sometimes – and a lot of times, less than a minute, and guys are coming in and out and in and out. The co- the coordination – we can't do a snap without Laramie Tunsil jumping offside. The coordination that they have – on line shifts are it's amazing it's amazing it really is me and, me and Justin were like holy crap this is I don't know how guys can they know exactly because I didn't see him once going okay line one line two one line three I didn't it just is it just happens it's it's pretty it's pretty impressive actually and without you know without messing it up I, you know in hockey you you know the guy gets to still be on the ice when you jump over the bench and you get into the game it's a little bit different but there there it is it's pretty pretty cool actually i never been right there behind the bench like that it's uh it's uh there's a there's a lot that goes into it they lost last night 3 to 2 um and they fo- they've fallen uh they're they're still right there at 500 but people are not and I, we had a listener who was in oh that's the other thing about this holy crap guys their american airlines center and Globe Life Stadium, forget the stadiums, which are better than our stadiums. Their stadiums are better than our stadiums. I, I really like Globe Life a lot, although it's, it's, it's a it's, you know, my, Minute Maid is great. It's, it's fine. And, and, and the Toyota Center okay, is, is good. It's not great, but it's not good. But their setups there, they have, I mean, you want to talk, there's all kinds of stores and bars, and especially at Globe Life, at Globe Life, they have a bar that is – it is amazing. The TV wall must be 40 feet high with, I don't know, 30 TVs on it. And, with, and it's just – and it's the same not, – not nearly as big, but at the, at the American Airlines Arena, they're set up for pre- and post-games with, with bars and food and everything you could possibly – it's amazing. Is this it for is everybody or awesome. do you have to have a special pass? No, no, for everybody. Everybody who goes into the arenas. Including I mean, including the TVs. You should have seen how many people at Globe Life, the Rangers game on Monday night, watching the NCAA at these bars. And in Arlington, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's right by Six Flags, and it's right by AT and T Stadium. It's not like it's downtown with destination where people and people live there. And it was packed. And there, there, it's like twelve bars. It's amazing how. It is so good. Now you go to Toyota Center. What do you got there? You got China Garden across the street, but you don't have anywhere. I mean, you got I, there's very little places to go. This setup that they have here. Well, no, there's some places around there. I mean, you may have to walk over near. There's more over by Lance, Minute Maid. It's not even. It's there's it's, more near Minute Maid, but yeah, no, oof. I'm sure it's not even close. And, well, because, and even Minute Maid, they, the bus is. Shut. <clears throat> I mean, it's. I, I thought mean, you were not, joking, Lance. Earlier in the week, you kept calling him Dallas Johnny and Chotch Johnny. Oh, no, he loves it so much. Why didn't he move there? No, 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 no. I'm just saying we got to pick it up. We need to pick it up. We want to take some businesses out of – you know, there's a lot more around Minute Maid Park than you're giving it credit for, though. Uh, There's Jim Crane. Yeah, 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 there's more. Well, Jim Crane has – 
his his restaurants. He's got a couple of restaurants right there. Zochi is there, which you is know what, a nationally what I, renowned. What I've heard Jim Crane wants to do uh, is, I, and I don't know, I don't know if it's if it's going to come for, to fruition, but that he was going to cover Texas Avenue and make it a giant plaza kind of bar thing going on right there. It, right in front of Minute Maid. I don't know where that is on, on how it's happening, but he bought up that land from the bus and whatnot, and hopefully he creates that kind of atmosphere and pregame. I'm telling you, we, we've gone to a lot of parks we, uh, for the first round of the, of, of, of the playoffs, a lot of parks, and we are behind, we're behind on that, and we got we got to catch up on that because it could be a great destination pre- and post our games that we don't have yet. We just don't yeah, have Yeah, but they're it. not – who's going to buy and develop all that stuff? Jim Crane is. He's already bought He's already bought up a bunch of land right so around So he's going to do all that stuff? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah, as long as, it's, as long as it's ownership doing it, that's no problem. Yeah. yeah. Or fans someone – Fans don't want to pay for that anymore. No, 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 no. You're not paying for that. That's a – that's – Yeah. That's going to be bar business. Right, but it. I'm telling. It is. Re- it's really impressive what they've done around the stadium. I think you know. Place. I just in full disclosure, I've said this before, before, but not for a while. <clears throat> so I went out and uh, isn't 2000 mattress Mac sent me out with uh, listeners, and we went to the Final Four in Indianapolis. It can see at the time Conseco State, Conseco Fieldhouse, and um, it was listeners of 610 at the time and. It was 2000. The Flintstones were playing from Michigan State against Florida, and I don't remember who else was in it. But anyway, um, one of the reasons was, was because the initiative for a new basketball stadium from the summit had been defeated by the voters. The voters had approved; they had approved baseball for Minute Maid Park. They had defeated basketball for the Rockets, and there was a concern. You know, Les Alexander was talking about potentially having to move. And Mattress Mac was very in with the Rockets at that point. And so he wanted, I guess, me to talk about how great it was, the getting the new stadium and yada, 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 to help, you know, to help sway listeners or whatever the case was. And I went to Conseco, and I was pretty blown away. Conseco was, you know, they kept the old school Indiana feel. And if you've never been there, the way it's built, it's built more instead of out, it's built more up. So there's great, you know, it's funny. The game that we saw, we didn't go. The, the game that we saw on Saturday, we'd gone to a basketball game, or on was it Friday or man? No, it was Saturday afternoon. We went, and it was the USA youth, you know, eighteen and under team taking on the international eighteen and under. Tony Parker was the point guard uh, for the international for France. He was eighteen years old, and we got to watch Tony Parker. But regardless, the thing was when I went to Conseco, when I went to Conseco, I thought, man, this is great. And I talked about it when on the radio. And when they built the stadium and I went in Toyota, I was like, ah, this yeah. is so wide. Like, it's built outwards. It should have been more vertical. You know, it right. should have been built upwards because it keeps you closer to the floor. So when you said that about Toyota Center is just okay, I'm in complete agreement. I mean, I don't think it's bad, but I don't think the fans are as close to the action it, as it they probably it, need to be. It doesn't have, it doesn't have character. It doesn't. It doesn't really. You know. You know, like I, I've been to this stadium before, American Airlines before, and it. It now I will say this: the seats are tighter than. I mean, I remember I told you guys when I went to see Real Madrid play that you the seats. It's amazing. I don't. They're, they're smaller people, those Spaniards. They're a little smaller than we are. So it was. I was it's sitting in the seat like holy crap! You y'all are right on top of each other. Uh, it was a lot, a lot like that. I had a big girl sitting next to me, and uh, and it was like, oh my god, she could barely get into the seat. I mean, barely fit into it. And so, <laughs> actually, uh, Justin and I went and got beers and came back. By the way, they had Miller Lite there, and so that was much better than than having to drink Modelo's last night. But uh, got back, and Justin ended up going into the line first, and he sat next to her all night. That was kind of funny. Anyway, um, <laughs> Are you so, so we got to break it here. We'll get to that Are email. We, uh, just so Justin lost out because he had to sit next to Porky, Hog, Fat Ass, <laughs> Double Wide, Butterball. That's what you're saying? You weren't. It wasn't about the hockey? 
I didn't say that. You see, you you said that. No, though. no, you said big girl, and then you started laughing because Justin had to sit next to her. <laughs> he did. Oh, uh, okay. Time to talk about underdog. Yeah, underdog fantasy. <clears throat> so yesterday was a tough one because you have in game. How about this in game fantasy or in game uh, pick them challenges where they will alter the point score, points, rebounds, assists, whatever. Like there could be five, six different statistics. And so whatever they're sitting at now, Underdog has their own algorithm where you know, uh, where they will change that number. So remember, you can start a brand new one in the middle of watching a game that's in, in the process of going on and pick whether or not Altuve will have you know a run scored. It may be at .5, and you can still get it. But the, the odds, if we're in the third or fourth inning, now the odds are three times, for example. Sometimes you'll see things at over five times the odds. And so you pick between two and five. But just remember, you can win big. I had a friend of mine who played. Uh, he had Ellie De La Cruz to 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 score a run, and De La Cruz, and this is in the sixth inning. It was at five point seven times the the play. It had a chili pepper there. He played that and one other one, and his and his uh, fifteen dollar play turned into three hundred. He won three hundred just by winning two plays. Listen, you can win a hundred times your original action, and. All you have to do is pick between two and five players. It's completely legal here in the state of Texas, and it's real money. So you got a chance to win real money. Now, I'm going to start you off with some free money <coughs> by telling you if you use promo code Lance, they're going to double your original deposit up to $100. So they'll, they'll match your deposit up to 100 and anything you deposit beyond that, they don't match. But this is a great way to watch the Masters and play along with it. Yes, they've got golf on there. They've got UFC. They've got pro basketball. And of course, they have baseball and football as well. It's all available at Underdog Fantasy, the leader in the space. UnderdogFantasy.com. Use promo code Lance. Must be 18 or older and present in the state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms and conditions apply. If you feel like you have a gambling problem, call 1 800 Gambler. Go to ncpgambling.org. All right, so Houston safe and lock and King safe and lock. Uh, I-10 and Wart and then uh, West Timer in the Beltway. So go to 975safes.com, 975safe.com, and see, and you, can, and, and you can see the quality. You will see the American security safes. You're going to see, and you have, you need a burglary and fire safes. Yes, top-rated, quality, new, certified, proficient. Uh, listen. You got to have a safe. If you got a gun at home and you got kids, you have to have a safe. Put it, 
get a safe that the, at least the kids can't get to it, okay? Can't get to the guns. Gun safes, commercial safes, jewelry safes, home and office safes. It's Houston Safe and Lock, sk- highly skilled, licensed, and certified safe and vault technicians. They can do it all, anything that you need with a safe to convert dial to digital or vice versa, proficient in opening lock safes, can change combination locks, repair damage safes. They can move your safe, which a lot of movers won't do. Anything to do with a safe, there's one place to go. Well, two places, King Safe and Lock or Houston Safe and Lock. You go to 975safe.com. Tell Derek you heard it right here, 975safe.com. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. Hey, before we get back to sports, John, I want to tell you I didn't mention this. You know, my wife went to go see the totality of the eclipse or whatever in Kerrville, and she had some pictures. It looked pretty cool, whatever. It took her seven hours to get back. That's usually a four-hour trip. It took her an extra three hours to get back. It was a seven-hour drive to get back. I told her what you said about the store you're at where it was supposed to be one of the most traveled days of the year. And I no, guess that ended no, up no, being no, the no. case. In, in Houston, U.S. history. In U.S. history. That's in- incredible. But I can tell you this. In Houston, I went to pick my kids up from school. I've got to go down 59 North and exit the spur. And I do it at you know about 4 o'clock. There was nothing. I mean, I, I've never gotten there so fast. I was able to get there, stop at a place, Grab a grab something to eat as, as an early dinner, and then pick the kids. It was unbelievable. And then coming back, it was nothing. It was that day. I don't know how many people in Houston were gone for this, but I have never seen. It was like there was a a holiday, like, like the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, it really was. I I guess there were more people who left Houston to go see this than I thought. I think I'm a bad person, but I kind of enjoyed you the think? pandemic because. <laughs> Because uh, how the roadways were I think were I'm a empty. bad person, but I kind of enjoyed the pandemic, John just said. <laughs> yeah, well, he has said this Super in the past. Super stressful for me. He has said this in the past and didn't think, hey, maybe I should stop saying this. Yeah, I'm going to keep I saying it. Yeah, I don't like it. He doesn't yeah. say it. He says it out loud. Well, but the roads were it empty. Yeah, well, what's your day like? You, your words are, your, the roads are empty when you drive to work anyway. What's the difference? Yeah. And but if you've got to stop at a stoplight, you just... You blow through fire it because you say the, anyway. the rules don't apply to you in the morning, you said. Well, not sometimes. I, I, yes. <laughs> yes. They apply to me. So wh- why did the pan- how did the pandemic affect your traffic patterns? Well, I mean, because we were going up to Wood Forest a lot. And that's pretty oh, far golf. up okay. there. And, uh, you know, you don't have any traffic. It's so much nicer. It's just such a better life. So here's here's an article from HoustonPublicMedia.com. Houston no, Nashville's building it. hotel yeah. entertainment district near Minute Maid. And Art says, when did it start changing from going to the stadium for an event to providing bars, restaurants, Louis Vuitton stores for Americans with ADD? Hey, let's leave ADD out of it with the event secondary. It's, uh, the frankly, event's not secondary. It's all, it's all part it's of the, the event. It's the experience, yeah. It's I was a, a part of the experience. Art. Do you know Sugar Bowl was like that, John? It, it, the, and I would have never expected this. This is there's no infrastructure to make. What's it called now? Is it Mercedes Benz Stadium? What's the yeah. stadium now? Superdome. Whatever the Superdome is. Whatever the the branding is on it. In New Orleans or Atlanta. They had built out a section where they kind of created their own section of a space that you gather before, and they can do concerts there, and they just did the most with their space. You're right. That's that's what it is. Like every place that's being built now, SoFi Stadium has its own. It's a giant entertainment center with restaurants. Yeah, they they want to build. It's not just a stadium. Now it's an infrastructure and a and an what's the? It's an ecosystem around the area. Now some like in the flats in Cleveland, it's built into it. it they build into an area, but most of them are. You may not be used to it here in Houston because NRG Stadium does not have that at all. Well, and, and it was like I was in some communist nation yesterday because we went to the bar early and the Arsenal game was on. Was that communist? And, 
And, well, there's all kinds of Arsenal fans here. England, England is, is not, not a communist, communist country. Nation. What do you mean? Well, it seems we like probably it's... have more avowed communists in, in this country than England has. Yeah, you're talking. Well, I just. They're more. I don't know. Just, they were, a little it, further. They were playing Bayern weird. Munich in Champions some... League, and you saw you thought you saw yeah, communists we, everywhere? I, well, yeah. I we also know. watched Real Madrid. We had two giant. And on these gigantic big screens. Had all this soccer going on. And I thought you were a Real Madrid was, fan. I am a Real Madrid fan. You I'm sound like you're disappointed soccer was on the television. No, 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 no. It was it was fine. I just felt like. What did like, you want to watch? Happened? I just felt baseball? like what happened to America. I just what? Felt like, well, they turned the Orioles-Red Sox game off to put that on the big Good. TV. One one game's far more important. Oh, my gosh. Well, we, like, what all country? we do is couch every baseball so- game at this time of year well it's early well it's early for orioles red sox who cares we got champions where league on we? where are we in kuwait what are we kuwait doing? Uh, do you I'm, you want to compare your time in dallas at a sports bar to kuwait you don't think there's a little difference i don't know you don't know you can't john's drink. out you here don't collecting know how, the how different it is when was the last time you were in kuwait when was the last time you were in kuwait <laughs> i've never I'm, i don't know all right then okay john out here collecting the infinity stone of beers you are collecting, you are collecting different types of beers a, on this trip so far. An, also, they went off your yes. house hunting. What's the Diamond Club saying about Jose Abreu? Is John house hunting in Dallas? No, John's not. It's art. That's all art. All right, shut up. Okay. And Sounds like yeah, Arthur and Spring was sitting behind Granado yesterday. I haven't heard who's from Arthur and Spring, Spring? For a long time. Apparently, someone who hates the Granado name. Hockey but, talk, apparently. neat stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which, which you guys don't hear because it's off the air and John's in queue. You can hear the effects of all the nights out in Dallas right now. Like you can't. Yeah. He puts it on. He puts on a performance on the air. Obviously, he's got to do the job. But when he's off the air, it's a lot of uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's, man. He's none of that. Hit, uh, none of that. Hitting you're full them of crap, Dell. No. Del, again, you're enjoy- lying about You're enjoying things. yourself. And, which is fine. You're in Dallas hanging out with the boys, but you're enjoying yourself. The and you boy. Can tell, uh, the boy. Well, the boy usually is in reference to now, his son. Tell me that y'all have Justin. separate hotel rooms. Or y'all, is Justin in a double bed in there somewhere? Oh, no. We are two <laughs> hotels. Oh, no. We have, we have three rooms. There's another guy here. Okay. A throuple? Oh, which, by the way. <laughs> throuple? <laughs> <laughs> One of us, well, it's it, Justin. He, he's got a, a driver, right? So, here's a little story. He got. <laughs> I don't know if he complained to management about the noise in the room next door or something, but this one dude knocked on his door and showed him his gun, and and then he then he had to change rooms because he was afraid. <laughs> Hold on, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you mean? Knocked on his door and showed him his gun. Where, how did well, he show he it? Op- he thought it was a hotel security. He opened it up and the dude said, "You did you complain about me?" <laughs> in the in the noise, and then he picked up his shirt. Oh no, sir! I didn't complain about you. I never said a word. Bye. And then change rooms. So yeah, that happened. So a um, guy handled a potential complaint about him by by threatening to his kill weapon? Justin. What? Yeah. That, that sounds mm, like the world what? we live in. Wow. Yeah, that is the world we live in. Crazy. Crazy stuff going on. Wow, showed him his gun. I thought this was going to end. And then Justin complained about the noise, and they put him in this penthouse suite upstairs. <laughs> no, that was it wasn't Justin. It was the other, the other guy. guy. Anyway. The other guy. Uh, oh, wow, this story didn't go to the penthouse suite. It came to a scene like out of. With just any TV show where you lift up your shirt and show the gun scene. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, that escalated this is why I don't hurry. do a lot of honking and acting like an idiot on the road. No. I let things go on the road. I don't care. I don't need to get shot. I got things I need to get done still. Um. All right. We're going to break uh, break it here. But Amy Adoka, at some point, we're going to hear from him. I promise. I mean, right now, though, Lance, you got to talk about all state. All state windows and siding. So there is a. Um, I had a listener the other day ask about the phone number for Allstate Windows and Siding. And with Allstate Windows and Siding, the reason was he told me that they he's had an issue with with um, one of his windows he knew was leaky because the house had really moved during a really hot summer uh, yet last year. What, what happens is when it gets really, really hot, like we have, and dry, that clay underneath your home begins to shift and harden and, and move around. 
And so the window frames are not as as secure as they once were. You don't have the same ceiling, the, the sealage that you used to have. And so you start to have leaky windows. Well, in the summer, I mean, it's a disaster. Your air conditioning is getting out. The hot air is getting in. The dust gets in. has a big impact on your overall comfort. The humidity gets in. And what, uh, what they want to do for you at Allstate Windows is make sure that you get new windows that are made right here in Texas for the Texas weather and for the Texas element. They will measure your windows. Make sure that the windows are cut exactly to the specs of your window frames. Make sure they're put in properly. Never any glass breakage when they take the windows out. The installation is is a very efficient but quick process, and they can improve your energy efficiency up to 40%, up to 40%. Just knock 40% off of your highest electric bill, and you start to see what a major difference it makes. It adds better safety to your home. It quiets. It, it makes the uh, the area more quiet when you have the double-pane, double-strength windows, and it just beautifies your home. Your home looks so much better with new windows from Allstate Windows and Siding. They're going to give you a big discount right now. If you tell them that you're an ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 listener, you have to do that or you're going to pay the retail price. So make sure you tell them that Lance Zerline sent you and take advantage of that price. They're also offering big discounts for complete siding jobs as well. So if you want to combine the two, they have financing available for you. Uh, same as cash financing no or no interest for, I don't know, you got to check and see how long the no interest is going for right now. But this is a chance to make your home look great, improve your energy efficiency. AllstateWindowsAndSiding.com. HRP, HRP.net, my guys over there at HRP, <clears throat> they're great guys, and you're going to love them too. You're going to love what they do for you. You're going to love what you do for your business. You're going to love the technology that they have, which is second to none. You're going to love uh, how perfect they, they do their work. Uh, HR is awfully important as well. you may, you got to be compliant. you you got to make sure that you don't mess up with your HR decisions And because if, if you do, it could cost you a bunch in lawyer fees. It could you, cost you a bunch with the – uh, equal opportunity, people, all of that stuff. You just can't do that. So let HRP advise you on what's best. If you've got a payroll company right now and they're, it's an admin company that is really crushing you uh, with all kinds of 401ks and insurance plans that maybe you just not, uh, you don't need or want, well, guess what? HRP doesn't do that. They give you, they offer you uh, different uh, 401k plans and benefit packages because they they're not in that business. They're in the payroll and the HR business, and they want your business. HRP.net two eight one eight eight zero sixty five twenty five or HRP.net.
You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. All right, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. John and Lance along with Dell. We got Ime and Doka talking about the technicals. Okay, so Ime leads the world. We had, you know, technicals last night. We got technicals. We just get technicals. We get in fights. And Ime addressed the uh, technical situation with his team. I said I don't mind it. Um, you know, it's, it's better than the alternative, which is you know kind of laying down and getting ran over. And so, um, you know, we've had quite a few lately. I think it took guys, you know, half a season or so to really uh, get that identity of not respecting your opponent too much. And um, like I said, when guys have had some of the losing they have over the last few years, we're trying to instill a little more fight, a little more aggressiveness, and um, bring in veterans and a certain coach that loves that stuff and it's going to rub off on them. So, um, no, I don't mind at all. Just got to be a little smarter, though. The, you know, the cam one is a tough one. That's probably uh, you know, just the fact that they got the double technical right before you have to be smarter there. But I don't know if that warrants another technical rejection. It's just a problem. There, there he is. Uh, I don't mind it at all. And he no, doesn't mind it. it needs His to be comfort. controlled, though. Moving forward, you're going to have to have it controlled. But, yeah, it's... It's fine. I don't. I, I liked it. Look, you you have a the goal right now should be to finish with a winning record this year, forty three and forty one. Win out. I'm sorry, uh, forty forty two and what are they? Thirty eight and forty right now? Or are they thirty nine and forty? Yeah, thirty nine and forty. The goal right now should be to finish forty two and forty, winning record. Worst case scenario, forty one and forty one. I like that they're still playing. It, I kind of question that uh, coming off the road if they were still engaged uh but it was nice to see them win yesterday fred van vliet had, had the monster monster game with 37 points you go 41 and 41 man what a jump up that is what a huge step up to finish 500 for this team uh what it, it's everything that you could ask for and i think it is important to finish the season with some type of positive that you can hang your hat on after having you know being eliminated so swiftly in the playoffs after really making a legitimate run so that's good. I want to see the boys finish well, but I'm I'm very excited headed into next season. I'm very excited to see what they do in the off season. Are they going to make moves? Are they going to be aggressive? Do they hold back and see what's going to go on? They've they've got the the NBA draft. Do they package a player in their pick? You know, I I think the Rockets are an intriguing team with a lot of the pieces in place that you're going to need to be a really good team. I don't think that they're far off from what the Texans are, although the Texans in their off season and this is the way it is with football. You can make jumps very quickly. Texans obviously took it, apparently, it, it appears as though they took it to another level. I'm not sure if the Rockets would be able to do that in one year, but you talk about phase three, John. Phase three is getting ready to be in effect, and that's where they start competing in the playoffs. And I expect that to happen next year. I, there's no reason that the Houston Rockets should not be a team on the rise next year and should be shooting for 45, 46 wins. Yeah, no, no, no. Next year's a playoff year. I mean, he, um, and it would be better if it wasn't a play-in year. It was a playoff year. Um, but you'll take anything. It, 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 the, the drive down the stretch here was a lot of fun. You know, winning, winning all those games. I don't care who they were playing. They were winning games and learning how to win on the road. And they were tough and they were fighting and they were, you know, I mean, that was just a lot of fun. It's been a lot more fun, a lot more fun this year. In the last few I, years, I want I I want to whisper this, but it's on a mic, so I can't whisper. Really, since the Rockets have been eliminated, the Jalen Green we all know and didn't really love very much is back. <laughs> if you look at the numbers in the month yeah. of April, really since the end of March, again that game in Dallas or the the home game against Dallas, we're at we're got he's at under forty percent from the floor, twenty five percent from three. That's that's over the course of now six games. This is why I'm not I'm not overreactive on Jalen stuff. Uh, I'm just I can't because I've seen this before. Now Craig Ackerman, who's with the team every year and has been for the last you know more than three years, uh, but that's since Jalen's been there. He thinks Jalen turned a corner. So I respect what Craig Ackerman says. It's just that I, I mean, there is no time in over the last three years that you can point to sustained consistency for Jalen Green and it's what will continue I think it's great what he did I think he flashes what he could be but I just don't know that you 
go into year four and just say, okay, now this is the year. This is the year that he puts it all together for the whole year. I'm not, you know, I think there's a 50, I think it's a coin flip. I think the coin might speak next year. And I don't think the Rock. I'm getting to the point where I don't think the Rockets trade. The coin has spoken. I think the Rockets are going to keep him. And, but I don't think you give him the big contract until you know exactly what you have. And Ime Odoka with a second year is going to know. Yeah. He the- is going to know. So, unfortunately, you'll get to a point where you may have to try to, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what you'll do I, with, with Jalen. I can't trust Jalen with a $60 million deal. I just can't. I don't no, know. no, no. The month of March is car- it's going to carry a lot of so water. So why is he fifty-two million a year? He what what did he hit to reach that? It's, it's just the salary point. cap going up and the fact that he's drafted top three. Okay, so it's not so he, he didn't have to reach no, any of no, the super not all NBA stuff plateaus. Like, Alpi hasn't done any of that, and he's gonna he's he could get forty-five. It's just the cap. It's and, the cap going up, which is going to give him and that. the max. Like the Rockets don't have to give either one the max. They can get great deals and not have to be the max, but the maximum they could get. Is an annual average of fifty-two and forty-five per year. Would I mean, you- why do we worry about the? But why do we? And I'm talking to myself, kind of here. Why do I worry about what the number is, the money, if it doesn't preclude you from doing other things? In other words, the numbers on quarterbacks are going to keep going up, and it's alarming. But at the same time, if the salary cap is going up, and it's the same percentage of the cap, we really shouldn't care that much. I guess the only thing you can think of is perhaps. If you wanted to get off of them and go acquire a n- different players, it makes may make it more difficult to that's make money gonna, work. That's what's going to be the case. Is you almost have to tr- trade big name player for big name player now that the because the the numbers are going to continue to spread, just like in Major League Baseball, just like in uh, uh, football. A running back will get eight million, and a quarterback will get fifty million. Like. That's kind of crazy. Starters, starters, a starter at quarterback will make, you know, six to seven times what a starting running back will make. Well, to me, it's you just you you can't handcuff yourself. I know it it does matter giving somebody fifty two million dollars and he's not performing like a fifty two million dollar player. I mean, you, do you want to be in James Harden? Uh, it, it no, no, but Joe Harden was a performer, though. <clears throat> Harden was a performer. He was a high-end performer. He was consistent. He was efficient. He was an all-pro. Jalen mm-hmm. Jalen Green is not that. Uh, and I think that it really – the number doesn't matter if you can move him. Not, I don't to me, know it doesn't. If you can Neither move matters. Him, if you can move the contract, though, does it matter? Neither matters. Are you a championship team? That's what, that's what matters. You don't have to have a James Harden who's a great, great player – and but can't win a championship, you uh, to me you can win. I, I want I want winners, and I got to yeah. find out whether or not Jalen. And but you don't have much time left. You got this is no. this is a next year decision you got to make. I would tell you that Jalen Green. You know I still stand by the fact that having that extra year, <clears throat> Jalen Green moving Jalen Green this year, is the aggressive move. I know some fans would not be happy, but my reason has nothing to do with not liking Jalen or anything. It's just there's more value when there's still a year left under the contract. Um, there's more value when you move a player. So I just think the move is dealing Jalen Green this year and and probably your first-round pick along with it and getting whoever you think is the right fit for for what you are going to do with Alper and Shingun, whether it's defensively, whether it's the three-point shooting, whatever it is that you prioritize, I think that is – I think that may be the move. Well, to me – is okay. So we've talked about this with Cam and with Jalen and with Alpi and with um, a- Amen and all of these guys. Man, where are you going to find somebody who you're going to play? It's still a team that didn't make the playoffs. This has got to be what you what you need. Maybe there's a big move that's got to be made. Is this a core? That is going to win a championship. Does this look like a championship? Well, team can you to make you? that decision when they're all in their? early 20s championship teams don't win in their 20s like the best Sorry, players in the you, world you got a limited amount of time that's well, what you get that, paid that's for. fine make no, the decisions no, that's fine you to make the decision but anthony edwards is probably the outlier but you look at the best teams in the league and even the wolves are people question them who jamal murray was in his mid to late 20s show gets older you don't win championships in your 20s so i don't know if an nba team operates with well can we win a title with this team when they're all in their Early twenties, it generally doesn't happen that way. Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown have been doing this for 
over half a decade now, and people are questioning when they can win it. They're still like 27 years old. Yeah, you're right, but the old. difference is you got a decision to make on two big contracts. Well, yeah. yes, you have to make a decision. That That's part of the game, but but are you, you, you pushing away two guys and say they're not good enough to win when they're in their early 20s? Can you make that? Can you determine that right now? No, but you may have to project it. It may just be the nature of the beast that you have to make a, a, a determination earlier than you like because you've got to – you don't want to get stuck contractually, or you want to get max value for one of the players you're going to trade. I promise you, what you would get back for Alfred and Shingun would be incredible. The Dude, trade yeah. back for Alpi would be well, astronomical. Um, listen, but no also you're starting you make, over in the in the front court. Whatever trade you make, whoever it's going to, if it's going to be J- the Jalen Truthers, every time he scores 30 points, the Alpi Truthers, every time. You know, he has a big game. It's going to come. It's going to just – but you have to make it – okay. Or you sign both of them. Sign both of them to a huge deal and, and see whether or not that's a real, real championship quality combination. And that's the favorite. The favorite is to sign both of them. Now, what the number ends up being, I I'm don't know. I'm not sure that's the favorite. But I think that's uh-huh. the favorite. And then they can move from <clears throat> Jalen Green's contract or even Alperin's if they decide it's not, because these guys do have talent. Like it's not like, it's not going to be a dead weight Chris Paul contract at the end of his year. Both of these guys are going to have, both of these guys are going to have value once they sign their contract. They're still very young, very talented, very explosive. Um, I just, I would be shocked if Alperin Shingun is anyone that they would be considering trading. I just don't. I don't. It's I don't hard see that to either. find that kind of guy. I just I don't, don't see, see it. No, we got to break it. QC Kinetics is what we got to talk about now. QC Kinetics. <clears throat> so, QC Kinetics, what they do is they specialize in helping people who deal with chronic pain. And the chronic pain for a lot of people are the hip and the knee. That's where knee replacements come in, hip replacements come in. Um, but they also work with ankles, shoulders. I mean, if you have a joint that is riddled with pain and it's chronic pain, there's going to be inflammation, there's going to be loss of tissue, there's going to be damaged tissue, it turns into arthritis. But most people believe you start off with aspirin, then you go to a stronger pain pill, then you go to a steroid shot, then eventually you go to a stronger pain pill, then you you know work on getting a surgery, and then you have your downtime from work, your rehab. It's a huge pain in the butt. It really is. And it's not even the most effective because my friends over at uh, QC Kinetics, this is the most effective. They take the body's healing power, concentrate it, put it back into the joint. It begins to restore damaged tissue, regenerate lost tissue. This is what professional athletes use to get away from that pain very, very quickly, get their mobility back, and get back on the field or the court or wherever they may be. Uh, That's what you have available to you now. Four locations in Houston. Do what the professional athletes have been able to do for decades. Now it's available to you, and it works. QCKinetics.com, QCKinetics.com.
All right, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. John Lance and Dell got two hours to go. If you want to get in, let's go. Someone three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Apparently, we have a caller here named Baxter. Baxter wants to talk on the show. Hey, Baxter. Hey, what's going on? Long time listener here. I've been listening to y'all since I don't know before the '99, whenever y'all had the Rome days. Anyway, I moved here to Frisco up here in the Dallas area like 15 years ago, and I still listen to y'all every day. Follow Houston sports. Nice. I started watching hockey, and I knew whenever you said that you were going to be at the hockey game last night, I knew you were going to be on the front row. And <laughs> I'm the one who posted the picture. I want to apologize for calling you out on that because you gave me some advice years ago. I was just married in 2009, and we met at Yanni's 40th birthday. And I introduced you to my new wife, and you said, oh, that's sweet. That's, that's nice. Now I can start the clock and get it over with. And <laughs> my wife looked at me crazy, like, who is this guy? But as the years go on, <laughs> things start getting bad. I remember that advice you gave me. And about a year ago, I got divorced, and I'll tell you what, it was, it was the best thing, getting, getting done with that first one. So – I want to apologize for putting you on Twitter, but I want to thank you for the advice that you gave me years ago. <laughs> I mean, look at this. Another success story, John. But just It's a heartwarming. You just, you just created. There's another success story as men continue to celebrate. First, it's Jared celebrating where you told him to divorce his wife because she made him go. I, I didn't say this was bad advice, but you made him go. Remember, um, she made him go get ice cream. During a Rockets right. playoff game, I think it was a game seven actually, and you said right. get rid of her, and he ended up doing. He ended up getting rid of her, and here's another one, and you know what? Both these guys are very happy. Both of it's, these guys are pleased with their decision making. So in a way, you're an anti matchmaker. It's tried and true. There's nothing I can do about it. Okay. <clears throat> and is, does this advice go for the other gender as well? They need to get rid of their first husband because the be- the next one will be better too or is it just for men it's for everybody okay so it just doesn't work out so baxter's first wife is going to be much happier too as well and you said it in her face start the clock and get it over with <laughs> like she's a pr- prospect <laughs> like a like a minor league prospect <laughs> like, start like the clock. spencer the clock Arigetti. yeah let's start the clock there's no more no more call-ups with spencer he- arrogetti we and then Baxter the clock. designated her for assignment. Why? Right. <laughs> just DFA'd her. <laughs> Any other success stories, guys? 713-780-3776. I love that Baxter called just said, John, you told me to hurry up and get it over with and just want to let you know it started going bad, and here we are, and it's the best decision I ever made. I mean, that's considered a success story on our show, but it is what it is. It's just well, that's I, happened. Hey, I, I, my number two was the winner also. So I, so was yours. So I, I can never like. I don't want to tell people this is what they need to do. I just sit in my head and say, well, he may have a point. He may have a point. I'm not trying to condone it, but I'm just going off. A, I'm a numbers guy, and I'm just going off the numbers, and the probability says that's the case. Oh my God, does that say MPD? No, it says Mito. What's wrong with oh, your eyes? Oh, it's Mito. I thought that was MPD. My, but, well, I've got this giant sun in my face blasting it's me in the eyes. It's just the light. Let's get Mito in here. What's up, Mito? Hey. hey. This, 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 you know, I love the whole crew. I love all y'all. But, you know, let me give Johnny G your flowers, man. One day we're at an ESPN party, and I walked up with my wife, my first wife. And I was like, yo, this is my first wife. Right, this is my wife, and Johnny D is like, hey, is this your, he pulled me to the side. He's like, this your first one? He's like, get rid of her, man. Cut your losses. Get out of there. Um, fast forward now. Divorce two years happily. Saving money. Seeing my babies whenever I want, man. Thank you, Johnny D. Man of the people. Wow. Another <laughs> success story, John. <laughs> this is now two in a row. You've been I able to don't even help. realize you that. Man, people in the direction you pulled of divorce. the man aside at a party and were like, hey, man, get rid is of this her? your first one? Get rid of her? You must have been drunk. My son-in-law is not too pleased with this bit, he says. Oh, of course not. Yeah. He's like, no, not, oh, not he her. Oh, it's a bit. Other women. Yeah. You're other, going to hear the divorces daughters. right now. 
<clears throat> well, you would I be don't. telling your daughter to get Has rid of John him. Has John caused you to have a divorce? Even if mm. you even if you say it's it's very good for you. 713-780-3776. I didn't realize Mito was another one. Uh, but there we go, John. We're now three deep. 713-780-3776. I found your superpower. I understand. Convincing the men to leave their wives. I, he's like a harlot. He's like a, sec, a siren, except he do, he's not a woman. He just tells them things. I thought he would just do it over the phone, like as a as a radio guy. Hey, leave your wife. It, it's I couldn't imagine he would pull a guy aside. Pull a guy aside. And go, hey, man, is this your first one? Dump her. Get rid of her. What? Trust me. And then they and what does everyone say? Well, I mean, he ended up being right. Well, Shortly thereafter, well, of course, he's he planted the odds. seed. He's planting the odds. He's planting the seed. A marriage generally, well, we know the divorce rate. They're, they generally don't work out. So, oh, right now it's coin is spoken divorce rate. No, oh, yeah, it's no. literally heads or tails. Flip, flip, flip. Heads, it. I stay married. Tails, I don't. <laughs> the coin is spoken. The coin has spoken. The coin has. Hey, listen, if it it is a success story if they if it works out, right? Now, there's some guys out there, you've been married for 30, 40, 50 years. That's great. I mean, it is could it? have been better if you had gotten divorced, but it's great. If you're happy, you're happy. Can I dig That's- deeper into this particular uh, method- methodology? Yeah. So when you tell anyone, because you think it works for both genders, tell someone to get divorced because the second one will work out. If you're talking to a guy, is part of it go younger as well, or d- does that not matter? When they're younger, what if it? If you do, di- you go. If you divorce, because obviously that's not going to work out the first marriage. It's part of the the methodology to, to make it great the second time around is to go younger with the. No, uh, that doesn't matter. Okay, no, just that find doesn't the right matter. Person. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, find the right person. That's all. In your life, with your friends, do they generally go younger? Um. Look I don't have Lance. a lot of married friends anymore. Look at Lance. <laughs> I don't have a lot of married, married friends, friends okay. anymore. Okay, who are they, are they dating younger than? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Okay, they're yeah, dating yeah. younger. Okay. What did you think? But I don't think I, it doesn't. No, the age I'm trying to thing ask. Doesn't, not older, but the same age. I'm ha- the age thing doesn't matter. He says doesn't it doesn't matter. matter. Sure, he did. No, no, because it's did. an unsaid thing. Guys it's are always going to go younger. That's an unsaid thing. Well, so so should women. So should women. Because we're on the we're on the downslide at eighteen. Okay, they're, they're, it's looked at as less. No, we're not. We're actually coming up. It takes us no, longer women, to get there. No, women women are at their best in their thirties. Men are at their peak physically at eighteen. Well, no, but, but as, we're we're much better people when we're older. Much oh, better we're people. much better people. Yeah, yeah, but not that helps a not, marriage. Not your not relationship. You're not not relationship. Not relationship. Weirdo. Wise. No woman wants no to woman marry wants an eighteen-year-old year old old when they're in their peak. Uh, some do. Well, no, not they the married. Don't, the, the idiot dummy, the Dumbo idiots who are Mary 18 Joe like Letourneau. me and you were when we were 18. And no, rich, no woman wants to marry an 18-year-old man. Mary Jo Letourneau. In her second not marriage. Mary Jo Letourneau. Stop. We're not doing these <laughs> famous, terrible people. I've never seen that on TikTok and Scram where women, when they give each other advice, hey, you know what you should do after your first divorce? No. Go marry they go an the 18-year-old. Other way, John. They go old and money. Yeah, money. That's old the key. and money, not eighteen. Dell, it and ain't broke. about age. Oh, look it's at these about, six pack. And he's it's broke. About cash. And he's gonna, because guess what he's looking for you at to to be sugar mama. Are you though? It's about yeah. cash. It's not about so, love. What is Tony? Guys, Tony say my hot young second wife and I are listening to the segment and enjoying it immensely. Well, Let me tell you Tony something. Wins. Tony did well. We, yeah, Tony we met Tony. Tony, if you ever go to Tony's young. Instagram. Well, we he, met Tony. Well, I met yeah. Tony's wife. And they're at, at the, the rave, the, and she's dressed up for the rave at John's birthday party that, slash that Super Bowl Tony, party. Yeah, and I, I know Tony's. I, I, Tony was fine on number one. I thought he was doing fine on number one. I, but I mean, but, listen, I'm a numbers guy. What I'm your, just telling what are your numbers saying? What the data says. The data. You mean the pictures John you're looking is, at? John might be an uh, analytics guy. Mm-hmm. That's what the numbers John are saying. John might be an analytics guy because the data says that John may be correct. If you just follow historical Gee, trends. Look at the data. The data says that. I'm not, get- I'm not in favor of anyone getting divorced. I'm not in favor. I want everyone to have a good marriage. I don't mind it. I'm just telling you what the data says. I'm objective. And the data says, you know. 
The data says the data says older gentleman gets tired, or, the, or let's just say the the relationship just doesn't work out. Well, and he she picks, gets tired of the guy. Yeah, certainly he picks. She gets tired of the guy. A, a big young, part of this too. a younger, beautiful woman to just to be part of his life. Oddly enough, he's happy. <laughs> Oddly enough. All right, we got to break it. 713-78, if you've got a success story, you're more than welcome to get in. 713-780-3776. Well, we do have, when we come back, we got to talk about the situation with Fromber Valdez going to the 15-day IL because this is now uh, Justin Verlander the other day called the pitching stuff, the arm stuff with pitchers a pandemic. Right now, I want to see how panicky you are because I'm, I'm in a bit of a panic about the Astros 12 games in. I'm in a bit of a panic if I haven't done anything about my roof. Okay, how about BrinkmanQuality.com? It's Brinkman Quality. Okay, the in the name Brinkman Quality Roofing Services. This, what do you need? Compositions, shingles, got it. Tile or slate, got it. Metal roofing, got it. Flat or TPO, do you need to repair and maintain? They even do siding, but the solar now they're shingles. They're not the big glass things that you're, you know, that's really ugly on your roof. It's shingles now. Really, really, really cool, and it's going to save you a boatload of money. You want you need gutters? They'll do that. They do <clears throat> anything. I mean, it is really, really, really. They have been doing this for over 50 years. Jason is awesome. He knows everything there is about roof to know about roofing. He says, listen, you got these guys that come to the house and they knock on the door and they go up and they fix your roof. <sighs> I, I got to come. It, it, to, it, inevitably, two, two years later, uh, two months later, I've got to come and fix what they did. You got to go with quality. When you're talking about your roof, go with Brinkman, B-R-I-N-K-M-A-N-N, BrinkmanQuality.com, 281-480-7663. Tell Jason you heard it here. You know, I've been sitting here during this break just thinking, what would taste delicious right now? And I contemplated in my seat here for well over three minutes, and I just thought, Maestro Nobel. Yeah, coffee's fine, but Maestro Nobel's better. Honestly, Maestro Nobel is the tequila that has the smooth finish that's never harsh, never. All the impurities are distilled out. <coughs> they distill it in Mexico, uh, Tequila, Mexico. I didn't know that was a real place. It is a real place. Eleven generations have done that with Maestro Bell, and what they've come up with is a variety of tequilas. I don't. Some of you may not even realize this, but Reposado, Añejo, um, the Cristalino, which is a category they created, which blends three tequilas, and 
it's distilled and aged in a, in a way that the flavor profiles for each one of these is different. Um, but they're all very smooth. They're very easy to drink, but they do not lose their complexity. And you will be able to tell that when you sip Maestro do Bell. If you want to get yourself a two ounce pour, I think you're going to absolutely love it. If you're just looking for a, 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 a tequila for cocktails and margaritas, the silver works great, and a smoke silver called Humito, that's another one you should absolutely find as well. Wherever fine liquors are sold, if they're not carrying Maestro do Bell, Demand it, ask for it by name, and do the same thing at your local restaurants. Maestro do Bell. You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. All right, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. I was just watching Ben McDonald, uh, former pitcher, Orioles uh, color guy. Yep. He was talking about max effort. He's talking about un- it's unnatural what we're doing now, bringing the spin that we want to get on baseballs to the field, and it's more unnatural. He said back in his day, you know, nine, ten guys would get hurt, nine would be shoulder, one would be elbow. Now it's nine elbows, one shoulder. Well, and it's because of how we're trying to spin it and how mm-hmm. we are, um, how much max velocity we're coming at all the time, as opposed to he said I threw ninety to ninety percent, ninety five percent. But if I had to get a big out, I'd throw it a hundred percent. But for the most part, I didn't throw that hard the whole game. So <clears throat> yeah, getting the the spin is so important to, today. And that, that's, I think that's got to be the biggest reason why all of these guys are, are, are going down with elbows is because they're trying to put so much spin on the ball. I think, um, well, okay, let us let me bring this up then. So Dr. James Andrews said it used to be he'd have like six or seven UCL injuries that he would do on the high school level and everything else was major league. And he said now it is completely flipped where most of his injuries, most of the surgeries he's doing is on the youth level. Which is, so it's not pitch clock. Listen, I have no idea how they're trying to get there with pitch clock. It's going to be exactly what you're saying. I think it's some of it is wear and tear on youth baseball, which they say can wear down the arm. And even if you're not having Tommy John surgery when you're young, there's a wear and tear that's not going to go away <clears throat> that is going to catch up with you. But let me ask this tough question. The Houston Astros, from the beginning of Jeff Leno's stint here, coveted spin rate they said this is the secret sauce and we're going to make sure that everyone is throwing curveballs everyone's going to be throwing curveballs we're going to search for curveballs it used to be you would deal with fastballs and sliders and and splitters that was a lot of what major league pitching was then curveballs came back in a big way and for the astros philosophically they want to change levels eye levels they want to go Upper eye level, lower eye level, there's some sweepers that they like throwing. But curveball was a really big deal with with uh, Jeff Leno and, of course, by extension with uh, uh, Brent Strom. So look at these pitchers who have the elbow issues, these Astros. And you know the Astros focus on this, and I'm sure they're focusing on this, on this in the minor leagues as well. Look how many pitchers they have with, with the same issue. Is this – I wonder if this has anything to do with how the Astros really hyper-focus on this whether it's Garcia or Urquidy or McCullers, who's been in the system forever, Justin Verlander, who got here, who has his own thoughts. We'll hear from him here in just a second. Ari Alexander had a great video with Justin Verlander talking about it. And now from Valdez. Is there something to maybe the Astros, who have been all in on spin rate since 2014, or, or actually before then, um, with – with, uh, uh, um, Jeff Leno, is this something that is kind of Astros related because they're heavy into spin rate and always have been, and they are through their minor league system? Well, I don't. I mean, it's just been. It's not just an Astros thing. It's no, throughout it's, all the baseball. It, it is, but we're yeah. looking at five pitchers on one staff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Obviously, the Astros. Are, they they subscribe to it. So, is it is should it be surprising that their guys are down too? But it's it's I think this is all of baseball now. I mean, it's all of baseball that the spin rate is really taken, and exit velo, spin rate, <clears throat> um, swing and miss, you know, all of those things that were 
not nearly as not at all important have taken over all of baseball, and now everybody's looking for that. Well, it was and always important. You just didn't know it wasn't it wasn't quantified. You just say, "Man, that guy has." This is one of John's roughest days on his throat ever. <laughs> it was uh, the the twelve and six curveball. You know, oh look at that, Uncle Charlie. Look at that fall off the plate. The twelve and six. You just didn't. You know, you didn't call it spin rate. You just said he has a real sharp breaking pitch. Um, Justin Verlander talked about how he used to work at ninety two and ninety three in his career, and then he started getting hit hard, and he had to worry about swing and miss more. So he he juiced up his fastball. He said he said I used to be able to hit hundred on the gun, but I wouldn't. There was no need. I was just cruising, and you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't reach back and throw at that level. And now everyone is throwing at that level. So um, I don't know how it changes. Let's hear from Justin Verlander. Listen to this. This is when he was at Sugarland. I think it's before his start that he had. But um, I hadn't. I don't think we've played this sound. This is really intriguing sound from Justin Verlander. You're kind of an outlier guy that's always thrown hard. There's a guy like Aroldis Chapman, an outlier guy. You've largely been healthy, so is he. Is there anything that you feel like you or Chapman have done to kind of stay healthy within throwing max up? For so long? Well, I mean, you're also talking to a guy like Tommy John, not not ironically, after the, you know, the rehab. Sorry, I know. Well, not not just that. I think, you know, this goes back to how my mentality changes as a pitcher. You know, I, I went from throwing, um, you know, you look back at before – 2015, 16, and I was throwing, you know, 93, 92, 93 early in games. And if I, you know, needed to go to the well and hit 100, I could late in games, but I certainly wasn't throwing 100 every pitch. Uh, the game dictated that I needed to start throwing, try to throw harder almost every pitch. So my average velocity jumped up, um, you know, because my intent jumped up and I had to look for swing and miss. And um, I don't know how long you can do that as a starter. I, 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 that might have had something to do with it. But um, I think. Uh, the ability to naturally do it is a, is, a, is a large part of it. I mean, I think you look at in, uh, individuals and um, everybody's built different. You know, you look at Araldis' mechanics versus my mechanics, and they're just vastly different, but can both throw triple digits or used to be able to. For myself, he still can. Um, but it's like, you know, it's like the gait of a horse. Like, you know, like there's some horses that are have been the best in the world at, at their time, and they don't run the same as some of the other best horses uh, after their generation. You know, it's like it's a... Uh, uh, and this is kind of, again, one of the things that I nitpick a little bit with mechanical tweaks too early on in, in a development process is you got to find your own gate, man. You know, you got to find your own way to throw baseball. And if that naturally leads you to being able to throw hard and have success, great. If not, you eat, you meet an ends road in your career, whatever that, wanna be, whatever that may be, high school, Division One, minor leagues, AAA, big leagues. If you meet, meet, reach that end, end of the path and you need help, then you, then you go help. Then you go find ways to throw harder and make yourself do it because you want to reach that next level, but not before. That's pretty interesting. Um, you know, here's the problem. Anytime you start dealing with youth, this youth, that the coaches, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of coaches who live vicariously through the kids. Not all, not all, but there's some, and their entire thing is going to be about winning. And it's not going to be about what's best for the pitcher because what's best for the pitcher is probably going to be not giving you everything they possibly can with breaking pitches, uh, potentially with amount of time uh, that they're working. You have to really dial it back. You can't play as many months as you want to maybe baseball-wise. You've got to – orthopedic surgeons say you, you have to take a break from baseball. You can't pick a baseball up. It's one of those things that can really do damage to an arm. They say the UCL doesn't fully – the Tommy John ligament does not fully develop until age 26. I read that yesterday. It doesn't develop until age 26, which is why there are so many injuries pre-26 on, on pitching arms. Um, Lance McCullers, for example, was younger than 26 when he had his first injury, I believe. So it's um, it's it's definitely a, a concern, and Justin Verlander had great advice. I just don't think anyone's going to heed it. And I think when, when, when this issue starts early on and you have injury issues early on, then – it makes sense that you're going to start seeing the same thing happen as these same guys who come from youth baseball continue. You'll notice a lot of these pitchers, I'm trying to go through it. I was looking at some of the names. Does it seem more American than Latin American? I mean, we're dealing with, you know, we're dealing with Garcia and we deal with Urquidy and, of course, Fromber. But does it, well, does it seem like Strider, we have more. Bieber, Strasburg, like – it seems like there's plenty of American pitchers who are dealing with this, who come from American youth baseball. Then again, I don't, you know, they play a lot of baseball in the 
Dominican Republic. I would imagine yeah. they don't just shut it down after three months. <clears throat> no. No, no, they don't. All right, we got to break it. 713-780-3776 on the other side. There's a, a guy I want to ask you about uh, for the draft for the Texans in the, in, on day two. And we'll do that on the other side. Well, we also have a div- – oh, Ryan left. We had what was considered a success story. Oh, okay. Which I don't know what that actually Maybe means. Ryan will call back in. I do know this. Okay, so I talk about um, Kent Jones over at Dream Rate, and I talk about how he, you know, he has less expenses, okay? He literally has a lot less expensive. He only advertises here. This is the only place. So he's got low overhead. Giant retail operations are expensive. But you don't know unless you shop your loan. Shop your loan, okay? You don't know how much money you can save. You don't know how much, how hard that mortgage broker is going to work for you until you shop it. And, by the way, you can find out, you know, you want to get a mortgage you you know you want to know okay how much is the house this is how much we're going to put down i mean a lot of places i mean you can find out kent will tell you okay this is what your payments are looking like but he can help you a lot with a lot of different stuff there's all kinds of stuff that he can get and he can take he can find deals for you okay so when you go to sit at the table for your mortgage you're not just signing away oh this expense that expense this and this and this He's awesome. He is going to work hard on that deal for you and save you as much as he possibly can. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, LTV, all of them. He's got them. Brokers are better. Go with this broker. The ultimate mortgage hookup, dream rate, 713-520-5626, 713-520-5626, or 975loans.com. Start the car buying experience at LanceZcars.com. It's an easy website to remember. They will wire you. They reroute you to Gulf Coast, Chevy, Buick, GMC, and Angleton. And um, just great vehicles to choose from. The Buick Envision is something that I got my son for his first vehicle, and we absolutely love it. There's a lot of great discounts going on. On the Buick side, Buick is something that a lot of people haven't considered. used to be kind of the old people's car, right? But when you look at it now, and they really started upgrading this a while back when Tiger was speaking for them. Uh, the design is very, very sporty. It's really more of a young person's car now. And they have smaller SUVs, more compact SUVs. They have the larger ones. The Buick Envision is great. The Encore is the smaller one. Just take a look at everything they, that they have with Buick because Buick right now is one of the vehicles that I talked to the sales rep over at, at Gulf Coast Chevy. He goes, man, you want to talk about vehicles that don't come into the don't come in for work 
or for any kind of issues with the vehicle. He said, it's a Buick right now. They're really making them well. And they have a real, a lot of really great APR financing rates right now on Buick vehicles and lease opportunities. So check out your local, um, check out Wild well, Local. They're in Angleton. It's a, it's a few miles more, 42 minutes from downtown, but they'll save you thousands. It's Gulf Coast Chevy Buick GMC. Check out the new Buick vehicles at LanceZcars.com. You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. 713-780-3776 is the number. 713-780-3776. Um, so, so, Lance, uh, somebody tweeted out uh, Georgia's Javon Bullard. What did you What did you see of him? Said this would be a, a, a perfect second day pick for the Texans. Well, that's see? what I, I put that out there about I don't know, maybe three weeks ago when I went through what a second what second round picks two through four look like, and I put Javon Bullard's name in there as the second pick of the second round. A lot of people think he's going in the third. He is a safety who is really more of a nickel corner. He can play. Um, he's stout. He can really stop the run. Ha- Reminds me in some ways of Kareem Jackson toward the end of his career with, you know, where they moved him inside to nickel and because he was so good against the run, and that was what a lot of teams were starting to do. They were going, getting away from small corners and going to better run stoppers since you're in base nickel so much as a defense. And so Javon Bullard can play right there in the slot. He can cover in the slot okay. Um, he plays around the line of scrimmage, really good tackler, tackler really physical has some cover talent, too. Um, I like him. I think that is a legitimate option for the Texans. I think it should be a legitimate option for the Texans when they're looking at uh, their base offense or their base defense being a nickel <clears throat> because, frankly, I think he fits the D'Amico system. I mean, he's a Kirby smart guy. And a lot of Kirby smart guys are going to be D'Amico guys. It's just kind of the same mentality. So, yeah, I like, I like Javon Bullard. It may not be at 59. It may – it may be sometime in the third, but I, I put him at 59 because I think he's he's a, a plug-and-play guy pretty quickly at nickel. Yeah, so um, anybody – I mean, safety is definitely going to be a need, right? Yeah, I was thinking I was thinking Tyler Newbin from Minnesota, who's the best safety at 42, but, you know, his, his athletic scores weren't great, but his ball production – and like, he's a very smart football player. I just – I don't have a good feel yet for how D'Amico will view a guy who ran a 4.61 40, didn't jump great. Like, I don't know how heavy he leans into athletic scores versus production and intelligence and instincts. I just – I don't really have a feel yet. I haven't seen him draft a, a safety, so I don't, I don't know if there's certain standards that he won't pass up on. Like, that, or that he that – he, yeah, that he, that he is too adhesive to where he says, nope, we're not going to have a four six safety. That's just not something we're going to have. So, I don't really know that. But there are some safeties in the draft. My favorite is uh, is Rabbit uh, Demerson Thompson. I think his name. I call him Rabbit. Diedrich Rabbit's his nickname. But he is a uh, safety out of Texas Tech, who should be a third round pick. And man, do I like him! Ton of ball production. Extremely instinctive. Tested like a maniac, only about 190-ish, maybe 195 pounds. So he's got decent size, but, man, he is fast, is explosive, has great ball instincts. I think he's really flying under the public radar a little bit. I think teams know he's a top 100 player, but um, I had I had a team tell me they didn't think he – they love him, and they didn't think he'd go until the fourth round. So I don't know. That's the guy. If you hear that, Texas Tech safety um, – Demerson Thompson, just know that Lance is very excited about that. I think he'd be a great Texan. Okay. A couple of uh, – couple of, couple of, what's the latest on uh, Sweat? Tavondre Sweat and the teams I've spoken with believe he'll fall to day three. Um, there is a lot of concern about, about his discipline and a lot of concern about decision-making. Um, the weight stuff, it's just – it's too far out there behind in football circles that he was playing – played heavy at Texas. I mean, you know it with the eyes, but it's 
much heavier than the 350 that he was, um, you know, he was listed at. They they say during the season, scouts who went in there said he played. He was in the 370s. The talk um, before Senior Bowl was that, you know, that he. I think that I think he weighed in. I heard this from an agent yesterday that he weighed in at Senior Bowl and they made a, and that they agreed that they would not list the weight, and because it was so high. And then, uh, so he didn't have a weight at Senior Bowl, even though it's the first time I'd ever seen that where they didn't put a, a height and weight on a player. And then, uh, which I thought was very troubling because I figured that was why I thought he just said no, I'm not going to do it, which is also an issue. Then when he's at the combine, he got down to 366, which I thought, well, that's not bad based on the number I heard where he was. Um, but you add that up with the fact that, you know, he he there, there's some other stuff. His discipline and his his work ethic, I think, is in question. And now you add decision making this late in the draft process, being day drunk on a on a Sunday. Um once again, I mean, teams don't like doing that in the first three rounds, but fourth round, all sins are absolved, and you start taking guys in the fourth round. So I think he's got a chance to go into third, late in the third. His talent is, you know, early second because he's such a run stopper. And if he's got his stuff together and his mind right, then, you know, that's that's where he I think he would have gone. But unfortunately, I just think that he's put too many doubts in, in, in coaches, especially coaches don't like dealing with that. So I think he ends up falling to the early fourth, maybe late third. Um, and so I don't know that anything – has anything – I guess wide receiver is the only thing. I, okay, does it change anything for the Texans that it's only a one-year deal now for Stephon Diggs? Well – I mean, it might. I mean – I don't think it changes anything now. I think what they did was they gave themselves an opportunity at the end of the year. They can say, okay, what do we want to do with Stefan Diggs and what do we want to do with Nico Collins? I mean, to me, they allowed themselves – this is a true go-for-it move now. You gave up a second. Granted, you get a, a fifth and a sixth back. But you gave up a second uh, next year so that you could rent – you could just rent uh, – uh, Stefan Diggs, but you know, John, you think about it. They, uh, the Texans have put themselves in the driver's seat by saying we're not going to be held hostage by Stefan Diggs. Number one, we know we're going to get his best effort because it's contract year, and he's going to be happy he's getting to, you know, that he's going to get to the market. Number two, if we don't like him, we just cut bait and it's over. And then if he, when he leaves and signs, guess what he's, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get a third round pick because for sure, as long as you don't sign more free agents. Then you lose. No, uh, I think no. The max they could get on it is a fifth. Yeah. Oh, because of his oh age that's and, right. Because of his yeah. age. I yeah, forgot yeah. about that. After yeah. thirty-one, I think yeah. it changes. Right, right, Before right. we move on, can we get back to the to Vondre Sweat for a second? Because you mentioned the combine, and they said they didn't even they said they didn't even list his weight. Senior bowl. Senior bowl. They didn't list his weight. Well, he was there, and uh, for some reason. Oh there, boy. <laughs> hold on. Oh boy. <laughs> there's sound. Do we have leaked footage? Yeah. He was he was asked about. What what was going on? Because you know he was hanging out and people yeah. were talking to him. He was asked right. about what people were saying about him. Cool. Meathead, fatso, lard butt, welly the whale, porky, hog, fat ass, double wide, butterball, those sorts of things, right? Yeah. It sounded like it, Ed Dodge from the Colts talking it, to Andre Sweat. Wait a minute, he sounded young. Well, he's a young yeah. guy. He is young, yeah, John. He's, he's like twenty two, right? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so, he is really, still young. So he's this still has been young. following him around from the combine to yeah. now, unfortunately. Well, I didn't know that. It got, that. We had a mic'd up segment. Thank gosh. <laughs> How, what would we have done without that? Man. <laughs> what Man. are we going to do without aqueduct plumbing? We don't have to. We don't have to worry about that. We got Billy Brown on the scene right now. He is ready for you. If you've got any issue whatsoever, you, but you need to put this number in your phone, 281-488-6238, because at any point you could need aqueduct plumbing and not – I would never needed a plumber for I don't know how many years. I, my whole life. I don't know whenever I got a plumber. But then all of a sudden I needed him like three months in a row. I was like, oh, sorry, Billy, but I need, need, need another guy out here. And, boy, were they something. We had a leak outside in the, 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 uh, in the sink out there. And then we had the link, the, the one in the bathroom that was causing all of our floorboards to come. It was just awful, awful. And Billy came, bing, 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 done, found the leak, and then, and then set us up with Resto Pros who fixed the, did the rest. 
you're looking for a plumber, Lance. We both use them, and we can't we can't speak highly enough for them. No, and it's and it's also like the small jobs too. I mean, the, the big jobs, obviously, but just leaking, just just leaking. You see watermarks in a shower and you think man something's going on behind the wall they can get that taken care of they can get a leaky faucet that you continue to have issues even after you get it fixed with somebody they go in there and actually get to the root of the problems they get to every problem they figure it out quickly they never charge you for going out to your home aqueduct plumbing company that's the company you need to use aqueductplumbingcompany.com You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. Welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Ooh, not a good story. This is not a nice story, Dell, that you've pointed out here that is a developing story right now. University of Washington football player is facing charges for allegedly raping two women in Seattle last year. According to court documents, Tybo, Tylen Tybo Rogers on Friday, um, they've arrested him on Friday. His bail is set $150,000. When he played in both games, allegedly after the uh, aforementioned alleged rapes. Yeah, at least one of the incidents was reported to police on October 28th, which you would imagine that Washington knew about and the football program knew about. And he went on to play in both. Well, he went on to play the rest of the year. Well, he was apparently suspended for the Oregon game after his in the initial accusation. Um, he did not travel with the, for the victory over the Oregon Ducks in the Pac-12 championship game on December first. Okay, but then he played after in both playoff uh, games. Yeah. How do you handle that, though? I mean, they made, you know, just being open-minded about this, they they immediately suspended him for a game, and then he didn't play the next game either, John, you said? The the championship game against Washington? He didn't against Washington? play, no, just in that championship game. Okay, so he didn't, and then you have a time between that. You had a full month, basically. 
So I don't know what came out. I don't think he'll take too much heat. I mean, he will take heat, but I guess it depends on what, how much they knew, like what the circumstances were, what they found out, um, how credible. I don't know. I don't know what goes into it. Like, it, it's a really tough one. There's no easy well, answer. Credible because, enough to be charged now. Yeah. Right. Right. So the police. We've, we've, heard, we've read but charged these stories. now, right? Yes, but the incident was, okay. was reported back then. So I don't know what their policy is about if even an, an alleged attack means you have to be suspended. But the incident was reported. They they knew about it. Apparently, you mentioned the suspension, and then they decided that whatever they knew wasn't enough to keep them out of the playoffs. The NCAA made that decision? Well, the Washington, the football okay. team. Okay. Yeah. Ryan Grubb. Um, the offensive coordinator told Sports Illustrated that they were working through some things, some challenges he's had off the field. And um, that is pretty damning for the program, seeing as how they continued to play him afterwards. And so, so it's proof that they did know about Okay, so now who does it hit? Does it hit Washington? Does it hit Alabama? The player and the coach. Well, the player obviously has his own legal issues now. Kalen DeBoer, like, I don't think this sticks, and it's certainly not going to touch – I don't think it touches Washington, but I don't know. Oh, their AD left also, so no. I don't think there's anyone even left. As a matter of fact, Washington, pretty much all of their players have gone. Their head, their entire staff, almost their entire staff is gone. Their AD's gone. The players all transferred out. Like, Washington is a shell of itself. It's, it's unbelievable. Jed Fish has – like a brand new team. So it's not going to hit them. It's not going to hit Washington if anything happens. Plus, this is no one hit anything. It's just going to be interesting to see what DeBoer, <clears throat> he'll squirm a little bit, but I, ultimately I don't think anything happens here other than whatever's going to happen legally. Well, unless Alabama has buyer's remorse and then goes, well, we can't have this. Well, they won't with Kalen DeBoer. Oh, there's been lots of stuff happening Alabama that, Oh, yeah, no, I know that, but you, you just go, well. Now, the running back, out of here. <laughs> well, the running back isn't at Alabama. Oh, wait, where'd the, where'd the running I the thought running he transferred with them. I don't see no. that. So oh, I thought you said that. It is The spring game is this Saturday, so it's not like he will be able to hide because they broadcast that game. I don't know if ESPN will ask him about it, but there will be media focus on Alabama this Saturday. So maybe he will have to answer a couple questions. Maybe. ESPN ain't going to be the one to answer it. It'll have to, be to the, ask it. He has, well, does he have, do you think he has the same type of control over the local media that no. Saban did? So maybe they'll ask the questions. No, local media might. Yeah, local media might for sure. Now, oh, that, they, now that they can finally ask questions and not get the scary face, they might be might be willing to do it. Let's get Ryan in here before we get to a break. What's up, Ryan? How are we doing? Hey, sports fellas. Sports. Hey, so – I started listening to the station full time in 2019. I was divorced from my first wife in 2021. Do you think that's a coincidence? Because I'm a lot happier now. Huh, John? Hmm. I listen, Doctor John. Yeah, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but as long as as long as your life is is better for it, I mean, I mean, I'm not. We're not going to take credit for it for your divorce, but uh, we just don't do that. We just don't do that. We don't. We don't grab. We don't we don't grab congratulations. You can here. you can you can predict the weather pattern and it could be a bad weather could come in and you don't celebrate that you predicted bad weather coming in. You just say, Look, that's my that's my job. I just make observations based on the information yeah. and intel. I have a question because this show certainly is faith based. We know John went to a black church. Yeah. Do we care or believe in the sanctity of marriage on this show? John, I do. Oh yeah, absolutely. I do. <clears throat> okay, you don't because well, no, I don't, well I don't get married because I know I, I don't want to. So I do believe in it. I just don't want to do it. I, I'm aware it you exists. believe in it for other people. Yes, for other people, I'm happy if you get married. Just don't invite me to your wedding. I don't want to be part yeah, of that. You wouldn't. Um, don't want that. But we are aware that it's important. But we are also aware that it's fleeting. At least the first time. We just point out the numbers. Okay. If somebody's batting average goes way down, like if we're talking about John, do you hate? Uh, Jose Abreu? No, I don't hate Does him. Does the data tell you that he's not a good hitter? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's what the data tells you. So is marriage we- an Abreu-type disaster or Bregman an April-type disaster? 
Um, this is not my question. First marriage. Answer. The first marriage. Is first it? marriage is. Oh no, it's Abreu. A, no, it's first it's April. First marriage is Abreu to the Astros. No, the first marriage is Alex Bregman. The first, some of the them first work marriage out. is Bregman. Yeah, is Bregman in in April, and then what does he do when he gets to the summer? To a new life. The first marriage Starts is to take off. Well, no, the first marriage is is but it, Carlos Correa. We had a good time, but then time to go. Got to go. Got to go. Because he cost. Because the first marriage cost too much. Cost too much. Okay, you're not willing to pay for that anymore. Well, I mean, look at what he said. I'm I'm Louis Vuitton. I ain't. You know what? I ain't, I ain't Walmart. I'm Louis Vuitton. Well, then that like means that. he left you. Well, then Carlos no, 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 left no. You, you weren't. No, no, no. Carlos wanted to stay, but you said mm, sorry. But he's Louis Vuitton. We ain't paying for that no more. That's not why weddings. That's not why first marriages break up. That's not a good one. Yeah, well, and it was some a mistake. Of them, You're right. It's mistakes. It's Montero. It's Montero contract. It's Montero. like, oh God, what have I done? At least mine. I had to be like, <sighs> immediately. I knew it was not the right decision. Kind of like when I saw his contract. And then you're like, oh no, this is how long do I, how long do I have to wait this out? Oh boy, I guess I'll try to make it work. Let's bring Montero in. Oh no, it happened just like I thought it would. Let's bring Montero in again. Oh, oh. this is a bad contract. <laughs> um, that's listen. This is all just it, we're just having fun for those of you in your first marriage. And yeah, your wife no, I'm is sure yours is, gonna, at, yours is going to work great. In your, in your, yeah, your wife is sitting there looking at you right now, like, "Oh, this is real funny. This is what you listen to." Well, maybe this great is, show. Well, maybe she's thinking of leaving him. Yeah, no, it's true. Right, maybe, maybe he's maybe. looking at her a little weird because he he senses something. It, 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 it's not gender specific. It could be any, no. e- either one. Could be like, "I'm out of here." It's true. And listen. And in a lot of instances, you're a lot happy for a lot. You both for are it. a lot happier for it, which you which make, leads to my belief is don't get married in the first place. You would always be happy. We got to uh, we got to break it here. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. We're going to talk about the Zadix. Zadix Jewelers, forty five years in the business, twenty eight hundred square foot of jewelry perfection. Honestly, blown away when I went in. I mean, I legitimately could not believe what I was looking at. I knew the Zadig name for years. I'd seen the commercials. I'd seen everything that was so amazing. But when I got in there, one of the first things that caught my eye were the watch selection. And, you know, they are boutique. They are the only boutique um, watch. They're the boutique watch store, I guess. I don't know how to to, to exactly tell you. Yeah, jeweler, but they've got a carve-out. They've got a carve-out section where the watches are in there, and every one of these carve-out sections, these boutiques, are incredible within the 28,000 square feet. And you see the top names, and I mean the biggest names in watches and then names that are huge internationally that you've never heard of. But when you get educated on it like I was the other day, I spent two and a half hours in there the other day, and and I didn't even get all the information that I wanted. It was amazing. Zadig Jewelers is your one-stop thing, for one-stop shop for all watches, whether it's a purchase, whether it's uh, uh, very select items uh, that you can get exclusive watches that are in there. They also have uh, watch they have guys who can repair watches at at and I'm talking about any type of watch they have to be certified in all of these amazing watches all the different types of watches and they do an incredible job for you Zadig Jewelers is the best in the business for all things watches whether it's selection service price and of course when you're going to get it repaired they're the place that the people from around the state come to it's Zadig Jewelers they're at 1801 Post Oak Boulevard that's Zadig Jewelers
All right, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. We've got a bunch of calls. Let's get to them. 713-780-3776 is the number. Who was it uh, first, Del? Joe is first. Joe's what up, first, Joe? Yeah. Hey, uh, hey guys. How y'all doing? Good. I've been uh, working on the road. Hadn't been able to catch you all the time, so you might have already touched on this. But uh, could you give me like an update, kind of a where are they? Uh, where are they now? From last year, last year at this time, you had C two, who had a subscription service, start leaking all their information, basically tell you that nobody scored as slow as CJ has ever done anything in the league. And probably everything that, that could have gone wrong last year did. What what's happened with them this year? Uh it's not C two. What is the name? S2. It's S two, yeah. S two's still out there. They teams got really upset that that they were talking too much publicly. Uh but the leak didn't come from leak didn't come from them. I actually have a pretty good idea of where the, the leak came from, uh, because I think that's where I found out the scores from. But um the leak did not come from them, but teams were very upset that the information was getting out. They were very upset that um, that they were doing public stuff, and so they're you're not hearing about them because they want to make sure you don't hear about them. They want to make sure they're not talked about. They're still collecting data. They're still taking you know they're still collecting tests. I think that you know you now have as they continue to collect more and more data on quarterbacks. It's been pretty. Just because you score well doesn't mean you're going to be a good quarterback, but in the past, everyone who scored low had never become a competent quarterback, and C.J. Stroud is the first one to break that mold, which also leads some teams to believe that C.J. didn't really... C.J. might be a guy who thinks it's foolish. He's kind of... I'm not sure he's the kind of guy that would say, this is dumb. This has nothing to do with football. And there are some teams who think that he didn't even really try with the three tests, that he just got through it real quick and just moved on because he didn't think it had anything to do with football. So if that were the case, then it would be – because we know this, what the test scores look like and what CJ's play look like do not have any – there's nothing predictive about the score with CJ Stroud. Um, well, is he an outlier? He may be an outlier. And S2, I've talked to the guys who created S2 and off the off the air. Uh, we, talk, we had him on the air. We had Brandon um, – on the air and talk to him. And I think what they do is incredible. I think it's a very valuable resource and it's used by fighter pilots, baseball teams, football teams, but it got too big a story with the one thing with CJ Stroud. And, and now you look back at it and you say, man, that score wasn't predictive of anything having to do with CJ Stroud. And as they always told you, this is just one little piece. Never did they intend for any of this to be, you know, for people to say this decides whether or not a guy can play quarterback. They never wanted it to be like that. I think it was uh, blown out. I think the stuff was blown out of proportion last year. But they're, Joe, they're still they're still in business. They're still out there, and they're still working with NFL teams. All right, let's get Brian in here. Hey, Brian, what's going on, guys? Hey, y'all were talking about uh, marriages and who who should be divorced. Lance, you mentioned that Montez was the the one that you would be divorced. I, I beg to differ, though, because, my God, Abreu is the one that you needed to divorce. And, and, you, and you can't divorce me, but what if you were, like, a polygamist and, like, you had multiple wives and you just moved Abreu to, like, the pool house and allowed another one to sleep in the bed? Because that's, that's that's what they need to do. Abreu's got to go to the pool house because he's the one you need to divorce. Yeah, I think that that's it's an interesting way of just benching Abreu, is to saying that he that you're a polygamist and he goes to the pool house, is an interesting way of saying the Astros need to bench Abreu. I don't know that they have to be polygamists and he has to go to a pool house so much as just separate from him. You're just getting well, a separation. Well, you were putting the analogies of the first marriage. Yeah, but can't you just get a separation from them? We, well, Do you want to keep them in your pool house? You got, I guess you you're going to have to because you can't get away from that contract. you got so much invested in it. So that's going to be awfully difficult. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know polygamy so much. I mean, if the first one's not ah, – I just – can you see, like – I don't know. I don't know how they do it, if you want to know the truth. 
I don't just see American women being all that happy. Unless it's a religious thing, I just don't see them all being all that happy sharing a husband. I just don't. I just I just feel like it's a that's a bad option. To, I think getting, you know, hey, cutting ties with the first one and then marrying the second one is a much better option than, but you know, multiple wives. I've met some of you and seen some of you. The fact that one woman decides to live with you and says, this is the guy I want. You guys think you got the riz to get the second one to do it too? No yeah. chance. And then yeah. she's, and then you got to make both of them happy where they're sharing time, they're sharing no. your time, and they're going to be happy with that? You guys think you're that charismatic? No. N- nah. My wife would argue that, you know, she's not all that happy in a second marriage. It might have worked out for me. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, there's there's two sides to every story, isn't there? And yeah. it depends on the perspective. <clears throat> Let's get Gilbert in here, see if he's ever been married. Gilbert, oh, you've never been married, have you, Gilbert? What's that? You've never been married, have you? No, and I've never been married before. No, I haven't. Would you want to be married or not? Just say no. No, I don't want to be married. I knew it. Why not? No, I don't want to get married anyway, you know. What were you saying? You said too much what? Didn't want to get married, okay? Okay. Okay. Dig any further with it. Don't push them. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. I got you. Why are you, why are you digging in deep on this Did thing? you see? Oh, the Astros this year anyway. They ain't good any so good. Nope. Four and eight now. And the Astros, um, the Astros lose yesterday. They took a lead, lost in the, in extra innings in the 10th. Um, the bad news though is it. Well, hold on. I just, let me finish this a little quick thing real quick. Framber Valdez went to the IL for 15 days with an arm issue. So this is pretty terrible. If you're keeping track of arm issues for Astros, we're up to five, but Two of them were already known, but let's just say three. Justin Verlander, uh, Jose Arquiti, and now Framber Valdez. Not looking great, Gilbert. Are they going to win tonight or lose tonight? Well, John Spencer Arigetti, which rhymes with spaghetti, is pitching for the Astros tonight. He came up from the minor leagues. I'll let you call it, John. Are they going to win tonight or lose tonight? They're going to win tonight. What are you, crazy? they got the Italian on the mound. I mean, it's kind of a funny Italian. What was his first name? Spencer. Spencer yeah. Who's the catcher yeah. again? Caratini. Yeah, Caratini. What are we gonna? Is that all Italian battery? Is that where we're gonna, gonna see the Italian battery? Let's, Ooh, what a great as nickname! As, as long as we can get Yiner in at first base or, or DH, and I'm fine with it. Okay, okay that's fine. Okay, I don't want to lose that Latin connection we have. Okay, so yeah, Caratini. <laughs> That, uh, uh, an Arrighetti to Caratini combination? It doesn't what? sound like winning baseball, historically. It sounds like, sounds like historically, one of the I, can't, of all time. I don't know that well, you can find a winning combination well, of Italian the, to Italian. Back in the 50s, maybe. Well, oh, if yeah. we're looking. Nah. Yogi what? Berra? Are you kidding? Italians, the Italians, in, the fi- to, Italians in the who 50s. Who pitched to him? Don Drysdale's not Italian. Sandy Kof. Oh, no, Those no, no. Dodgers. I'm going Dodgers. No, yeah. Dodgers. Uh, Yankees. Yankees. I'm in just the talking 50s. about the great Italians who were part of baseball in the fifties. They were they had they had a they run had the plenty Italians. Of Italians. Who start naming some DiMaggio. Okay. Yeah. DiMaggio. Mostly You'll... Yankees. Yeah. Well yeah. north the the New York, yeah. Manto. Mika ma Mickey Amanto. Mickey Amanto. <laughs> Mickey Ted Kozuskio. No, that's Polish. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh well I put a yo on the O on the Yeah. End. There's yeah. not a bunch of great Italian baseball players. Oh, yes, there are. Oh, okay. Jackie you wanna, Robinson. You don't want to go uh, here, do you? Not a no, Robinson. No, go ahead. Uh. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Willie Stargela. Hey, <laughs> look at me. Fr- uh, David Parker. Uh, uh, Franco Harris. No, we're talking about baseball, baseball players. Was Give long. me all your great Italian. Red Shane Adista. Oh, Mike Piazza. Mm-hmm. How's that? Any oh, my good? God. That's not from the 50s. Tony Lazzari. Ron you? Santo, Phil Rizzuto, Ooh. Joe DiMaggio, Carl Ferrillo, Rocky oh, Calavito. He, he, Googled he Googled it. He Googled it. He Googled it. He Googled it. Phil Rizzuto. John Franco, Mike Piazza, No, we said in the fifth. Okay, how many of these are catchers? Rocky Calavito. How many of these Rocky are catchers? Rocky Calavito, Carl Ferrillo. My you point is the pitcher to catcher battery is not a successful battery. John Franco. Reliever. Great. Reliever. 
a reliever. You don't. There's not. If you've got an Italian, Italian pitcher to player, an Italian but, catcher, you got a losing combination historically in baseball. Name the oh best one. The the best Yogi Berra, one of the greatest catchers of all time. And who was pitching to him? Oh, you hear Al Bianchi. Mm, How's that? Is that I, any good? I guess that, I don't know. I yeah. No, no, no. no. Ricky Patelico. Yeah. <laughs> I don't Ralph know. Brinka. Ralph Brinka. We got great Italians now. Bo Bichette. JT Real Muto. They're everywhere. Yeah. Joey Votto, one of our favorites. I didn't say what? Italians can't play baseball. I Joey said that the Italian battery of pitcher to catcher is typically not a big one, but uh, maybe the Astros can do something about it. Another Italian, that. Justin Verlander. Is he? Well, Verlander uh, to Caratini. John, John's not going to count him. Why not? Yeah. He's not going to count. Because That's like, Dell, do you count Isaiah Hartenstein on your team? Oh, if you guys don't know this. The Isaiah Hartenstein is black because his dad is black. People don't know this because he doesn't. Well, you oh, it's, seen ca- him. it's caused a seen big him. fury. <laughs> you see, it's him. caused a quite a it's, kerfuffle it's on it's black the, Twitter. It's the Mike McDaniel syndrome. Yes. Yeah. Although black people seem to be okay with Mike McDaniel, he dresses, he's cool. Yeah, he's Isaiah cool. Hartenstein. There's a lot Mike, of because a of, lot of arguments because going of the last on. name. But we've seen a picture. His dad is black. He's. Yeah. He calls himself bright skin, but the argument, like we're not doing this one drop of blood thing anymore. His he's dad only one is quarter. Black. He's they've already. I'm just telling you what Black Twitter said. He's half. He's biracial. Okay. He's, so he can't call himself black. He has to call himself biracial. Is what is what um, because Yvonne three zero seven six six two said. Okay. One, of course, uh, a scholar who you're who you're quoting. Um, but I get it. He pa- he wouldn't. He Verlander can't as call white. himself. He passes his white. Verlander does not pass his Italian. He is an Italian man. Wait John's never mentioned him. Wait a minute. Verlander's his mama is Italian? I don't know if it's mama, but he's listed as Italian, along with Joe Musgrove as well. Because y'all are all, because they're trying to claim him, Dell. Nice they're trying to claim him. You guys are trying to claim the Italians. I don't have him on my Italian list here, Dell. <laughs> Sorry, Dell. I do. All the Italians. John's got a list of the Italians. I've got him, among others, a guy named David Fletcher. Which doesn't sound Italian, but he's Italian too. He's Italian too. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah, I'm gonna. Cl- I'll claim Verlander. You're not gonna not? claim these guys. Oh, Listen yeah. to their names. They end in oh, consonants. Zach they- Gallen, Dave- okay. Italian. How Consonant. Dave Rigetti to Joe Girardi. Is that good enough for you? Ooh. Is that is that, that was combination? As good. Yeah, that was as good as you get. Yeah. No. There's was- a lot of great ones. No, there's not a lot nuts? of great ones. Yeah. We got a, a lot of great we Italian got, We had a great Italian here playing who was a catcher but shifted to second base. Biggio. Biggio. Yeah. Curtis right. Schilling. Who pitched to him she- that was so great? Schilling. The Kurt Schilling pitched to Biggio. Joe Sambito. Yeah. How's that? To Alan Ashaby. That was and his catcher. Craig, and Craig Biggio. No. Sambito, yes. I don't know that he ever threw to. He may he have been have gone by the time Biggio Maybe was there. Maybe he threw one out uh, 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 the opening pitch. Yeah, hey, look. Gilbert, are you still there? Oh, Gilbert, what's up? Put the he's phone down. Still. He, no, he's on. Like, he's on. Hey, Gilbert, are you still there? He just. No. We put. You know what? That was a good That was a good Gilbert call. No, but we what? were able to grind him out so he couldn't ask for the picture. That's good <laughs> well, stuff. Let's, play, let's, let's, uh, let's break it here. Someone 3780. Three seven seven six is the number. I got to talk a little Chastang of Ford. That's on my people over there. I don't know that Chastang. I don't know. A Joe looks like he could be. Yeah, it could. Patrick could be. We don't know. You don't know. It doesn't matter to me though. Could be what John. This. Could be what. I, I'm in, Italian. I'm in the family. I'm in the Chastango family. Okay, that's what I know. The Chastangs have been doing this for a long, long time, and the Chastangs, the family has been passed down. the The business has been passed down from generation to generation to generation, and you don't do that unless you do a great job. And they're bigger and they're better than ever. They're the number one, number one commercial Ford dealership in the city of Houston. How awesome is that? That is just spectacular. That tells you something about them, people. It tells you that you're going to get a great deal. Businesses only do – their businesses are heartless. They don't care about it. What they want, they want the best deal. They want the car. They want the service. They want the, the quality of the Ford. They want the service that's second to none, and they want the best price for it. So that's Chastang Ford. Now, why don't you do that with your – now, 
there is some emotion to it, okay? The Chastain is going to work their tails off to make sure that you get your best deal. They're going to make work their tails off to make sure that you're not choking on the payments. Then one of the first things that they'll ask you is where do your payments have to be? And that's what they, they get them there, okay? And they're not going to add on just to jack up the price. They don't believe in that. They just don't. While other dealerships... That's all they care about. Make sure that you get them in here, close, 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 and make sure you get as much as you possibly can. That ain't the way they do business at Chastain Ford. Never have, never will. Chastain, uh, just, ChastainFord.com on 610 at Homestead, not Hempstead. It's only five minutes from downtown. It's Chastain Ford. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. All right, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. That was a terrible Gilbert call. Well, you, you guys just stepped all over him. We couldn't even talk to Gilbert. All right. Let's see if you agree with this. Ross Tucker. Ross Tucker loved the Texans trade. And – you know, we talked about it a little bit earlier, Lance. It's is it is it as good since they gave him more money and since they cut out the years? I mean, it is a second rounder that it can only turn into a fifth. Were you worried he, though, John? He's picked up. Were you worried I about mean, him as a personality in the locker room? Yes. Did, yes. Doesn't this doesn't this insulate you then? It does. It it actually yeah. Here's what I think could absolutely happen is that is that he it finds out that he likes it here. Yeah. He finds out that he wants to play with CJ. He likes the, the, the wide receiver room. Or maybe Nico is going to leave and there's a spot open that's going to still be here for – I mean, he's a little bit older now. I don't know if you can call him a number one for four more years. Who, Stephon Diggs? Stephon Diggs. No, probably not. Probably not. So, I, I, is, it a, is it a decent move? Yeah, but here's Ross Tucker, his thoughts – on the trade since they uh, took away those last three years? You know, I don't like the trade for Stephon Diggs as much for the Houston Texans after this contract adjustment. First of all, you trade a second-round pick for only one year of Diggs services. You can't get a comp pick because you shorten the contract. And you give him a $3.5 million raise for that same one year that you didn't even have to do? They say they're doing it because they want him to be supremely motivated, I believe, to perform very well. What about the opposite? What if Nico Collins is getting the ball a lot? What if they're giving the ball to Tank Dell a lot? I feel like this could really go either way. 
with Stephon Diggs in Houston and a second round pick for one year. It's a little bit much. Uh, it's a lot. I mean, look, I I thought the same thing when they when they restructured the contract form so that he could become a free agent, and you found out that's what he wanted to do. Um, that was part of the terms of it, but I think the Texans also, I think it actually benefits them. Listen, it is a, it is an all-in, go-for-it move now. Are the, are the Texans ready for that? I don't know, but I, I do know that there have been cracks in the um, Chiefs' armor, for sure. The Buffalo Bills now are not going to be as good a team. The Bengals still have to prove that they can be a sustainable team and can win at a high level. They never, they rarely start off really good. Uh, they have very slow starts typically. Um, Chargers need to finally show something. I, the Jets, we'll see. We've heard about the hype of the Jets. John, this 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 move gives you a chance to compete immediately for an AFC championship. I really, well, I, I really believe that. But what it also does, it gives you a chance to sit back after the year's over, assess Nico, assess Stefan assess the entire setup with Stefan, Nico, and Tank, and then make a decision from there. Yeah. AI has the Texans playing the Lions in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, and AI is, we know it's infallible. It is um, infallible. If we, if we run the program over and over and over again, it's what we get. So that's, sorry, but that's just that's just the fact of it. Listen, they're going for it. I don't mind it. I, you know, I know it's a second. It wasn't. Even, it wasn't their second rounder. I know that they gave up you know, their 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 first round pick this year to to get that, but they're going for it. Stefan Diggs for a year, and you don't even know. You don't know if it's going to be more or not. You know what? You don't know that whether or not he's going to say, you know, I like it and I want to I want to resign here. Whatever the case may be, he could be a great citizen. It, listen, I don't know why <laughs> the three and a half million dollars that they threw at him. I know he's going to be happier, but in game eight, if he gets two targets, it that three and a half million is not going to matter. It's not going to matter. No, to he's going to be this. start doing the affirmations. Three and a half million more. They gave me three and a half million more. He'll, he'll it'll wipe away all the angst when he's not mm. been targeted for two quarters, John. No, I, I'm not sure that's going to be the case. I think pretty sure he's just going to forget that and said, "You, I'm, you know what? I deserve that anyway." So throw me the ball. He goes, "That was my money anyway." Yeah. Yeah, you, you're just giving me my money. Shut up, Texans, um, and throw me the ball. I, I don't know. I hope he's going to be – I don't know. Um, yeah, did you guys see how big a deal everybody was making because Josh Allen told him after the first game – when they lost that first game to the Jets, how Josh Allen in the locker room told Stephon Diggs, hey, it's just one flipping game. It's one game. Because he was, okay. yeah, he was losing his mind there. I think sometimes we just shouldn't hear about or see about stuff that goes but, on. But in the the, why room. is that such a big deal? It's, it's not. It's, it's that Josh was getting tired of him. That he was wearing on Josh Allen, and I don't know. I mean, things happen in locker rooms. That, yeah, things happen in sports that we shouldn't. That we, that we used to not hyper be hypersensitive to it, and. And, yeah, sometimes there's things that matter and that are important, and there's other times that we just have to – now, I think in this particular instance, this is a – I think the, the, the problem with that one, John, is trying to minimize it is there was a, there was a pattern of behavior with Stephon Diggs versus Josh Allen, and I think it just goes to show – it just adds context to how that relationship was just kind of at a point where maybe it was, it was just not going to be a good relationship with the two. I wonder, I think it's great that C.J. Stroud is already getting work in with Stephon Diggs and, and the other wide receivers. I think that's fantastic. I'm excited. And I do wonder, there is something to be said about maybe maybe Stephon Diggs will, you know, he, he got upset in, in Minnesota where Kirk Cousins was. And yeah, Josh Allen got upset there. Maybe he's going to get upset in Houston as well because he doesn't get the targets he wants. But I think that I think there's plenty of targets and balls to go around. If, if winning is his top priority, then, it, which it has to be now that he knows he's going to be a free agent. Um, well, I, th I think his targets are his, probably his top priority priority based on history. I mean, we've seen this for nine years. But you have a good chance to win. You have a good chance to perform at a high level. You have a good chance to have it all headed into this season. If if winning is, is secondary to him, to his targets, then, you know, could be an issue. But having three guys with that talent and then throwing – 
you know, and then throwing Dalton Schultz in the mix, it makes Houston extraordinarily hard to game plan for. I know we will speculate, and, and if we put these questions to the Texans, they'll talk, they'll push it aside, they'll give us, well, we want them extremely, extremely motivated. But the fact that they understand the volatility of Stefan Dick, or at least the perceived volatility of Stefan Dick so much that they were, that they're like, you know what, we got him for three years plus, but you know, we just want to make it one because we're not sure. We don't, we don't want to be tied to this particular player for long if we don't need to. I, culture can. That's a thing where if you win, you got great culture. If you don't, then all of a sudden your culture is terrible. But it is interesting that they they are fully aware and they're still they're bringing him in, knowing that hey, this could blow up. And and I guess if they think they're that close, they make the move. But I when they changed the contract, it spoke to me saying, all right, we know at any point. This could fall apart, but we think we got a real shot. Yeah, that's what yeah. it is. And, and by the way, he's on board with it, too. He and Adisa Bakari, his agent, wanted it like that because they get to the market. Instead of being stuck with their old contract, they get some new money with a new contract. The timing, he's at 30 years old. Like, or is it 30 or 31? I think he's 30 right now. If he were to stay on that contract the whole time, he may really decline and not have the contract. Like, they want to be able to get to a market right now that's robust for running backs. And so the, the, the Texans said, we'll do it. In general, it would not have been a great deal for the Texans. Where they are right now, where they found themselves so quickly, I don't think it's bad because you get to just sniff around on, you know, kick the tires a little bit on Stefan Diggs. And if it doesn't work out, then so be it. Then he's gone and... You know, the the rental, it would have been an expensive rental. But this is when you kind of go for it more than the two first-rounders for a tackle go for it when you were still your roster. The Bill O'Brien move to me was never a go-for-it move. He said it was go-for-it. The fans bought him with go-for-it. That was not a go-for-it move for a left tackle. You're actually, believe it or not, you're actually closer now from a talent standpoint. This is kind of a go-for-it move, and it's going to hurt if he leaves after one year. It won't be great, but at the same time, you know, they took a shot, and I give the Texans credit for taking a shot. What were the, the – it was like 16, 19, 18 that was left on the deal. Is he going to get more than that in the open market? Um, I'll look at Stephon yeah, Diggs' contract. How much is contract. a 31-year-old Stephon yeah. Diggs going to get? Considering more than he would when he's 33. Yeah, no, but is he going – like, let's say he has a good year on par with the – on par with when you're sharing targets with the likes of Tank, we we know the weapons. Is he going to get three years, like fifty plus million from a team, considering all the things around him at thirty plus years old? His old contract, John, was um, I gotta see. It was it was, yeah. I, I don't have the old numbers. They've already they've already yeah, wiped it already away. Deli- they've already yeah. wiped it away. It, but it came out to be about. The, the last three years of his deal beyond the one in 2024, it came out to be like 50 plus million dollars around there. So he gave that up to get back 17 to or 18. Oh, no, million. I'm sorry. Average salary is 24 million. Four years, Over 24. Four years. It was four year, 200. Yeah, it was a four year, 296,000. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 960, 96 million dollars. So it's a four year, 96 million dollar deal. Um, signing bonus is 21.5. The average salary. Was twenty four yeah, million a year? The average, but what was left on the deal was not that. There was only there were only there were three years left at seventeen, eighteen. He got the bulk of it because of the signing bonus up front. There were, the, the, uh, if I remember correctly, it was like sixteen, seventeen, and nineteen. Yeah, it was around there. Yeah. Yeah. Was it because yes. their cash? Yeah, it was because their I remember, cash AAV is twenty nine million this well, year. No, I remember doing it, talking about this on on the Mopi and Mape show about how much he he would potentially get compared to the deal if he stayed with it instead of wiping it out. Yeah, it was in that seven, it was around 50 plus million over 3 years which yeah. was remaining. So, yep. is he going to get it's that 225. The the Texans signed a 1 year 225. Well, they well, they, they upped is the what gar- they have. Well, they upped the guarantee of 3.5. He was making he was going to make about 18 whatever this year and they gave him 3. including 5. a 20 million dollar signing bonus. I yeah. I mean, I you know, they did they did some work here because the cap hit is 5.8 million. So they did. They put some work in here, and then next, you know, the dead money next year. You're right, John. Would have been sixteen million. Would that's have right, been the yeah. cap hit. So yeah. that's what we're saying. So anyway, is he going to get that on the open market? And I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. 
I don't know that it was best for him to actually do this. We'll see, though. Of course, they could cut him at any time yeah. uh, after that deal. Oh, it's always but, best to do this. You get more money. He got more money up front. He got but cash up front. He 32 gets the, year old wide receiver, which we. Doesn't matter. Take a two year deal at. For what? Two year at, at 40, 42 million. How, did, how much did Mike Evans get? million. Really? Mike Not Evans yet. got a pretty good deal. Not but, yet. Oh, sh- he's yelling at you. They're trying to. Come on clean. in. No. <laughs> No. Siri, come in. No, do not come in. Do Alexa, not come in. Alexa, come in. Uh, you know what? Oh, my Siri started Here's talking. the deal is I'm sure that a lot of you stay in hotel. I'm, I'm in a hotel room, and they were knocking to clean my room. Sorry. Wait. Listen, I'm sure a lot of you would. You probably dip in your hotel room, and you leave that spit cup. You're gross, okay? And people who have to clean up after you think you're gross. I've seen guys, they're sitting at the bar, and they're, they're – all the tobacco is on the floor that they were putting in. They're putting in their dip, and it's, and then they're spitting into a bottle or a cup with a pe- with a napkin in it. It's gross. It's gross. And oh, by the way, it's dangerous. So stop. Artists in Grange, Canstead and Dublin. Okay, they are cleaner. It's not. It's better all the way around. It's got CBD oil in it. So that, you know, you're swallowing, you're not spitting all over the place. It's the same sensation. you got the same flavor that you like. If you like the evergreen or the mint or citrus or tobacco flavor, they got that. What, whatever it is that you like, you got it. But, but not the grossness and not the danger, okay? CBD American Shaman likes it so much, they, they're carrying it in select stores. You like it so much, you've been ordering it. Order some more. Let's go. 975dip.com. That's 975 dip dot com. Del, what would you like for me to tell people about? Well, who's our favorite lawyer, Lance? Well, it's John Daspit, and John Daspit is a lawyer who I, I, I see these. So when you watch TV, you'll see some commercials that are kind of crazy for some of these personal injury lawyers. You look at billboards, and some of them are crazy. You'll see a lot of different lawyers. And the first thing, the first time I, when I met John Daspit, I'd known his name for years and years because he's he sponsored uh, Glenn Davis on Soccer Matters for a long time. And uh, he wanted to distance himself from PI lawyers. He said, look, I'm a personal injury lawyer, but I don't do the crazy stuff. I'm just, I, I do things the right way. I came from Fulbright Jaworski, did my law degree at University of Houston. And he went through everything and showed me how he works. And it's a lot different, but it's a lot more successful than the other guy. The other guys are in it to just get a commission off you and bounce. And that's what they're doing if you've been injured in a car wreck, an offshore 
accident, uh, workplace incident, you know, refinery blast, he handles that. You take a look at the amount of people who trust John Dash, but it's because he's been successful, and they tell other people about it. And he makes sure that all your bills are covered. He makes sure that your time missed from work. He overturns every stone to make sure that you're going to be treated fairly and that you're compensated properly for your pain and suffering. That's what his job is, and he is going to work hard for you against the insurance agency that is trying to you know, squeeze you because that's what their job is, I guess, is to take it, try to take advantage of you. Well, John Daspot's not letting that happen. 713 call now. That's the phone number. Don't let that happen to you or someone you love ever again. Make sure you have John Daspot on your side. DaspotLaw.com or call 713 call now. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. All right. Welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. John and Lance along with Dell here with you. I had a – there was a listener here, Robert, who was uh, – he's a Buffalo fan. And um, he bought me a couple of Modellos. I didn't think that was funny at all. So I, I gave drink him, him back to him. Yeah, I came back, and he ended up drinking Coors Lights with us, which was which was great. Where we here at the bar before the game at, here at the stadium? You pre-gamed? Oh, I, I pre I pre-gamed all week. What are you talking? Did you how do post you game? You, how do you think can, you get to where you need to be if you don't pre-game? Dell and I can hear the pre and post game in your voice today. Yeah, well, my voice is fine. Thank Your you. throat is and just. And he tried to call me a liar when I pointed it out what's going yeah, on no, off you're the a air. Liar. And then oh, he brought it on man. the air. He was like, that's a lie. He has no mute button. Right. I, no. Yeah, and, mute. We, and we can hear it. No, you just, it's ridiculous. Your oh, throat is oh, beating oh, the brakes off you. Um, you're getting no, the I'm, brakes I'm beat off you, John. You're like I'm, everybody. I'm good, actually. Your throat is Connecticut and you're every other team in the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> Um, By the way, can I tell you what one of the dumbest things that I keep hearing is DJ Burns is going to be a tackle. NFL teams are checking a – Talk to your boy Peter Schrager. He's I, the one who brought that I to know, the table. I know. He did. Jim Nagy said that. DJ Burns, number one, needs to get a whole lot stronger in his upper body. His body type is not built for offensive tackle play. I know he's a dancing bear with the feet and all that stuff, and he's big. But, man, there's a level of toughness that you have to have. You know who is a starting tackle? And a good one who didn't play college uh, basketball and didn't play college football. Um, the left tackle for, uh, God dang it, for Philadelphia. The starting left tackle. Lane John? No, no he's no, the no. right tackle. Eagles who played, guess what he played? Rugby. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'll bring up the name here in a second. It's, uh, no, not Andre Dillard. That, Jordan Mylotta, that's right. Jordan Mylotta took over for Andre Dillard. A legitimate left tackle in college football. He played American football. Was not tough. By the way, Bill O'Brien had him nailed. <clears throat> OB told me he didn't think he was tough enough and wouldn't draft him. And I remember the fans were really upset that the Texans didn't end up with Andre Dillard. They're really upset. Andre Dillard was a bust. Bill O'Brien got that right. While, uh, while Titus Howard, to me, has been very average, Andre Dillard has been a legitimate bust. And Jordan Mailata played rugby and was a freaky athlete. There's another guy now who played uh, rugby who has also played in British Columbia, um, Canada, by the name of Giovanni Manu. He's six foot seven, three hundred and fifty three pounds. How do you feel about that one, John? He's got, Giovanni Manu. He's got a now, first he's, name you he's love. He's Tongan. He's Tongan though. Just keep that in mind. I'm fine with it. If you want to appropriate, okay, that's fine. <laughs> The Cowboys brought him in. Multiple teams have brought him in for a top 30 visit. He's 6'7", uh, 353 pounds. He's built of, I don't want to say solid muscle, but he's very well put together. 33-inch vertical leap. Um, not The foot quickness is pretty average, but he's played football in Canada, but he's going to be a guy that might actually get drafted. Wait a minute. Who cares what he can leap at if he's a tackle? Well, explosive hips. It shows your ability to unlock your hips and drive. Can you mm. bend your hips and can you unlock your hips and drive? Like explosive jumps typically uh, tell you how strong they are to push a sled and stuff like that. It just measures hip hip strength and hip explosiveness, and it's actually very predictive of somebody being able to drive block. All right. Well, getting back to, okay, 
I don't know. Where, where, I don't know. You took this on. You were asking about who some of the top rugby athletes. No one. No one. No one, no one that. asked that. No one did that. Actually, thought, we were going to talk. You we mentioned the basketball, and did you guys see the numbers, the final numbers on the women's uh, college game and the men's college game? Let me predict. Now, the women's college game was on ABC. The men's college game was on TBS. I'm going to predict the women's game for the first time in history beat the men's game. The men's game wasn't on CBS as well? Nope. The, it was just it was The women's game was on, e, was on ESPN. And ABC. I saw it on ABC. The ESPN oh, broadcast yeah. had Tarasi and Bird. Uh, ABC had the regular broadcast. ABC did not have... Um, no, it wasn't on CBS either. I watched it I on... It was on... T- I said TNT. ABC. TNT. TNT. Yeah. No, the men's. Yeah. Men's. Okay. Yeah. Men's was on TNT, but it also started at eight four eight twenty here. Yeah, eight eight twenty central, right? Yeah. And the women nine twenty East Coast. Started, Where did the women start? I think it started at two on two a o'clock. Sunday. Oh, two afternoon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Two, what the afternoon. numbers come in at? Uh, almost nineteen million for the women and fourteen something for the men. Wow, the women went but, from twelve and a but, half but million. Against LSU know. to 14 million against UConn to 19 million against South Carolina. Yeah, 18, 9, 18 something. Holy 18, crap, those well, are monster numbers. They are monster numbers, but and, and but the you know there was the question was well this is what you get for starting your game so late. This is what you get for not having Caitlin Clark on the court. Right. That's what you get it for. That's what you get if Caitlin. The, the, the Saturday game against LSU was the late game, right? Was it Friday? Friday. Friday game. Well, John, why LSU. don't you talk about the fact also that you know this. TBA, TNT, I already knew they weren't going to beat the women's because the women's, anytime you're on broadcast television, it's going to be higher than cable television. It's always been the case. And they were on ESPN and ABC. Well, at least the Tarasi feed. They were not on standard ESPN. But the Tarasi and Sue Bird ESPN2 feed did feature the game. And then ABC, that's going to be higher than TNT. It still sings true that standard television rates higher than than, than cable television. It's it, just it, the truth. It still, it still does. It's easier to find all of that stuff. But uh, but the Tarasi crew, how about Taras, Tarasi and one of the, her other cohorts, the Connecticut women, think that, that Paige Beckers should be drafted, should would be drafted she first. Said that on over. the broadcast. They uh, yeah. Uh, Sue Bird, who was on the broadcast, asked her Pe- Beckers or or Clark. Yeah. And Tarasi said Beckers. Yeah. Which is ridiculous, but only because of the PR. Maybe Paige Beckers would be a better pick. I don't know. We'll find that well, out. Speaking of the those- PR, Tarasi's own team is marketing the matchup between her and and Clark already on their socials. It was like the goat or something like that versus the rook. Um, and, it's, and it's a silhouette of Clark. Of course, she do, isn't in an Indiana Fever uniform yet. Hell, she's not even on, on the team yet, but they're already marketing it and selling tickets for it. So um, the league knows who's who's the draw. And Tarasi helped because she talked about her in a certain way that a rivalry, a quote-unquote rivalry, has already Hold begun. On, I, mean, I mean, are we fully – I don't – I don't know that we're fully – Absorbing this, the women's national championship game crushed the men's national championship game. Whatever you want to say, the time frame, what channels they're on, this is inconceivable, except for the fact that we know the Caitlin Clark appeal. And for people who try to downplay that, that's just hater stuff. There's really nothing that you, other than the fact that you just don't like her, you don't want her to succeed, there's no way, Don Staley said it, the way she uplifted the women's game, are we fully talking enough about the fact that the women's national championship game not only beat the men's, which has got to be the first, it's easily the first time in history. There's no way this has ever happened. But I mean crushed them. And according to Nielsen, at their peak in the national championship game, peak viewership was 24.1 million for the final minutes of the game between 5 and 5.14 p.m. Eastern. The women's championship game audience stance is the largest in women's college basketball history and is the most watched basketball game at any level since 2019. You had it. Do you understand what that means? Like superstar. The men got their asses kicked in ratings by by women's college basketball and specifically Caitlin Clark. Well, I think even though Zach Eady is a thing to see and Klingon's a giant dude, there's a foregone conclusion about that game. You ever Uh, seen Zach Eady before? I've seen him. A Zach Eady like player. 
Yes, you have. You've big, seen that. Big, strong, Clinging, tall guy. you ever seen a guy like yes. that? Yes. And you have a superstar on the other side. The storylines help. Caitlin Clark's a superstar. She's She was in the final last Against year. Against an undefeated team. And you team. got an undefeated team on, on the other side. And you have a, a recognizable, at least, head coach in Don Staley. All those things played a part. But, of course, Clark being a star and the way she plays, uh, the men really had no chance. I mean, anyone, no one was ex- excited about UConn-Purdue. You watch it because we're, we're sports fans, but no but one was you, but do you, excited do about you it. Do you acknowledge how huge that is? I'm that not saying it's not. I'm not saying it may, it may never happen again, but for this to happen, I, there, there's there got to be people. I never thought in my lifetime, well, this year I already thought that it would beat the men's, but this is this is a an enormous potential step for women's college basketball. Well, just yeah, but producing well, let's because players enorm- stay. But John, let's, players let's, stay. Let's see the enormous step back for next year. There's going to be a step back, but Paige Beckers is a four-year player, for example. Yep. Yeah, but uh, Caitlin Clark is a four-year she player. She hasn't captured America's I know, but heart the women, like Caitlin Clark. The did. women, no, that's true. But the women that you saw that can really ball, Juju, they're there for four years. Juju Watkins Juju is Juju Watkins next. is there for four years. Like, yeah, Juju – Juju might might carry. Who gets you the most years. excited about men's basketball in the future? Men's college basketball. Is there anyone that really gets you excited, John? No, I think men's college basketball is more about teams. It's the school. It's the the name on yeah. the front. And the problem yep. is, your best players leave early. Yeah. Well, it, it, that's. Are they still? I mean, are they still? Yeah, the best players still do. Well. Well, I mean, the a, the NBA caliber players do. If they're a lottery pick, they leave. Yeah, but more guys are staying now than in 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 college football and. And in uh, college basketball, not the top players though. Top um, players don't typically stay. Like El- like Cryer should be staying, if that were the case. He is, he staying. is staying. Oh no, no, no! That's right. Cryer staying, but Shed is, I guess not. Well, he hasn't made an announcement yet. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. maybe. We'll see. God, we'll I hope see. he comes back. It'd be smart to come back. Get some uh, Caitlin Clark money. You want to bet on it? You want to bet on where he's drafted? MyBookie.ag, promo code BET975. That's where you can find it. You can find it all, everything that you want to bet. How about casino gambling where you've got a live dealer? you got that at MyBookie.ag, promo code BET975. Instead of just, you know, oh, here is, uh, you know, here's the computer spitting out my cards. Mm. Uh, here's the computer spitting out the roulette wheel ball. Mm. I, I like it better than seeing right there in front of me the dealer, and you get that at my bookie. I like, I like the website. Period. The website is great. It's easy to navigate, and everything you could want to bet, it's right there for you. So simple, so easy. And because if they scare you, if these websites scare you with the betting or whatever, easy to to, to uh, put your money in, easy to get your money out. Easy to get your bonus by putting in bet, promo code BET975. All of that happen, happening every day. Your initial deposit, they're going to give you 50% bonus on your on what you put in. All you got to do is go to mybookie.ag and put in promo code BET975.
All right, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Uh, there's a Republican who suggests thousands of seniors shouldn't be voting. Do you think seniors shouldn't be allowed to vote in this country? Ooh, I think a Republican telling seniors not to vote is going to get kicked out of the kicked off the team. Um, that doesn't sound well, like the smartest move. Well, I think he meant he he doesn't think Joe Biden should be able to vote. <laughs> well, I think he. <laughs> I think he needs to change the way he says does seniors he, are overwhelmingly how, on the Does he know side. how old the lead, the leader of his party is? Yeah, well, he but I just does, I, is he more, aware? Isn't the age thing a lot more of an issue for Biden? Uh, but if he doesn't want seniors to vote, then the leader of yeah. his party can't vote. Not either. allowing seniors to vote is not a good thing. Yeah, not not restricting for, the vote is not smart. Not for a certain party, it isn't. Okay, so we had here's what he said: We had nursing homes where the sheriff of Racine investigated where you had 100 percent voting in nursing homes. If you're in a nursing home, you only have five, six months life expectancy. Okay, it, almost no one in nursing home is in a point to vote, and you had children, adult children, saying, "Who voted for my 85 or 90 year old father and mother?" Okay, so. I think he's just anti-nursing home because, well, you're not going to make it through this entire um, what, this, uh, this four, years? Four, four years. So yeah. you're voting for something that won't really affect you is what he's saying. Yes, huh. right. You, you shouldn't You shouldn't be allowed to vote. I, I, would I, say, I would tell him that that's the wrong path to take. You should take all those votes, Republican representative. Um, Billy D. Williams says actors should be allowed to wear blackface. Do you guys think Hold actors? On, Billy should... D. Williams is alive. Billy D. Williams said that. Yes, I thought Billy thought D. Williams dead. died. No, he's alive. If you're an actor, you should do anything you want to do. Okay. You can. The question is, will you be allowed to do anything after that? <laughs> yeah. well, um. So apparently, uh, Lawrence Olivier was in blackface. He thought the performance of in in the film Othello. When he did Othello, I fell out laughing. He stuck his ass out and walked around with his ass, you know, because black people. Are, oh my God! Never mind. <laughs> what? What? I love when John just reads headlines. Okay. I oh my God! I can't read this. Billy oh, D my. almost got you in trouble. Billy D almost got me in this trouble. This is Billy Thank D's you, Billy ultimate D. get back against John. He's like, I'll yeah. teach John a lesson. Tennessee Senate passed that bill. Remember that that bill that would arm public school teachers? Yeah. Guess what? Passed. It Congratulations, passed, okay. Tennessee. That's going to all end well, isn't it? Tennessee, if you're a, a public school teacher, you can pack now. Hmm. What do you guys think? I just think – uh, are these the same teachers who decide on, hey, we need to show the impact of slavery so we make all the white kids the slave owners and the black kids the slaves? Yeah, Is that the level I that we're talking about here? I still can't believe that we, we still have that. schools that continue to think they're going to, like, that's going to be the move. Because if that's the level of intellect we're dealing with, I'm not happy with this particular decision. Can't trust them. Can't trust them. You just can't. You just can't. You're not trust bright them. enough to know that'll get you in trouble. But you're going to be bright enough. But you're going to have a gun. Yeah, well, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah. Oh, here's a nice story, Dell. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even doing this one. I'm not doing that. You can't. And these are two stories he's backed out of already. Yeah. I actually, we're done. That's all. I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Yeah, we're done. We got to go. What has happened? Got to go. Got to go. You're showing discretion? Uh, I did. He one, backed I, well, out I of two get... stories. He's like, okay. I got yeah. a long drive home today from Dallas, so I'm. Uh, I just don't want to regret the and whole drive. And what happens if the the eclipse comes back and you can't see while you're driving? So there's that concern right. too. Exactly. What if we get a, a surprise eclipse yep. out of nowhere? That's the concern that people have right now. Yeah, yeah. Did you see the number of eyes uh, people, the doctors, have had to see because people think they've got. Their eyes have problems now since the eclipse. All you had to do was just hold your hand up and make a tiny little crack yeah. between your fingers and just look through that way like I did. Yeah, that's the that's smart. What... Like, that's nature sunglasses. Yeah. All right, we're done. What about Houston? Is my man here? Houston. Oh, you've got to make the call. Well, I got, I got Houston to talk. I need Houston on here because we're talking about TPC. TPC Industrial. 
That's where you get your PVF hose and fitting on, okay? You need pipes, valves, fittings, flanges, forged steel couplings, hoses. Make all of this stuff, okay? Houston and Archie have been in business, and they do a hell of a job. They've got thousands, thousands of pieces in stock ready for you at TPC Industrial. If you have any issue with getting your whatever equipment that you need for your site, TPC Industrial is here for you. They are really, really, really good at this. And our, and Houston's joining us right now, as a matter of fact. What up, Houston? What's up, Johnny G? How are you, buddy? Good, man. Well, tell the people what you're doing. Man, we've, we've, we've just started pushing out more and more inventory, uh, bringing in more and more inventory and pushing out more to, uh, to job sites, man. We've got four different projects going on in Mont Bellevue right now, um, about six in Baytown and all across the ship channel. So we're really hitting home. Uh, with what we're doing right now, and it, but it doesn't matter where you are, right? If you can hear us, you can you you, you can get it to them, right? Yeah, even if you can hear you on a satellite radio or listen to your podcast, we can get it to you. How, how about that? Doesn't matter where you are, people. And listen, and you guys got stuff that other companies. If you're short on it, right? You got in a lot of instances. You got it in stock, and if not, you'll find it for them. Definitely, man. And we we deal with a lot of other. Uh, I say competitors are actually friends of ours in the industry. We all work together, so if, uh, if they don't have it, give us a call. Uh, we don't mind working with you and working with your customer as well. TPCINDL.com. TPCINDL.com, or call them at 346-226-3866. So all of you guys out there in this industry that need something, it's TPC Industrial. Thanks, Houston. Thanks, Johnny.
Welcome to the show. Welcome in. And got to admit, a little frazzled, and it kind of started early, even before this show began, or even the uh, the show I produced earlier began. I was at CVS, oh, um, just driving in, just to get a drink, um, a water and an energy drink, just because you wake up early, maybe a little tired, need a little boost. And when I, and CVS has self checkout, and particularly at that time of the morning, the workers aren't all that interested in being around their cash registers and i'm happy with that it means i don't have to interact with anyone but i needed help from the work the workers today the employees today because i dr- i don't even know really how to explain it but in the midst of paying for the drinks being tired and unfocused i dropped my i dropped my my debit card into i'm looking i'm looking at uh our system here and it looks like 92 fives a little a little behind um so yeah, so Sean's gonna have to step out. We are we started the show, but somehow, some way, ninety seven five is, is behind. But I dropped my debit card into an unfortunate slot, so I don't even really know how to put it other than I couldn't get to my debit card. It'd be as if you dropped it in the perfect spot to ruin your day. So the workers had to come out and kind of disassemble part of the self checkout area. And then I had to use a flexible ruler to push the debit card out into a spot where I could grab it. And the problem was there were like three other cards in there. Fortunately for the people who dropped those, they were gift cards. So they didn't have to worry about them. Me, I have to get my debit card out of there and then rush to work. So that took about 15 minutes. Made me late for, not late as far as the show starting, but late as far as prep. So it's been a frazzling day. And it's all on the heels of what was a busy night. As far as the Astros and the Rockets are concerned, and you knew kind of early that it was going to be one of those nights for the for the Astros bases loaded, no one out and you only push one run across. And You're like, okay, it's going to be one of those nights. You got Christian Javier doing Christian Javier things. And by that, it means it feels like with some batters, he's unhittable. And then with other batters, he's scuffling along. And then eventually, after getting through the first couple of innings, it all caught up with him. And the Astros go from being up three nothing to losing a game three, excuse me, four to three because their offense, as has been the case, unfortunately, quite a bit this year, was feast or famine. This is a team that Sean and I have labeled interesting, not necessarily fun to watch, and the interesting stuff continues because we knew yesterday that Fromber had an elbow issue that was going to keep him out of the rotation, and now we he officially goes in that IL. We don't know much more beyond that other than he won't be available for the next couple of weeks. How long will it stress beyond that? That's to be determined. Uh, we had a back and forth about internet doctors trying to diagnose Fromber from afar, but what we know for now is that he won't be around for the next couple of turns in the rotation, and that means guys like Spencer Aragetti, will be pitching for the Astros. Now, he's not, Arrighetti isn't here specifically because of Fromber, but the rotation has been pushed back. Everyone's been pushed back a day, and, and because the Astros are the team of convenience, hey, were you going to pitch today? Ah, hey, you'll pitch on the major league level today. I know, you, I know you had a start scheduled on the minor league level, but and since we don't want to throw you out of your routine and we need you, come on up and pitch on this day. So a much more heralded prospect than Blair Henley Spencer Arrighetti, but he will be the one pitching against the Royals tonight. So interesting. They continue to be good execution, good executors of baseball fundamentals. Not so much runner hitting with runners in scoring position. Not so much unless your name is Jordan Alvarez. If you're anyone, but that particularly last night, not great at it. So what we thought was me, I mean, beyond the, the Fromber news, we thought, Okay, you win a couple games in a row. You're feeling pretty good. You've got Christian Javier on the mound, and it started great, at least for the first three batters, and then it turned into what has been an Astro, the Astro season so far. Excitement and, and then disappointment. So the Astros go down 4-3 to three in Kansas City. And, Sean, are we are we excited to see a new prospect up? Are we are we? optimistic or are we just taking it as it is um I, i'm a little excited i'll, I'll go with li- a little excited to see spencer Arigetti just because 
I mean, he's one of these guys that you just hear about um, a little bit last year, and then he's kind of the talk of spring training. Maybe it's by virtue of the Astros having the 29th or 30th ranked uh, farm system is that anytime there's anyone in the uh, minors who's at least a little bit good, they kind of go, hey, look at this guy, Spencer Hergetti. All right. Joey Loperfito is also getting that same uh, – that same is. love right now, but uh, yeah, I the Astros have a pretty good uh, track record when it comes to pitching uh, prospects coming up and exceeding expectations. Really, Hunter Brown is kind of the the lone exception to that of where he comes up and he's like, eh. oh, ugh. yeah. Uh, there's there's a lot of Frombers and Javier's, and then there's eh, Anoli Perez. Uh, but Anoli Paredes or whatever. I remember that name. Yeah, I do. Um, if you're looking for a scouting report, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But Ari Alexander of KRPC has one on Aragetti. It's I think his latest tweet under his pin tweet. You can find it. But for the most part, he compares him particularly with his fastball to Christian Javier, four seamer with good vertical action. Think Javier, 93 to 94. Then he's got some other things on here. Uh, so, so Christian Javier 2.0, got it. Yeah, yes, which can sometimes be really good and sometimes be, oh, no, it's Christian Javier out there. Uh, can you get us through an inning? Can you get through this inning, please? And that's, that was the experience yesterday where it, it, it felt like, okay, sure, the, the lineup is squandering opportunities, but and Javier's getting himself out of situations. And then at, and then at, then at, at one point, no, he's not. No, He is no longer able to get himself out of these situations. And that's been the Javier we've seen really since June of last year. It, outside of a couple good starts in the playoffs, and then he got destroyed in Game 7 against the Rangers. That Javier we saw last night is kind of the one we've seen throughout where there are there are these moments where you think about, look at this guy. This this can be a, a front-line starter. And then, then there are even just parts of innings where you're like, oh, oh, this isn't good. So the Javier experience continues in just the Astros season overall. Uh no deviation. If if you thought this was a good baseball team, still hold that. Still hold that. But they're not playing like that, and they drop one to the Royals. They'll try to get one back today, and they're going to have to depend on another inexperienced starter. And we're talking about now we're 12 games in, and you have, as people have pointed out, a full rotation, and maybe not the starting five, but a full rotation of guys who are not who who aren't available. And you think about it, where this rotation could be, and 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 Sean talked about the guys who have come up and stepped up, and it's been a thing that have has extended the Astros run. That's that has mitigated the loss of guys like Charlie Morton or Garrett Cole most famously. And then the fact that Lance McCullers is never available. But you think about the guys who aren't who aren't able to pitch for the team right now, who might be your starting rotation, Verlander clearly. You have Fromm Bernal, uh, Urquidy, Luis Garcia, and Lance McCullers. That is a rotation of unavailable pitchers who you would say that's a World Series winning type of rotation. Uh, I mean, that was I saw somewhere that they those five guys made like seventy five percent of the starts for the twenty twenty two World Series yeah. winning Astros team. <laughs> it's like that's literally a World Series It's a World room. Series winning rotation. <laughs> and that includes McCullers who who you can't depend on. Yeah, who probably who probably contributed the least out of that seventy five percent. And certainly he had his moments back in two thousand seventeen. So that's where we're at. And now the discussions will continue about what is what is damaging these pitchers' elbows. For the most part, sometimes it's the shoulder. Is it the legacy of is it the legacy of a certain pitching coach who's no longer here? I know I know that pitching coach, who I will not name currently, is a guy that people love because of what he did during during his time here. But the way the Astros have decided they want their pitchers to pitch, can we point to that for the re, for the unavailability of that of that rotation? I mean, I'm not gonna blame Stromy. But I might just blame the entire organization for the way they've decided to do things. And they're not unique. Baseball as a whole has pushed this. And Verlander, we play sound courtesy of Ari Alexander from Verlander on the previous show. We'll, we'll get to that here as well about the change in philosophy and what it's doing to starting pitching.
and the and the particularly the elbows of those starting pitchers. So that the Astros are certainly feeling it, and they're going to have to hope a foreign system that isn't thought of highly can 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 continue to produce pitchers who can stem the tide until their guys get back. As of yet, Blair Henley, not great, but Spencer Arrogate gets a chance, and he's a much more heralded prospect, so the Astros will go at it again. We'll get to the Rockets on the other side. Ime Adoka said something interesting about his team and, and their like-to-fight mentality. And uh, there's and we have Ross Tucker, former offensive lineman. Well, we don't have him on the show, but we have sound from him. Ross Tucker, former offensive lineman. He is one who, after the trade and the contract changes for Stefan Diggs, questions the Texans and doesn't like the deal as much as he thought he did. So we'll, we'll have that. We'll get into some get into some other stuff as well. We're just starting the show. We'll be back.
This is the Del Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Del Olalea. That promo for the Space Cowboys in 92.5, you might let that pass by and go, eh, I don't want to really, I'm not really going to listen to Space Cowboys baseball. You should because you've seen it. The Astros are, are pulling from that particular roster quite a bit. And we talked about a couple guys, or at least another guy who might be up pretty soon if you consider their first base issues. I asked this question a couple weeks ago now, maybe a week ago, and I asked, do the Astros actually have a major league first baseman? And I think right now the answer is no. Abreu's being pinch hit for, sing- well, Singleton gets to pinch hit, and you kind of shake your head at that at that decision. They don't have a first baseman you can count on or even be, feel slightly good about. So I think they might they might have to dive into Sugarland for for a potential, maybe not a replacement, but just another option because the options currently at first base are atrocious and um, they have they're not getting any better. I don't want to leave Alex Bregman out of not the slander, but look, Javier got out of trouble in the second and then in the fifth, it all blew up on him. But he was going to get out of that inning with just giving up two and leaving with the lead until Bregman airmailed a baseball over aforementioned bad first baseman's head. (laughs) So uh, Bregman can catch some of this, too. He was one for five on the night, and he had a big throwing error that led to the third run that the that the Royals scored. And of course, no more runs were scored until the bottom of the 10th inning where the Royals walked it off and went four to three. So Javier goes five and a third. Probably should have left with a chance to definitely should have left with a chance to win after five and third innings. But, you know, it's baseball and your teammates have a big part to play. And Bregman certainly did his part to at least turn it into a no decision for Christian Javier. He's one who hasn't suffered from an arm issue, thankfully. Thankfully, hopefully that continues. And Dana Brown was asked about Fromber and he talked about how thankful he is that it's only the 15-day DL. He says, don't panic. I don't want anyone to freak out. We had a nice little sit down and put him on the IL. I don't want the group to panic. He's going to be fine and we'll miss a couple starts. Thank God it's only the 15-day IL. So not four to six weeks like was speculated, certainly not a year plus because it's not the TJ. It is simply arm discomfort, couple starts, couple weeks, and he should be fine. Did did Dana Brown actually say don't panic two different times? No, I I oh, I okay. was prefer I was because pre- that would make someone panic. I was <laughs> that's what I was thinking. I, I was, was prefacing thinking, his Dana quote. Brown, stop saying the word panic. I was prefacing his quote, then went into the the full quote when I when I found it. <laughs> okay. No, he did not say don't panic twice because when you tell people not to panic, then they start to panic. Yeah. Well, once I'm like okay. All right. And then you say it again. I'm like okay. You're, now I think I. Should you're panic. really leaning into this. You're really trying to hide something, aren't you? Uh, Dana, no. Thank God it's the 15-day DL. It's simply the one pan- don't panic and okay. the 15-day DL, so we can all feel a little bit better about Fromber, and hopefully after the couple missed starts, he'll be A-OK and back in the rotation. So certainly if we're looking for the high end of positivity when it comes to losing your one of your starters, that is what it is, and hopefully it stays that way um, as the Astros move along. Speaking of a guy who we hope to get back pretty soon, that guy's name is Justin Verlander. And he spoke. He's pitching for the Space Cowboys right now. I believe he's got one more rehab start before he's back with the big club if it all goes well. And really doesn't really matter too much about performance. It only matters if he gets through another start feeling fine. So that's what we're going to hope for. But he was asked quite a bit about the arm injuries in baseball. And this was before the recent news about Fromber. Here's what he had to say. You're kind of an outlier guy that's always thrown hard. There's a guy like Earl Chapman, an outlier guy. You've largely been healthy, so is he. Is there anything that you feel like you or Chapman have done to kind of stay healthy within throwing max effort for so long? Well, I mean, you're also talking to a guy like Tommy John, not not ironically, after the you know, rehab. I know. Well, not not just that. I think, you know, this goes back to how my mentality changes as a pitcher. You know, I, I went from throwing, um, you know, you look back at before, 2015, 16, and I was throwing, you know, 93, 92, 93 early in games. And if I, you know, needed to go to the well and hit 100, I could late in games, but I certainly wasn't throwing 100 every pitch. Uh, the game dictated that I needed to start throwing, try to throw harder almost every pitch. So my average velocity jumped up, um, you know, because my intent jumped up and I had to look for swing and miss. And um, I don't know how long you can do that as a starter. I, 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 
that might have had something to do with it. But um, I think uh, the ability to naturally do it is a, is, a, is a large part of it. I mean, I think you look at in, uh, individuals and um, everybody's built different. You know, you look at Aralis's mechanics versus my mechanics, and they're just vastly different, but can both throw triple digits or used to be able to. For myself, he still can. Um, but it's like, you know, it's like the gait of a horse. Like, you know, like there's some horses that are have been the best in the world at, at their time, and they don't run the same as some of the other best horses uh, after their generation. You know, it's like it's a... Uh, uh, and this is kind of again one of the things that I nitpick a little bit with mechanical tweaks too early on in, in a development process is you got to find your own gate, man. You know, you got to find your own way to throw baseball. And if that naturally leads you to being able to throw hard and have success, great. If not, you eat, you meet an ends road in your career, whatever that want to be, whatever that may be, high school, Division One, minor leagues, Triple A, big leagues. If you meet, meet, reach that end end of the path and you need help, then you then you go help. Then you go find ways to throw harder and make yourself do it because you want to reach that next level but not before justin verlander that was just part of a, a pretty long af after i think it was after the game session he had with the media maybe it was before discussing the biggest issue in baseball right now other than fanatics i mean because <laughs> those that becomes something you can just watch images on on x or twitter but as far as actually affecting the the player's performance at least their arms if you're talking about pitchers the biggest issue is these arm injuries that apparently no one has an answer for because it's it's far more complicated than simply pitch clock, despite what the MLBPA would want you to believe. There are so many different reasons, and Verlander went into it in in the longer version of, of the clip we just played, and I think he's right. Like Sometimes the stress of asking a, a person to do something that's relatively unnatural, and that's why it's so specialized. That's why these guys get a lot of money. Because it's not a natural thing to throw a baseball that hard that often over the course of how many years. And that's why they, that's what the money is for, as Don Draper would say. You get paid that type of money because you can do that. And sometimes it leads to things like Tommy John's and elbow discomfort, which is what we're getting from Framper Valdez. So he got the elbow discomfort, as Justin Verlander mentioned. He had a Tommy John surgery. And we have Lance McCullers, who avoided it last time, last year but does have one on his on his docket as well. So going forward, it might be just a thing. Until there is a, diff a change in the way pitchers are told to pitch, this probably will be a thing because the unless elbows get stronger, unless we develop bionic elbows, I think pitchers are going to have a problem. This, this is what they should be doing instead of building robot dogs. Like, instead of teaching robot dogs how to fetch and do other things that scare the hell out of us because at some point those robot dogs will will just murder us. Build bionic elbows, something. Yeah, at least a UCL. A U, yeah, a UCL. Maybe not the whole elbow. We that got... might freak someone out. But build a stronger, by tougher, more hardy bionic elbow or UCL. Yeah, we get we got the rest of the you know arm kind kind of settled. We got we got it to a pretty good spot. It's just. It's just the elbow that we need a little, little bit of help with. Let's do this for all the sports. What's the, the most devastating injury currently in football beyond head injuries? Oh, well. Is it the is it the ACL or the Achilles? What would you I'll what say would the you Achilles put? is worse. We, yes. Okay, we'll go with the Achilles. We need something for the Achilles, the AC, uh the UCL in baseball and basketball Probably devastating also injuries. The Achilles. True. I mean, Giannis yeah, barely avoid, avoided one apparently yesterday. Yeah. He limped off the court, and people were like, "Oh no, not not the Achilles." It turns out the Achilles is intact. He's got a calf thing, and he 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 will be back when when they determine that full strength comes back, and it'll he'll probably be back be, for, for the playoffs. He'll yeah. sit out the rest of the season, and he'll, and he'll be back for the playoffs. The Bucks trying to get the number two seed. They have a second night of a back-to-back -back tonight against the Orlando Magic, who were here in town and took one on the chin for the Rockets. The Rockets dominated that game. That's the transition. That's what we do here, Sean. Whoa. We make the transition. Um, the Rockets had a had a, had a good, good outing. This was a team who had lost five in a row. They got on the Magic early and didn't let them up. And it, the Magic struggled to score, but they are a good defensive team. The Rockets didn't seem to be bothered too much. You look at that. You think about that Magic front line. Uh, yeah, Paolo, Franz Wag Wagner, his brother less so, but Mor Moritz is there too. And then you have um, Jonathan Isaacs. They, they're long; they get after you defensively. But the Rockets found a way to score, and 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 score not at will because no one does that. But 
they didn't they didn't have the issues that other teams have had facing the Magic, and their defense was good and, and held the Magic down. And as I said, the Magic don't play that well offensively anyway. So uh, it was a good night for the Rockets. I can't whisper into a microphone because even if you do, people are going to hear it anyway. But the Jalen Green renaissance seems to be over. The month of March where we were deciding, is this guy's a, is he a max player? Can he Is he a real number one? He has regressed back into the Jalen Green we are, we're familiar with. You look at some of the numbers in April, not good. Like the month of March, he was one of the best players in the world. In April, shooting under 28% from the from three. Shooting from the floor, not much better. He's the guy we all remember. And it's only like it started at the last game of March. It was the game against Dallas where he struggled. And maybe he since the end was near as far as, far as their playing chances. And that's been the catalyst for this. Or, or he's just in a cold streak. But if we're talking about potential... Max deals in the future and how much you're going to give a player. And you thought the month of March was something that you could ca- count on. At least the first couple games of April say, no, March was the outlier. All, the rest of the season, that's the Jalen Green that you should that you should focus on. The one where he's inefficient and the team's not winning. Although they did get the win last night. Just saying. He, it was an extended run of being really, really good at the game of basketball, and you credit him for that, but it's one month out of a long season, and the long season suggests you're not that guy, pal. You're but, not that guy. But Fred Van Vliet in April. <laughs> Spectacular. At least last night he is was. This, is this who he is? It took uh, until he turned 30 or whatever, 31, however old he is. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think last night is the Fred Van Vliet we can expect. But they're paying him like it is, so it doesn't matter at this point. You just have to hope you get more nights like that because he's getting the money that would say you need to be a superstar. Hey, you take a you take a you take advantage of a desperate team who needed some stability, and Fred Van Fleet saw that in the Rockets, and and who who doesn't like living in Houston? So he took that as well and made himself a lot of money. So credit to him for finessing the game. Uh, the Jalen Green finesse might be over. I'm just saying, everyone, just take a look at April currently. And then the rest of the season, and then compare it to March and see which one you think he really is. The one that's been kind of subpar for two and a half plus years, or the one you saw in March? Just go to basketball reference. Look uh, at those game logs. Split it by month. Yep. You can do the like averages per month. ESPN does that for you. It's pretty easy. Just go to the stats column for Jalen Green, and it'll, sh- it'll show you what he's been like in every month this year. And if you look at April, shooting under 40% from the floor, 25% from three, and the the points per game are down to 19. And then you compare it to March, he was up around 28 points per game, shooting almost 50% from the floor and over 40% from three. And just start scrolling, and you'll see the months. There are far more months that remind you of April than of March. So going forward, that'll be something the Rockets have to decide on. What is real, what isn't. Maybe it's maybe just worn down from all the minutes he played, and that could be an excuse, but I have the other two years as backup if I feel the other way. Um, hey, make your opinions any way you'd like. Form those opinions, but there are stats that you that can help you form those opinions. Enough about Jalen Green. I don't, I don't want to crush him. Just to let you know that maybe the month of March was an outlier. We got other things to get to. We'll get to Ross Tucker. He mentioned why he doesn't like the Stefan Diggs deal as its current form is now out there. We know the Texans have given money up front to Stephon Diggs and cut the back portions of that contract, and it's made Ross Tucker a little uncomfortable. We'll talk about that when we come back.
You're listening to the Dell Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Vertex Community Bank Studios, here's Dell Olalea. I don't mind it, um, you know, it's, it's better than the alternative, which is, you know, kind of laying down and getting ran over. And so, um, you know, we've had quite a few lately. I think it took guys, you know, half a season or so to really uh, get that identity and not respecting your opponent too much. And um, like I said, when guys have had some of the losing they have over the last few years, we're trying to instill a little more fight, a little more aggressiveness, and um, bring in veterans and a certain coach that loves that stuff and it's going to rub off on them. So, um, you know, I don't mind it all. It's got to be a little smarter, though. The, you know, the cam one is a tough one. That's probably, uh, you know, just the fact that they got the double technical right before you have to be smarter there. But I don't know if that warrants another technical injection. It's just a problem. Ime Adoka talking about what happened last night's game. Oddly enough, the Rockets got t- got hit with technicals because of their chippiness. That's who they are. That's who they want to be. You heard him talk about instilling that in this team, and that is built over the course of the season, and, and you saw it quite a bit during their strong month of March, and it's, it's still going on in April. We've had Amen Thompson thrown out of a game, and I don't think that's going to be something that goes away. There is a balance, certainly. And when you become a better team and the games mean a whole lot more, you're going to have to figure out ways not to give away points and not have guys thrown out. But at this point, when you're trying to set a standard, I, I don't mind it at all. If the games get more important, then, then you figure out a way to balance that and make sure that aggression doesn't hurt you in the long end. But the Rockets are like the likes to fight guy, and that's fine for now. Yeah, uh, I mean, for what – for I, and Ime kind of alluded to this, or he said it, that it took – you know, half the season really to instill that identity, which makes sense. You can't just like at the flip of, sw- of a switch be like, you know what? Now I'm a tough guy. Yeah. It, like it, you, it does. It does take a while to actually, you know, change change your ways in that way. To you know what? I'm not getting pushed around anymore. Um, and so yeah, I think uh, it, since they're kind of learning that, it's okay if. It's on the too aggressive side, and then scale it back. You'd yeah, you, rather have that than you to, don't want to be docile. You don't yeah, want to get pushed around. Yeah, than to having to keep pushing them forward. It's like no, just go to ten, and then we can dial it back. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's also like literally they're already eliminated from postseason contention, so it's not like it, hey, this, you're costing your team. It's yeah, like, if someone like, tries you. Yeah, don't even, let them. Well, it's not going to cost you anything right now. Even if it is. Which was very funny for Cam Whitmore, the funniest, probably the funniest person in the league for Cam Whitmore to get into like a chest bumping. I'm not moving out of the way. No, I'm not moving out of the way. Match with, uh, it was with uh, Joe Ingles of the oh. Orlando Magic. <laughs> yeah, of all people, so, that, Cam, Cam just Whit- a funny visual of him getting into it with a like PE teacher. Yeah, Cam Whitmore has had a back and forth with Devin Booker. So he, so certainly different levels to this. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter who. Just don't step to Cam, or, or he'll have words for you. Yeah, and, and at least stand his ground. And the Rockets, that's that's part of their DNA. That's part of their personality, and it's good to see. And then going forward, we'll see who who is is one to to be able to mo- moderate that and figure out. You know what? This is a, this is a very important stretch of the game. I can't leave it. And then who who are the types who are going to be like, nah, it's, it can be. We can do this at any point at any time, yeah. and we'll see what you're about. I think Dylan Brooks is <laughs> the second part of that. <laughs> he will be one of those types where he'll get thrown that at any point and say, look, uh, you're not going to try me. And But this is, this is a team you can't call soft, and that's great because you can look at them last last couple of years. I don't know if they were even soft. They weren't competing for anything. They weren't trying. Yeah, they, um, were they, weren't, they were just bad. <laughs> so I don't won't call them soft. They were just bad. Now they're Now they're okay and tough. Basketball tough. They're, they're, it's relative. It's which basketball means, tough. Which means pushing and yelling at Joe Ingles. Or knocking down Maxi Cleaver. <laughs> maybe maybe they're going to bully foreigners. Maybe that's yeah, what, what they're going to they do. They have the, um, the Draymond Green, uh, you know, that wasn't that the – that's what Gilbert Arenas said. Yes. Gilbert, Gilbert Arenas was like – He doesn't Draymond try American-born players. <laughs> if you notice, he always goes after uh, European players. Yeah. Uh, there's a thing about Anthony Davis who gets dominated by Euros. 
Like really? Sabonis has great games against them. Oh yeah, I know. So Sabonis has literally never lost. Yeah, to he dominates Anthony, Anthony Davis, and you know Jokic uh, beat him in the uh, in the in the conference finals. Yeah. So wow. there's there's that thing that Anthony Davis, for whatever reason, when, once he sees a European big man, it's over for him. But you know what, Cam Whitmore, not gonna allow it. Even though Joe Ingles isn't European, yeah, he's still. Australian, close enough, I guess. In this in this hard non-American guy. white guys, non-American white guys. Can catch one from at, the, from at the any Houston point. Rockets. Amen Thompson has something for you, and so does Cam Whitmore. You know, who? I have something for you too. It ain't a fight. It's a chance to see a sport that's probably the exact opposite of this conversation. The Chevron Championship is in town. You've heard John talk about it. We're giving away tickets throughout the day and tomorrow as well on all the shows. But you got a chance to go to the to the Saturday session. It's the Chevron Championship here in Houston, April 27th through the 21st at the club at Carlton Woods in the Woodlands. The Chevron Championship is one of five major championships on the Ladies Professional Golf Association Tour. This week's event features some of the world's most, well, next week's event, features some of the world's most talented female athletes competing in the tour's first major of the season. Tickets are available now at thechevronchampionship.com. We're giving away a pair of tickets right now. Well, let's go 1050. 1050. Caller number four at 1050 wins a pair of tickets to the Chevron Championship. You've heard John talk about it. If you have a young daughter who loves to golf, take her out there. And if you just love golf yourself, go out there. I mean, sure, you you might you might watch the guys, but you guys don't play like them. We know who you are. Go out there and watch. Go out there and watch Championship Golf at the Chevron Championship at the Woodlands at the Carlton Woods, the club at Carlton Woods. Excuse me. Once again, caller four. At 1050, wins a pair of tickets to that tournament, and we're going to be giving away tickets throughout the day on the station. Just tune in. You get If you don't win right now, you will have a chance to win later and tomorrow as well. We're going to be doing that throughout uh, the Chevron Championship at Carlton Woods. We've got – we didn't get to the Ross Tucker thing. We will get to that when we come back. Ross Tucker talking about the Stefan Dix trade and his – maybe not dis- distaste for it, but – he thinks cutting that deal short and giving Stefan Diggs money up front makes the deal a little less valuable for the Texas Texans. We'll hear his comments and we'll discuss it when we come back.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's the Dell Olalea Show. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Dell Olalea. Welcome back. Sean <laughs> just gave me some information. The TV isn't on in here, so he's he has the TV on in his room, and he looked up, and we will get to the Ross Tucker thing, but he looked up and saw Mad Dog Russo being on one. Apparently, Texas has, what, the fourth best job in the country? Yes, yeah, so Mad Dog for basketball. is giving his A-list for most attractive men's college basketball head coaching jobs. He has Gonzaga fifth, Texas fourth, Texas. Third is UConn, back-to-back champions. Okay. Number two is Kansas. I get that. And number one is UNC. So Duke doesn't make the no, top worst five. job than Texas. Gonzaga is a Gonzaga. better job than Duke? I know you're fought. You're fought you'd be fought. Well, in this case, you're falling Shire now as opposed to Krzyzewski. But how? How is that possible? They made the Elite Eight this year. Yeah. yeah. How is Gonzaga, Gonzaga better? Get Look, they've. Mark Fee's done a great job, Dan Monson before him. Done a great job of getting guys up there. They pr- produce NBA players. But the dream, no one dreams of coaching at Gonzaga. What's he talking about? I, I have n- no idea. I, it, UCLA is also not on this list. Kentucky is not on this list, which I imagine is the reason that he's making this list. And speaking of Kentucky, only in college sports can a headline be the likes of the chicken billionaire got John Calipari to Arkansas. The chicken billionaire is the grandson of the grand yeah, the grandson of the founder of Tyson Foods. So Big Chicken got John Calipari to Arkansas. Yeah. Tyson greater than KFC. Yeah, Louisville's in that. Yeah, Louisville is uh at least their KFC's oh, yeah. all over Young Louisville. Center. Yeah, it's all over the Louisville campus. Um, so, so, and, and then you have, uh, the Papa John's guy. Do they still have his name on, or the no, pop, is it Papa I, John's I field think, or whatever? I think they took his name off the, uh, <laughs> John Sh- what's, Shat- Shatner, Sh- Sh- no. something like Schiller. I don't know what his name is. The, the Papa John's Schneider? guy. Yeah. If, oh. And if you are, if you want those tickets to the Chevron championship, call in now, uh, line should be open for you to go see the women, the women play in their first major. And it's in Houston where we, we do golf big here so if you want to see that that's in the woodlands but houston adjacent so if you want to see uh the best women in the world play for a championship uh, you can call in and get those tickets right now sean will take care of you there yep but if you don't know john calipari is still in the middle finalizing a deal to become the arkansas head coach it is it isn't final yet he did say his goodbyes to kentucky fans and it's all the things you would expect thanking them and hopes Hopes they love what he did. They're all, all the things that that are normal for those type of goodbyes. They normally don't come on. I don't know many coaches who do it on social media, but Calipari's got a big enough platform that he could do it. So he 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 wished uh, the Kentucky fan base well. Wearing his Kentucky blue hadn't changed over to Arkansas red yet. But according to Pete Thamel and Jeff Borzello, a couple of uh, big time college basketball writers and reporters. Calipari has long-standing ties with John H. Tyson. He's an Arkansas benefactor and the chairman of Tyson Foods, and that connection is going to get John Calipari to Arkansas. Arkansas is a school f- that is in on the NIL game. They want to spend money. We kind of think of them as, uh, I won't say a little brother type, but they aren't. They haven't been looked at as one of the major players in college sports despite what Eric Musselman has done there, Arkansas is one of, not an also ran, but as we were talking about blue bloods or the greatest jobs in the country, according to mad dog, they're not considered one of those. So it was a surprise that Calipari would go there, but if you look at the success they've had, they've been more successful than Kentucky in the tournament. Eric Musselman's done a great job. We talked about how he wound up at, how he wound up at, at USC. It all started with SMU losing their coach and them hiring, Andy Enfield from USC, and the dom- the dominoes kept coming until we wind up with John Calipari, I don't know, hours away from being a, the official Arkansas head coach, and he'll do fine there. Arkansas will recruit better. They'll, they produce some NBA players, but they'll get a different level of player because that's what Calipari does. He, he does that at every stop. I just look at it as a guy who was like, you know what? They're going to fire me here if I don't produce – in my next year at Kentucky. So let me get out of here. 
Let me get out of here before they fire me. I'll take getting fired by the Celtics. I get that. Or was it the Nets? Patino was Nets. the Celtics. He was the Nets. He was the Nets. I'll take getting fired from the Nets. But not Kentucky. I, I'm going to leave before they fire me. And, and he he's going to get paid. I, although he's going to get paid less. I saw that report. That he's not going to get paid as much as he would at Kentucky. But he found a, he found a trap door, opened it, and willingly jumped through it. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it would be... It'd be crazy if he got paid more. Well, he's got he's got big chicken behind him. Yeah, there's only so much big chicken can do though. What? Tyson is a is a brand. You don't think Tyson could match a salary that Kentucky was paying him? They can. They, they just. Can. <laughs> he's not gonna work making Dino Nuggets. He's gonna <laughs> he's gonna work the, he's gonna work at the at the basketball. I'll give you the salary. He's gonna work at. Nine million a year. Okay, he is officially named as a coach, um, so it's not hours away. That is now official, and the salary is seven million per year. He was oh. making eight and a half at Kentucky. He's he will make seven as the deal was announced today. It includes a one million dollar signing bonus and a five hundred thousand dollar retention bonus each year of the contract. So he'll get he'll get a bonus every time as long as he continues to wow. be the coach at Arkansas. That gets five hundred grand every time he just doesn't get fired. Exactly. Or Take Doesn't another job take in another the same job, conference yeah. that's lower than the one he's currently at. Sure. So he's got automatic rollover years for the for NCAA tournament appearances that would extend the deal to twenty thirty one. There are two automatic, ro- so it doesn't happen all the time. But he'll get a couple if when he makes a tournament, which he should. Arkansas is a program that didn't have a great year this year, but is a program that has seen recent success. So as long as Big Chicken likes you, you can go. You can go be the coach at Arkansas, and that's what John Calipari is going to do. Man. Ah, I'm taking a pay cut, seven mil. That's my look. He took a million dollar pay cut, like it's eight and a, one and a half million dollars. One and a half million dollar pay cut. Like, yes, come on. I mean, he was about to get fired. He was about to have a miserable life for twelve he, months and true. then get fired. The pressure was on for him to win, and then if he didn't win, he was going to get fired. And instead, he gets to go to a place who loves him automatically. Because I can't believe John Calipari chose us. He chose us. So they're all going to love him. The first recruiting class, they're going to be like, oh, my God. <laughs> Look yeah. at all these guys. Yeah, he, Where Kentucky is like, cool. We've seen it before. Cool. And, and, and the thing is, like, Cal Perry, sweet, you're going to brag about these guys getting $300 million NBA contracts when they— When, when they we, can't get out of the Sweet 16. Yeah, we lose them the Sweet 16 we're losing, every year. We're losing sweet. to Oakland. Sweet. Can't and, wait for that. Yeah, the problem for Cal Perry and Kentucky is, oh, this guy's a five-star? Is he Anthony Davis? Is he? Is he John Wall? Oh, okay. Then who cares w- yeah. about your five star? Or are, are there five of them? Like, uh, like Carl Towns, uh, Devin Booker. Yeah. <laughs> the Harrison twins. Is he a Tyrese Maxey? Hell, is he even Tyler Hero? Look at all the first round picks. Oh, okay. Yeah. You got another five star. Jamal whatever. Murray. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Aaron Fox. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. Uh. Bring all the five star you want. Uh, we've seen it. We've seen it. How about win a, win a championship more than once every 12 years? Get to the second weekend. How about that? <laughs> Before you start touting your, your prowess of getting guys drafted. That's good for them. But when they're in Kentucky Blue, we're watching them lose. I, I do think that there are – and that's why I think Kentucky, though, or, or Arkansas will be fine with it. There, There's, like, only, I don't know, 10 teams, 12 teams, where the – look at all the guys that we got drafted. Hey, we get you to the NBA here at this university. I all but twelve schools in college basketball are probably like, yeah, awesome, yeah, I'll take that. When maybe maybe we win a championship with one of these guys, and you know they go on and when they're in the NBA, they they rep uh they rep our school. But like Kentucky is like a one of those blue blood programs where they're like, mm, actually, we'd rather just win. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't care if you guys ever got drafted. Yeah. As long as you won titles. I mean, win with a whole bunch of Rex Rex Chapman. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As long as we're going to win a lot Reed of games. Shepherds. It's, it is a sad state of your fan base when you're leaning into we're NFL, you or NBA or yes. we're the place where you get drafted. Yeah. But how's the team doing? <laughs> yeah. You went seven and five this year. So what if you had yeah. four draft picks? You got you had a couple first rounders. What was your record? Eight and four. Ah, well, maybe you got the wrong coach. So. Yeah. Cal football, congrats! Congrats on, <laughs> congrats on Aaron Rodgers and Jared Goff. Look at all the first round quarterbacks you you produce. Great, Sean Lynch, Great. Deshaun Jackson. Great for your program. How many games did you win in those years? Mm. Not enough. So, if you are part of a fan base who leans into how many players you get drafted, 
and you and there you know there, those accounts are out there where they go where they go tied in the NFL, which is fine. Alabama wins games on the college level, but you know they keep track of what their college players are doing. If that's the most important part and the the most joyous part of your of your fandom. Uh, you're in a bad state of affairs. I, I would just say unless you're Georgia or Alabama. This is what I'm saying, right? yes. <laughs> Georgia, Alabama, and Ohio State. Those, those pro- are the only three that Those can be programs like- win all the time, so they can lean into, hey, look, we got this many guys drafted in the first round. It just speaks to the level of, of success you're having. But, you know, some accounts will keep track of touchdowns scored by their pro players. And, we, oh, look, this is one Alabama player. In this case, they're it's great. One Alabama player throwing it to another Alabama player for a touchdown. That's cool because those guys were great on the college level. You guys won a lot of games, but you know if you if if you're at a I don't want to reach Texas because they were good this year, but if you're at A and M and you're like, oh look, Devon A. Chan, look how great he's been. You know how many games did Devon A. Chan hey, win? Mike Evans, dude. <laughs> that's the best part. They can't keep talking about Mike Evans. That's, no, that's the best part with all these where they like they use and not specifically Mike Evans, although I'm sure A and M uses Mike Evans whenever they're recruiting a wide receiver. It's that they go back. Like dec- a decade ago. How many like, coaches ago was that? Yeah, three different coaches. God knows how many offensive coordinators yeah. ago. And they're like, listen, we get you ready for the league. <laughs> Here's a- Mike Evans. Yeah, they, yeah, you know, at those facilities, all of them have the number of guys that are in the NFL. Like Mike Elko is going to, in his recruit, recruiting pitches, and he was at AM, so he can, I guess, use some of it. Look at all the guys we get to the NFL. Yeah, you can't use that win, buddy. You can't that that one you can't use. It, it's it's the guys from a long time ago that yeah, like we said, the they're they were the kids you're recruiting were like seven years old when they're on campus, and then there's the guys who would have like Jadavion Clowney and like South Carolina can be like we molded Jadavion Clowney into an NFL player. It's like no, yes, I no. think he would have figured it out. Yeah, the, there are some t- there are some guys who doesn't matter where they go. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You know what? I think if he went to Alabama. Things wouldn't have gone that different. And what I might have gone better. Um, <laughs> what we've noticed, what I've noticed in this conversation, is two guys who who root for who root for schools who have had to lean on producing NFL prospects because their schools didn't win a lot of games. At least Texas before this year, that changed. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, it speaks for yourself, yeah, buddy. Yeah. Hey, I'm not in that category <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I left you. I left you what, six months ago. Yeah. How dare you? <laughs> we're, we're we are not the same. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, he's right. Uh, Texas is no longer in there, and they should be really, really good uh, again, as long as. Joy hanging out with Nebraska, buddy. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> no, nah, it's probably more A&M. I'm, pro- I'm probably in the A&M category, which ain't a great one. Hey, you, you, you guys just uh, you beat them last year, right? Or yeah, like, two years ago? Yeah, it's better than losing the Middle Tennessee State, which happened the year before. That's the state of the program, by the way. <laughs> Where we're celebrating wins over teams who – weren't good the rest of the way. But hey, it was our biggest win of the year. How did that team do the rest of the way? Why you got to bring up that? Got their coach fired. <laughs> Partly. We'll ta- I guess we'll take it. Although I-, I wish it was the other way around. <laughs> but I still got a couple more years of that potential disaster. Maybe more. That's what happens when maybe it's not big chicken behind Mario Cristobal, but it is his high school buddies paying for his salary. So that means you're locked in. We'll continue to talk about college football in a more generic way going forward. This is just me um, talking about my misery as far as my favorite program. And you can do that, too. If, you, if you're if you miserable about your college football program, call in, 713-780-3776. You can also tweet at the show, at Sean A. Mapes and at Del V2. And remember, if you didn't win tickets for the Chevron Championship, we're going to be giving away tickets all throughout the day and tomorrow as well, so stay tuned for that. We're through with Hour 1. We'll be back.
Hour two begins, and we will actually get to the Ross Tucker sound here. Ross Tucker, former NFL offensive lineman, now an analyst, and a, and he just comments on the game. He's got his own podcast, which doesn't say much because everyone does, but the Ross Tucker podcast is where you can find this particular audio. Stefan Diggs, big part of this NFL offseason so far, traded to the Texans. The Texans now have a big-time wide receiver core. People think a lot of what this team can be. And it's been a lot of positivity regarding the move. People love a transaction. People like trades more than sometimes the actual games being played. They love to talk about front offices as if they have the hope of being a general. No one grows up wanting to be a general manager. I've, I've never heard that as a dream. But when you get older, you love to pretend to be one. So a lot of people thrilled with that as my phone's going off. But one guy who isn't thrilled with the the particulars of the after trade negotiations with the with D- between Diggs and the Texans is Ross Tucker. He talks about it here. Uh, doesn't like cutting off the deals, cutting off the end of the deal for the Texans, and speaks to giving up a second round pick for it. You know, I don't like the trade for Stephon Diggs as much for the Houston Texans after this contract adjustment. First of all, you trade a second round pick for only one year of Diggs services. You can't get a comp pick because you shorten the contract and you give him a $3.5 million raise for that same one year that you didn't even have to do. They say they're doing it because they want him to be supremely motivated, I believe, to perform very well. What about the opposite? What if Nico Collins is getting the ball a lot? What if they're giving the ball to Tank Dell a lot? I feel like this could really go either way with Stephon Diggs in Houston, and a second-round pick for one year, it's a little bit much. That's kind of the, if you took issue with with the trade, and there is some room to kind of push back on that, particularly because they did get a couple third-day picks, and people who have placed a value on that say they really gave up more of a slate second, early third, if we're incorporating what they got back from the Bills. But I think his point is reasonable. You're giving up a day to pick a valuable one because you know it's the Vikings pick so the Vikings might not be good in 2024 so that could be a pick that's pretty high up in the second round and you're giving away that pick for play for a player who you may only have for one year who you've set yourself up for only having for one year particularly if he had let's say he has a great year and the price tag just is too high you you're not willing to pay and you're taking that bet. If he has a great year, that means you're probably going to have a good team. But that's not that's not a given. You could be a an explosive offensive team, and he could have a great year, and you don't win the number of games you, you you thought you would because the schedule's tougher. And maybe you have digs for a year. You make it to the divisional round again. You happen to see the Chiefs, and you and you go down. Or maybe you see Baltimore. Maybe you haven't done enough to close what is or was at least a large gap between the two teams. You're out in the you're out in the divisional round, the same spot you are. You were you were eliminated in 2023, 2024, and now Diggs is on the open market, and you gave up a second round pick. That's that's the gamble they're taking. The all in stuff is great before the results, so you can comfort yourself with, hey, we've got Stefan Diggs, and I'm not I'm not talking down on that. I just think it's uh, I think the Texans were smart not to give him a long a ripping up his deal and giving him an extension at the money he might want but you may be in a position position where you're paying more or you're being asked to pay more to retain him than you're willing to go with and it might be more than the salary would have been otherwise because remember this deal the one they got out of they could cut him after after 2024 in fact after every season in the deal and it wouldn't cost it wouldn't hit them with dead cap money so they it was more it was there were one year deals where they held control, but of course you're playing the the people and and the emotional route where you hope giving him upfront money, letting him be a free agent, makes him the best citizen possible. Yeah, there there's a case to be made that him being on his previous contract, like before they ripped it up, would would have been actually more detrimental <laughs> certainly <laughs> because Diggs would have been playing for a new contract in which he had three years left of yeah. and and three kind of fake years left of because like you said they could cut it was it's 
basically what the Rockets signed Jock Landale to. Yeah, it's actually it's actually the it's the, a very the deal basketball that, team option, team option but for like year. three years as opposed to just one. It's a team option that's what over a and over again. Gets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Diggs is probably I don't know top fifteen receiver in the NFL. And after so. he might have been okay with that deal with the Bills, where he had where he has had great success, he probably wouldn't have been okay being. Big, who knows? I, uh, I I mean, he should have fired his agent the second they signed that contract. Yeah. Wait, me? I, I can get cut after every year and just nothing happens? Yeah. Uh, it's, I, it's a product of if we've heard about him wanting to win. So if he wanted to win in Buffalo, maybe that was one of the concessions he made that, hey, we're going to we're gonna win. I'm, I'm going to be really good, so they're never going to want to cut me. That's a man who doesn't know himself very well. <laughs> if that's what he thought. Because your attitude – to be fair, they didn't cut him. Where they traded him, they got rid of him. Uh, where is on where is on people, and the hope is the Texans at least they believe they protected themselves from that eventual scenario. Uh, but I I think there are sides to both. But I understand Ross Tucker's point. If you really like Stephon Diggs and you you're, you're giving up a second round pick for him, and then he's great, then you have then you have to renegotiate, and it ain't going to be an easy renegotiation. He's going to hold you over the fire and ring you for everything you're worth. Or everything you have, and that might not that might not be a number you want to reach. Uh, Julian, you called in, and you want to talk about Diggs, Trade, and Shogun. Shogun, great episode on Monday. So, Julian, I want to stay on the clock. Had some trouble doing that the last couple of days. So, we'll get to you on the other side. Just hang on. We'll get to your your thoughts on Diggs. Anyone else wants to get in, you can call. Certainly, we'll want to hear from you as well. Uh, but first, I want to talk about my bookie. The college basketball season is over. There are no more there are no more tournament games to bet on, but. Sports isn't over. We've got the NHL. We've got the NBA. Hell, we got Champions League. A great couple of matches yesterday. If you want to bet on Champions League, PSG, uh, you can see him. Maybe maybe you got a line on how many goals Mbappe is going to score or the lack of goals. Uh, you can you can bet on my bookie for that. Just go to mybookie.ag. That's the website. Take your viewing experience to the next level with real time live betting that lets you stream and bet the games right from that website. And if you sign up now and take advantage of a generous welcome bonus on your first deposit, which can go all the way up to $1,000, sign up, take advantage of that welcome bonus. If you put in 200, you get 300 ready to play instantly using promo code BET975. And of course, the fun doesn't stop there. You'll get up to the minute odds, props, and this week's expert predictions to help you decide who to put your money on. And the best part about my book is this. You can bet on anything anytime from anywhere you can be mobile you can, you can be at home you can be on the road my bookie in that website mybookie.ag will take care of you mybookie.ag use promo code bet975 to secure your welcome bonus today only with my bookie
It's the Del Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to the Veritex Community Bank Studios with Del Olalea and his intrepid, most outstanding, arguably the greatest producer of all time, the one and only Sean Mapes. Arguably, Don Staley would say he's one of the GOATs. Just to be diplomatic, one of the GOATs. That's Michael Carroll. He'll join us on Fridays to keep you updated on what you should and shouldn't be watching, which is perfect timing because Julian is here. But I mentioned Champions League during the My Bookie spot, and I did that on purpose because, obviously, that's going on right now, one of the bigger sporting events in the world. But it's just to say we are open to all. Like some, you know, regular sports shows, it's like, well, baseball, basketball, college football sometimes when the season's going on, it, and certainly um, the NFL. If you have a – Something else you want to discuss? That's why Julian comes in and talks about Shogun. Call in. If you listen to the show, we'll, we we'll, we are willing to talk about anything for the most part. Even if you have, even if you want odds on the next Hollywood actress to go on OnlyFans, we do that here too. Uh, so, so if you want to talk about Champions League, great couple of matches yesterday. Call in. We're open to all. But Julian wants to discuss the Dix trade and some Shogun. What's up, Julian? Good morning, good morning. So, the Diggs trade. Now, while I understand it might end up being a high second, which pretty much is a late first, um, I think the fact that he will be able to teach Nico and Tank, not that they're, like, so horrible, but, like, the the nuances of routes and little things that, because let's face it, man, Diggs is one of the, what, top three or four maybe top two route runners in the league with Devontae. And uh, I think once Tank learns how, you know, these little nuances, it benefits them. Also, why would you want to be paying Diggs all that money later in his in his uh, career anyways? Let's face it. The dude is a baby back. Like, you can finish that, that term. You know what I'm talking about. Um, he, <laughs> he, had, he led the league in targets. He was uh, 100-plus catches. 1,500-plus yards, eight touchdowns. They went to the AFC Championship, and he still cried. Like, <laughs> the whole I want to win thing, yeah, y'all were winning, and you were still crying. All right, now to switch it up. Shogun, you want to wait a day so it can be 48 hours? I mean, I'm not tripping on that at all. Well, the show comes out Monday night, so, yeah, yeah, I guess. You're, you want to call in tomorrow and talk about Shogun. I've watched it. Um, but sure, we'll do the 48 hour model. We'll call him. We'll talk about it. Um, a, a great into that episode, a, a crazy into the episode. Uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, but to your digs thing, well, the, the deal with the trade or the trade and the contract was the Texans could, could get out of that deal after every year and it wouldn't cost him anything as far as dead cap. So that was the advantage of keeping him on his current deal. Now, of course, he might be upset that, that he's on that type of deal, but that's what they had. As, exactly. as a potential um, – something to save them from a potential Diggs blow-up, that they can get rid of him at any point and not cost him anything. But I do understand he he could be a problem if he's not happy. And Diggs, the mentor, is something I haven't heard from people, but the question, is he someone who wants to do that? Is he a guy who's going to come in and teach a couple of guys? Now he's already training with Tank and CJ Stroud, so that's a, good, that's a good first step. But is he a guy who's going to be a mentor? I don't know. I'm not saying you're wrong. I just don't know because he's never had to really be that guy before. He's he's just barely over 30. So uh, it's not a bad thought. Uh, I, I don't uh, disagree particularly how the Texans did it. Uh, but, you know, uh, someone always has a differing opinion, differing, a different opinion. And if we're talking about a high second round pick and he doesn't do well because we have a call from Travis who doesn't think he'll do particularly well, uh, then the Texans may re- be reg- regretting uh, that trade for the second rounder particularly. Um when you're going all in and the second round pick is a valuable resource when you have to at some point replenish your your coffers when when CJ Stroud is going to be very expensive at some point so you're going to want cheaper labor but the CJ Stroud thing is a, like years down the line uh, but it's something to think about Julian I appreciate it we'll talk about Shogun tomorrow and I appreciate your ability to hold off and drop the 48 48, 48 hour rule uh, he's uh, thinking about you guys if you like Shogun and haven't watched it. Uh, thanks, Julian. Talk to you tomorrow. No, no problem. Y'all have a good one. You too, man. You too. Uh, Travis doesn't think Diggs is going to do as well as some people think. What's up, Travis? Hey, guys. 
Yeah, man. I mean, just because you got digs doesn't mean uh, uh, Stroud's going to say, hey, sorry, Colin. Sorry, Dell. I can't throw it to you as much, man. He's got a great rapport with Schultz, Colin, Dell. We got Mixon that catches out of the backfield. I, hey, Diggs, I hope he has 1,000 yards. But if it's going to be uh, under 1,000, it's going to be this year, I think. I don't. But I hope he does well, man. Yeah, I'm with you on hope he does well. I don't actually disagree with you. Uh, the thought that he's going to step in and be the number one is, I think, maybe a, an assumption you shouldn't make. At least some people shouldn't make. You think about what CJ has in Tank. We know those guys are close. We know once Tank is healthy, he's going to get a share. Nico, Nico's a guy who has who is apparently going to go into a prove it year, so you know he's going to want his. And you got Dolphin Schultz. You mentioned all the weapons. The the assumption that that a new receiver, though a talented and veteran, is going to step in and be the guy. Uh, I think is one where you have to you have to kind of push, you kind of hold off on that. We'll see how it plays out. And if CJ is more of a distributor type, where he's going to get the ball to everyone, that's going to be a departure from what Stephon Diggs had to deal with. His best second receiver in Buffalo at any point was like Gabe Davis and maybe Cole Beasley earlier in his tenure there. Look, those guys have been productive with Josh Allen, but we hope and we've seen Nico Collins be better than those two, and we heard, certainly think that Tank is when he's healthy. So I don't disagree. I think it's something that we'll, we'll, we'll see, but expecting Diggs to come in and be your one, well, that's something to be decided. A 1,000 yards isn't a big number for a good receiver, and if he doesn't get a 1,000 yards, uh, the Texans may feel pretty good about shortening that deal because it ain't going to be happy Stefan Diggs. And, and I, I'm more on the Stefan Diggs train when it comes to why would you do it? Are you getting three years, 50 plus million dollars next in his next deal? I don't know. That's, that's something will, will be, will be kind of figured out and that'll depend on how he performs as a Texan. So I was a little surprised he was okay with it, but he does get extra money up front. So that might've been all he was thinking about. And his next deal would include more guaranteed money. It would. That's 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 the thing that would make him be willing to, to, the, to get rid of that deal. The guarantee of however many million. I mean, it'll be, I don't know, tens of millions. Yeah. Uh, when he's 31, probably into 32. Yeah, working on that, we, we can cut you after every year when there's no guaranteed money following that cut. That's something he didn't want to did want to have he didn't want to have to deal with it. So there are reasons to do it for both, and a couple reasons where you kind of question it, at least in my eyes. Yeah, and, and if if he were to play it out and get cut, say after twenty twenty five, then what are you getting on the free agent market too? So you're not even you're not getting the benefit of the guaranteed money that he could sign for you know next March. He's also getting the kind of downside of he'll be viewed – his uh, stock arrow will probably view, be viewed as a lower, uh, you know, red arrow down. Yeah, it's a real bet on yourself from Diggs, and you would th- you would expect it from a guy who's had so much so much success in the league. And if he – and the quarter – and he stays healthy and the quarterback stays healthy, he should get, get no- good numbers. But the lofty ones that would get him a giant deal – either from the Texans or another team who sees them play with C.J. Stroud, I think that's still up for debate. I don't think that's a guarantee, but uh, Sean makes a great point about the guaranteed money, no matter what the full contract is. There is a guaranteed money as- aspect of it that wouldn't be in the old deal that he can secure in the new one. So uh, you can see why he sided with, let me get to free agency, let me perform, and then go get my bag after one year with the Texans. Lazy J, I see you. You want to talk about Probably Champions League. I don't know why you want to talk about soccer. Ronaldo's not involved, uh, which is your guy. Um, but Real Madrid was involved, and maybe that's your team. They played yesterday in in one of two really good Champions League matches. PSG and Mbappe played a day. You also have Barcelona, Atletico Madrid. So the big names in world soccer, at least European soccer, have, have reached the quarterfinals of the Champions League, and Couple matches yesterday, couple matches today. Lazy day. I'll talk to you if you hang on on the other side. We'll talk about whatever you want to get to when we come back.
The Dell Olalea Show continues on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's your host, Dell Olalea. Welcome back to the show. As I said, this show, we're open to all topics for the most part. And there's a big international tournament going on right now. It stretches over months. Um, the Champions League, but we're deep into the quarterfinals. The first uh, the first leg happened for the likes of Arsenal and Man City and and Bayern Munich. Harry Kane, formerly of Tottenham, scored a penalty against Arsenal. He, that's what he does. He scores goals against Arsenal. So uh, if that's something you want to discuss or anything else, you can call in. Talk about it. Lazy J wants to talk a little soccer. What's up, Lazy J? Hey, Dale. What's, Dale, what's going on, brother? Uh, yeah, I want to talk about some Real Madrid. I know you said Ronaldo's not there, but he was definitely present in that game yesterday. I don't know if you saw Rodrigo do yeah, a celebration. You know, Messi don't have a celebration. So, <laughs> and then also uh, Bernardo Silva scored within two minutes. You know, you know he's Portugal too. So I could have sworn he learned a lot from Ronaldo too. Of course, make so, it you know. make make it all about so, Ronaldo. Okay, sure. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't even gonna bring him up, but you know he is the goat. So and you brought him up first. He is so, not. You know, I just had to, you know. He is not the goat. Back on, you know, what you were saying. He's not the goat. I thought what you said in the listener party a couple years ago. No, we'll you know, at Lazy J. Uh, people, hold on. People don't know about Lazy J. But if you do, uh, I, I apologize. But I'm gonna let you know that Lazy J is one of those like LeBron type fans. In fact, I think he is a fan of LeBron who will follow LeBron to go. Who will fo- okay? Who will follow a player no matter <laughs> where they go? He will wear the jersey of a team just because the player is there. He followed he, he had, I think you owned or maybe you still own a what was it a Juventus jersey because Ronaldo played yeah, there. Yeah, Juventus. I still got that one hanging up. I got that one hanging so, up. Yeah. So, when you're listening to I didn't want to didn't La- want to get the Saudi one though. But. <laughs> okay. When you're listening to Lazy J called re- realize that's the type of fan he is. He's not a fan of teams. He's a fan fan of players and no matter where they go, he follows. In fact, I'm sure he has like a, a LeBron's Twitter stand account. I'm sure under under a name, I'm sure it is. Yeah, yeah, I got I got one of those uh, those spam accounts. I have two good, uh, two quick questions on it. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on uh, Neymar. Do you think he's the uh, like the uh, uh, mellow of uh, soccer? You know, he's always going for money instead of really. You know, he was supposed to be the next big thing, but I just felt like he just follows the money. Whoever gives him the most money, that's where he wants to go. And then also, I want to uh, get your thoughts on. Uh, what do you think about Real? Do they really? I think they really have a chance. I mean, they had a lot of uh, goal scoring opportunities yesterday that they just didn't hit on. Uh, Holland, he just disappeared. He disappeared last year when they played him. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. Is he washed or you think he's just you know? Because I I couldn't see him in the game at all yesterday. He was just he was horrible yesterday, and that was last year also with Holland. So just want to get your thoughts on that. Love the show. Yeah, Early Holland is the the striker for Man City. I don't think he's washed. It, I think, um, look, the Premier League is um, maybe the greatest league in the world, and he and he's and he's pretty good there. Uh, uh, but but Champions League is a little different. Champions League tr- kind of makes people and sometimes breaks people. I think he'll be fine. But if you're you're asking me about Real Madrid, I can't. I'm not gonna count count out Real Madrid in Champions League. They're they're the uh, if we're talking. He's he's mentioned goats a couple times. They're the goats of Champions League. Real in the Champions League, particularly in a quarterfinal. Now that their first match was at home was a tie. Now they have to go to Man- Manchester to see. Uh, they have to go to the Etihad to see Man City. So, sure, they're at a bit of a disadvantage, but it's a route. Why would I ever question their ability to get through a tough leg of a Champions League quarterfinal and make it to a potential final? Just throw, just say they're like the Astros. Well, maybe not this version of the Astros, but other versions where you just expect them to be in a spot where they're competing for a title, and Real Madrid is there. And and they were they were prolific, had some great goals. In fact, that whole game was filled with great goals, um, and that's why I brought it up today because uh, that's an entertain. Th- those are the best players in the world playing in the best competition in the world, and um, check it out. Like I know the NCAA tournament has kind of dominated the conversation as far as middle of the afternoon events to watch the last couple of weeks. But if you want to see the best of the best, uh, tune in today. I think the matches start at two p.m. Paramount. Plus has those uh, maybe CBS Sports Network. I'm not sure if you can find it on regular broad, regular cable, or maybe you have to have the Paramount uh, Plus streaming service. So I don't know about that. I have Amazon, I have Paramount Plus, so I watch them that way. So check them out. Champions League quarterfinals, the best teams in the world, the biggest, some of the biggest teams in the world as far as their names uh, going at it to, 
to decide who gets to the semifinal. If the matches today match what the matches were yesterday, you're in for a good time. Tyler wants to talk about Holland. Hey, Lance. Lance is out there. Lance roots for Everton. He doesn't know anything about big-time soccer. We're talking Champions League. You want to come in and talk about your terrible team? Yeah. That's right. You don't. Everton has nothing to do with that. They're terrible. Barely staying up on the in the Premier League. But Tyler wants to talk about Erling Haaland. What's up, Tyler? Hi. Uh, hello? Yeah, go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, so uh, Erling Haaland gets this reputation like he is a goal-scoring machine, and he is against, like, the bottom half of opposition. Every big game that Man City has had this year, he's a no-show. He's a ghost. You could put him on a milk cart. They should have beat Chelsea, and he missed, like, three big chances. He misses the most big chances out of anyone in the Premier League, but we don't talk about that. Yeah, we've got Erling Haaland slander, Lance. We've got Tyler, who who questions his ability to show up in big moments, and, and Lazy J called in and said he disappeared in the Champions League. But you wouldn't know. No, you- I wouldn't know except from watching. But here's something. Can we also talk about Man City, how – for some reason, my Everton team has been hit with reductions twice. We got some Cheaters. of them back. Man City has the same issues, but they keep things tied what? up for so long that they haven't been. Like, how does the Premier League get away with penalizing only certain teams and the other teams they're, that they say are going to get penalized don't get penalized? Or they, they're the NCAA. You punish, oh, Alabama did something, you, pun- you punish Portland State. That's where they're not going to punish like, one of the, they're not going to punish the top six. They have the same issue. Drop their points. They're not going to punish the top six. You should you should realize soccer's corrupt. I don't know if you this heard. is super corrupt. This is bull crap. <laughs> Lance, mean, Lance is a, a I'm a 10 year watcher. Lance roots for a team that is like the 90s version of the Clippers. <laughs> it's not that. Bad. Yes, it is. I mean, re- they're okay. in a city with a dominant team who has a big name. Liverpool. They're, they're oh. the Lakers. And you're the Clippers, who at times have, have risen ni- up, but for the most part oh, have been trashed. 90s Clippers, maybe. Yeah, the yeah, 90s Clippers. The, I mean, we did have they did. Have, we all, had all your play- we had Danny Manning. All your for players a while. are like Rodney Rogers. We had Danny Manning for a while. You did. In and then he left. And then he left. Yes. Yeah, I I I got in ten years ago. Like, okay, I'm finally going to do it after watching World Bunch Cup. Of Keith Kloss is on this roster. And so I, it's true. We got except smaller and slower. Yeah. Not and then I realized an it didn't. It took me a couple of years to realize. Okay, I accidentally chose the Texans mm-hmm. as my team of soccer, and now and then I really found out what everyone meant that the Big Six, like you're just a feeder league. Everyone else, you're a feeder league to everyone else. And I started seeing my some of my favorite players leave, like Lukaku. I really didn't care about the other ones. The other ones stunk. Then I and I just realized, wow, I'm stuck because I'm not changing teams now. I'm not a team jumper. But I realized, wow, this is going to offer – it's more exciting when you're fighting for your life in relegation than it is to be 11th True. mid-table. My, my team is 13th. They're fine. They're going to be safe for a second year. They used to be one of those up-and-down teams where they where they would be in the top Premier League and then drop down to, to, to the championship. That happened like four years in a row where they're up, down, up, down. Uh, the second year in a row that they're going to be safe. Yeah, the Premier League is about – Finding a moment where Arsenal comes to town, you win a you you win a game at home against Arsenal, but then you realize that's great, but you're you're never going to compete for a title. It's irrelevant. You're like, never going to win. The win is almost irrelevant. It just gives you excitement for that time. Yeah, so, yeah it's got to be in some ways like, I mean, in some ways it is like small market baseball. Although even small market baseball yeah. has its moments, but it's not sustainable. Like, small market Lester, baseball. Leicester City did. I mean. They couldn't. They couldn't continue that. But like what Tampa has become. Tampa's a team who's always competitive yeah, that, and com- and compete for a title. Leicester City winning was like was legitimately like Buster Douglas beating Mike Tyson. Yeah, like it's whatever the biggest upset you can think I'm of. Trying to think of an and American. Jamie Var- Jamie Vardy went on a run that year that was unimaginable. Yeah, I can't think scorer. of a, the comparison because of how <laughs> professional sports are set up here. They give you opportunities, even if you're yeah. smart market. They give you advantages, or at least they give you an opportunity to try to be successful. The Premier League is like, and other international leagues, is like, hey, do you want to, can you possibly survive a, a year? That's how it is. Are Can you survive? It's kind of the goal for anyone below, like, 10th. Like, can you sur- it's Hunger Games every year. Every year you're hoping and praying. Every year Everton is in Hunger Games, and we're trying, at least for three years in a row now, and we're trying not to get, 
killed and kicked off the island or whatever. Yeah, because the Leicester City we mentioned now in the championship, but I'm more the excited, below. But I actually am more into the games. Like you I have know to when be. they're, I got to be. You got to watch it because this could be the this could be the game or the loss that determines whether you and are honestly, playing. Honestly, we've from- been relegation champions the last couple of years where we play our very best in the biggest moments of getting kicked out of the league. So I like to say we're relegation. That's champions. not a thing. Well, relegation champions is not a thing. It's become a thing. We got some questions for you. Oh, Someone great. wants to know what kind of shoes you have on. These are just an exclusive uh, Adidas. They, didn't, they only dropped a few of these. And you got a pair because yep. you have a connect. The other question is, Is it, when are you too old to wear Jays? You don't wear Jays. You're an Adidas guy. Yeah, I stuck with Adidas uh, Deutschland. Is there two? Actually, I just got. I, oh, I, I don't have the, the same connection anymore. Speaking of anymore. that, Deutschland, no, the German national team, no longer an Adidas team. Starting, I think, in a maybe twenty twenty seven, they're what? no longer going to be an Adidas. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They're leaving. That's Adidas. like saying Oregon's no longer a Nike team. Well, there are some deep seated things beyond just Oregon and Nike that Germany and Adidas have. But, um, but yeah, no longer. No, I think you Jordans are, they're they're style shoes. They're they're you know. You can always. I, they, wear I think them. you can always wear them. Yeah. There's your there's your answer to that question. But yeah, Deutsch- I'm not a Jordan wearer. But I told my wife. I'd get her a pair if she wanted to, because girls look kind of cute in shorts. They do. Yeah. A girl in Jays, the the originals, the the ones look good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got to be the ones. We're not getting Jordan fives for the wife. <laughs> no, that's she better have some game if she's going to start wearing. She better be a legitimate basketball player and kind of rough. Rough. She's wear. Yeah, you got to be kind of rough. Like you know what I mean. Well, no, rougher. I know what you mean. But what do you, what do you mean? You want to tell everyone what you mean? Uh, it's forty two. Oh, look at that! It's You're time for a break. The- Time for a break. Let's get out on time. Yeah, Adidas and Germany no longer will be partners starting in 2027. Nike came in and goes, we'll take that. We'll take that. Kind of rough. You can't buy a girl Jordan 1s, or you can buy a Jordan 5s if she's a little rough, according to Lance. Do you think you know what he means when he says that, Sean? I think I know, but I don't. I don't know for sure. That's that's the beauty I have of, an, I, of the of what he said. I think I have a, a view because I grew up around kid around girls who wore Jordans and not just the Jordan ones. They were a little rough. <laughs> they were a little rough. It was part of the it okay. was part of the deal. So I think, I'm, I think at least we're on the same. Yeah, thing. I'm not gonna get into what I think rough means, but you guys know, you know. You, you you uh you took two steps to the right. Everything you didn't want you didn't want none from them. Mostly because uh they were down to talk a whole hell of a lot in high school, and I just I just didn't need that. I'm I'm an avoidance type. I am that now. I definitely was that in high school when I was just trying to get through the day and get home and watch cartoons and eat and eat a chicken sandwich. As Lance said, we're up against it, but not really. It's only 11:43. Uh, we have gone far past that. At times, but thanks to Lance Airline for chiming in, talking about his awful Everton team. You you guys want to call in and prompt Lance to come back in? We'll see if we can we can do do that do that for you. We got a couple of NFL stories I want to get to. One before we go to break, we talked about this guy quite a bit as far as the def- defensive end market, and the Texans have been involved with that. We know they lost Grenard, they signed Daniel Hunter to a shorter deal, but with a lot of money. $48 million guaranteed of a possible 49. That number still is just funny to me. That the $1 million that they that they couldn't agree on to give him a fully guaranteed deal. You think that was just like, hey, we're not going to set a precedent here where we're yes. giving fully guaranteed money That's to someone? 100%. That had to be it, right? Why, yeah. why wouldn't you just give him the, the next million? Why are we... F- Messing, why are we messing around with the extra million that can't be guaranteed uh, over a two-year span? But uh, Josh Allen, the Jags defensive end, not the quarterback that's done with Stephon Diggs and dating Haley Steinfeld, which is the more the most important part of his storyline right now. He gets a giant deal from the Jacksonville Jaguars. He was a he was a franchise tag candidate, but the Jags come to an agreement with Josh Allen, so he'll get a chance to terrorize C.J. Stroud. For the next couple of years, at least um, five years, one hundred fifty million dollars for Josh Allen. He was great. I speculated that if Grenard was going to leave and if he was willing to to make a move, that be a guy I would target before I decide to pay Grenard or, or anyone else. But the, the Jags made it known that he wasn't going to be available, and they follow through on that. Five years, one hundred fifty million dollars, and he'll make a little bit more than twenty four million dollars next year. 
Um, well, actually, the franchise tag was set to pay him a little bit more than $24 million. So this extension replaces that. So Josh Allen will be a Jag for the foreseeable future. We'll see what that what that means for the future of Trevor Lawrence because he has a contract coming up. I'm going to say the Jags will be a little hesitant about giving him the money because, one, Josh Allen has been a performer, and he has been an elite pass rusher. He can get after the quarterback. It's Trevor Lawrence. Not so much. Not so much when it comes to being elite. He of the blowing a game against Tennessee that cost his team the division and a playoff appearance, and that's the reason the Texans hosted a playoff game and then beat up on the Browns and eventually fell to the Baltimore Ravens. So the Jags make a move to secure their their pass rusher. Uh, they have some other questions to answer, and they're still far behind the Texans, and partly because, as I mentioned, their quarterback hasn't lived up to the billing. Okay, uh, that'll wrap up this segment. We've got one more to go before Gallant and George join us. There's some other NFL news to discuss. Eric DaCosta, the Ravens GM, has some stuff to say about how NIL in the NCAA is changing uh, the draft, so we'll get to that, and we'll get to some other things before we go. One more segment here. We'll be back. You're listening to the Dell Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Vertex Community Bank Studios, here's Dell Olalea. I gave out golf tickets earlier today, and the rest of the station will do that as well, which reminds me, as I think about it, that we're going to be out at East River 9 tomorrow. The entire the entire station will be out there, so 
Hopefully it doesn't rain. That has been an issue for us a couple times while we're out there. But if you want to come out there and, 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 and enjoy, they do breakfast pretty well there. Or you just want to gawk at John while he's recovering from his Dallas trip. Boy, what, I don't know if you listened, Sean. It was bad today. The voice was um, – the thro- he was getting beat up. I said it was his, – his, vo- his throat was like Connecticut, and he, he was like the rest of the, the field, just getting <laughs> pummeled by whatever was going on uh, in his days in Dallas. Uh, the man likes to enjoy himself, and it was clear. Uh, you could hear it. Dallas was Tristan Newton and uh, yeah. Donovan Klingon, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, and he uh, and he was poor the, old Zachy. No, no, not even Zach. Zach Eady was fine. The, he was great. The Purdue guards. Yeah, the field. <laughs> yeah, the Purdue yeah. guards were were him, and and Connecticut's defense was was his throat. It was it was a bad one for John. Hopefully he's, he he feels better. He's got to make the drive back. But we're gonna be out at East River Nine along with the rest of us. Sean will be out there. He'll join me out there for the show. So uh, come out there and see us as uh, we celebrate. What are we celebrating? Just being out around a golf course. Yeah. The Masters, I, Masters. is that what it is? We're yeah. celebrating the, the Masters. Opening round of the Masters. Yeah, opening yeah, opening day. It's supposed uh, to really rain in Augusta. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, we're, we'll be out there. The Masters will be going on as well. So you can come out and join us and enjoy the golf um, and enjoy the show. So that that's good. Good. East River Nine is always a good time. And so we'll be out there tomorrow. Eric DaCosta, as I mentioned before we went to break, he is the general manager for the Ravens, the Ravens team who – Made an AFC title game, was the number one seed, and then lost to the Chiefs because that's what everyone does. They lose to the Chiefs. He is attributing not only the not only COVID, but NIL deals for making sure that less draftable prospects enter the NFL. He says because of COVID and the NIL, the whole draft prospect is, draft landscape has changed. There are less players in the draft this year. There are less draftable players, less underclassmen. I guess that would have been a topic for for Lance before he dipped out uh, complaining about Everton and the Premier League. DaCosta says, we're we're looking to possibly package our seventh round picks. They have a couple to move up because he doesn't think they're going to be guys worth drafting in the seventh round. Now, that could be someone who is unique in his opinion. Maybe others feel that way. I don't know if I've heard that. Um, I'll, maybe I'll ask Lance about it tomorrow. But it is an interesting thought because if let's say you're a a really good defensive lineman, but you're undersized, and normally in your fourth year you would leave after, but because of COVID, you have an opportunity to stay. If you're a low round pick, why wouldn't you stay? Particularly if you play at a big school who has a good NIL package. Why would if I'm a if I'm an undersized a defensive lineman at let's just say TCU. It's TCU. You may not think much of their NIL, but it's Fort Worth. Fort Worth. They have money, and and they have and they want to keep you. The gar- the guaranteed money you're getting from NIL is going to f- surpass what you could p- potentially make in year one as a either a street free agent or a seventh round or sixth round pick, and you get to stay where you where you've been for a couple of years, where people love you, and go make money and not get not go through the grind of potentially getting cut every other week on an on an NFL roster. Even if you make the opening day roster, you're probably on the lower end and you can always get cut. I think Eric DaCosta has a point. I think I think if if the draft is actually filled, well not filled, but has less draftable players, it makes sense for those players not to dip out. Yeah, especially like you mentioned that you probably can make if depending on where you're at, how uh, what your market is like, you can probably make pretty similar, if not more. Then, I mean, we're mo- mostly talking about fifth and below round picks, right? That's yeah. kind of what we're because if you're if you're in the top three rounds, you're prob the nil money isn't probably what's keeping you there, unless you play for Ohio State, who had everyone come back, uh, except for Marvin Harrison, basically. Um, but the the money that you're getting not only uh, is is a wash, but you also have the opportunity to increase your draft stock. <laughs> you can you can be like you know one of these uh, Bo Nix or I mean these are quarterbacks Bo Nix Michael Penix who if they came out after year three or four of their college football career probably not getting drafted or their late picks. Now they're going to be first or second round picks. And the same the same can be true for basically any uh, position other than 
other than probably running back where you just kind of want to get get to the NFL as quickly as quickly as possible with that little carries as possible but I think basically every other position is like well if I'm a if I'm going to be a 22 or 23 year old playing against 19 year olds I'm going to look better and I can't be lower than a sixth round pick (laughs) like I'm not going to hurt my draft position yeah depending on the play I've heard some reasoning that I'm not going to get any bigger or faster I'm tapped out as far as as far as a development so if you don't see a path to increasing your draft stock because you play a position where explosiveness and 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 speed play a large part in your game or even just size i mentioned defensive end if if you're 62 260 or 255 and that's where you're going to be uh, maybe you look at it and go you know what i can stay here for another year they they're willing to pay me let's say 400,000 that might be in the low end depending on how productive you are uh, to play one more year in college, why wouldn't I do that as opposed to taking my chances and hoping I find myself in the right situation where my particular skill set fits defensive profile and defensive system of, of a team? So uh, I think it's reasonable that what Eric DeCosta is talking about, and I think it's great for the players. Give you one more opportunity because you may not ever make what you're potentially going to make in your final year of college depending on where you are and how productive you have been on the college level. So yeah, it's just another option. Yeah. It, all these, all these sixth and seventh rounders that Eric DaCosta is like, well, normally they're better. Even those guys are in the league for one, maybe two training camps and are out. So yeah. like, and then they go to the UFL and they're in the practice squad and they're not going to make, they're yeah. gonna, they don't get game checks. So they're not making the money that, you could get for and, spending another year in college. Uh, yeah, and again, those are the good, <laughs> the good ones. Yeah, those are the good ones. The ones he actually wants, not yeah. the ones he doesn't think even are capable of being seventh round picks. So it's like, yeah, sh- can I make a, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars playing at, like you said, TCU or, or I don't know, yeah, I just picked the school, UCF, yeah, whatever. Like, uh, yeah, sure, I'll t- do that rather than and still, you know. Get the college lifestyle. I'm sure plays a little bit. Very part enjoyable. Of it. Yeah, big man on campus as opposed to small. Uh, instead of a small a fish in a giant yeah. pond. Yeah, you instead of doing that. So that's that's a that's an effective nil that I think helps the players. I think most of it does. Uh, but if the NFL has less draft draftable players, so be it. Because you're just going to grind them up anyway. We're done for the day. We'll be out at East River Nine tomorrow. The entire station will. But coming up next, Galant and George. Then the killer bees. I'll talk to you tomorrow.
Another day of problems for the Houston Astros. Every time it feels like something's going good, things go awry. Another loss last night. Last night to the Kansas City Royals, who are better this year than last year, even though the record doesn't really indicate that yet either. But a 4-3. Excuses. Extra inning loss last night to the Kansas City Royals. Christian Javier was good to start the game. And then he kind of unraveled. Everyone's favorite member of the Astros right now, Alex Bregman. Not a, not a lot of great moments. He did throw a guy out game. at home. He did. It was a good play. Uh, but it just not not a lot of good. Questionable decisions. Really questionable decisions last night for Joe Espada. And so today we're going to play the blame game. Where do you place the most blame right now on the Houston Astros? Is it a player? Is it a manager? Is it the owner? Is it the GM? What is it? 713-780-3776. Who is the blame for the Astros' slow start in 2024? Okay, man, if, if we're doing it as a whole, it is difficult because there's a lot of blame to go around. For sure. For last night, even with the struggles with runners in scoring position, of which there were many, and... Christian Javier seemingly running out of steam, which does have me a bit concerned about him long-term as a starter. And of course, a guy thrust into a bullpen role that never should have been thrust into said bullpen role. But for last night specifically, Joe, because I'm sure there's going to be all sorts of people who have all sorts of blame for all sorts of folks. I'm going to put this at Joe Espada's feet. I felt that pinch-hitting John Singleton for Jose Abreu is not an upgrade. And in extra innings, why are you throwing with this guy who does not belong on a major league roster to a player who a couple of years ago had 48 home runs? A guy who in 46 career games against the Astros has 11 homers and eight doubles. You got a guy on second base, and you got this big fatty boom batty walking up to the plate. Intentionally walk his ass. Yeah. Instead, Perez, who is a damn good pro, he's been in the league for a long time. He sees one pitch. He knows exactly what he's going to get. Next pitch, double, game over. Yeah, it's pinch hitting Singleton for, it was, for Dubon is just a... I don't understand. I don't understand why you would make that decision. You know, Victor Caratini for Jose Abreu it, later in the game, I get that. Because Jose Abreu sucks. There's no other way to put it. He sucks. He shouldn't be playing. He's not good. No matter what Dana Brown says, he should not be playing. No. And they're they're just, they're flat out stuck with him. And we're going to get to this a little bit later. But Dana Brown, back on his nonsense that Jeff Bagwell was pu pumping to us last year, trying to baseball explain us. At least give us something original, Dana. Do we have to hear that on the back of Jose Abreu's baseball card, Ugh. he's been good before? Because you could say that about a lot of athletes getting up there in age. Well, look at the back of his baseball card. But now you have two years. With the Houston Astros, that would be a part of this baseball card if the baseball card was printed on April 10th, 2024. And it would say 0. .88. Mm. 0. .088 batting average. It's not good. Uh, so, yeah, Joe Spada, definitely a big part of it. Now, with that, I'm going to just add on. I'm going to go Dana Brown. Chandler Rome just put out a piece in The Athletic. Um, talking the about just... Sharks are circling. Um, just talking about the... The challenge the Astros legitimately face, the amount of innings that they legitimately have to replace right now. You have a 200-inning pitcher pretty consistently in Justin Verlander. Carl Morvales threw 198 pitches last year. You lost 200-plus innings from your bullpen last year. And what did you do to replace it? Well, you brought in Josh Hader, which he got it done last night and, and got you to extra innings at least. Ryan Presley and Brian Brayu also got it done last night so that's a little bit of a positive but they chose to not address the bullpen this offseason and when you have to when you have the unfortunately what happened the day before where Blair Henley was only able to get one out 
and you probably Seth Martinez was down, I would assume, for yesterday's game. That's how you end up with Suero on the mound in the 10th inning when you just don't really have a lot of options. Also, I'm kind of over this Josh Hader nonsense already. Like, Josh Hader, when all these public interviews, right as he signed with the Astros and right before, and what he talked about was how he wouldn't pitch two-plus innings because, and he wouldn't pitch outside the ninth because that's what arbitration was telling him. He was saying, they told me I didn't have enough saves when I met with the Padres and the Brewers because I didn't have enough saves because I was coming in during the eighth inning. So I'm only going to be a ninth inning guy. Dude, you are on a five-year, $95 million contract. And I know Joe Espada said after the game. That's that, a real thing? Yes. It's, <laughs> it is. What? Like, I know Joe Espada like said fact. after the game that there's a long season to go. But when your option is something called a Wander Suero, Josh Hader has to throw more than 11 pitches in a game. It's just... You're getting paid $95 million over five years. Throw 25 pitches. Walk a guy. Get a double play. Strike a guy out. Get out of the 10th inning. Now, look, the Bats could have done their job. They failed to do so. You were also given a runner on second base. It's not like the Royals had some kind of extra advantage because they were the home team. You just bottomed out and, and didn't score in the 10th inning. So there's there's a ton to bl- a ton of blame to go around for last night's game and just for the season as a whole. I'm not going to put it on the bullpen, and I do think in the case of not addressing the bullpen, Kendall Graveman getting hurt, you had to do something, and that something was bringing in Josh Hader. I think that was one of the guys that you were looking at who was supposed to help you out in that spot. Last night, getting to Suero and him getting demolished on that one pitch by Salvador Perez. I, I can't get too mad at that. It's not his fault. But I can get mad at the continuous struggles with the runners in scoring position. The weird thing with last night, though, is that the Astros had 18 hits, and they scored three runs. And they were, what, 5-4? Uh, uh, was it 5 for? Check that. They had 13 hits. They were 5 for 18 with runners in scoring position. So that's a 277 average. Shouldn't you be getting more than three runs? And, yeah. and obviously, and Bobby Witt made that great play in the 10th yeah. inning, so that's one off the board. But still, you had plenty of opportunities, and it's just not happening. And you're also getting hits, and it's not happening. So what the hell is going on there? But, I mean, it starts in the first. Yeah, bases loaded, yeah. no outs. And, I mean, the only run that you get is on a fielder's choice. That's it? Yeah, that's, that's one where we mentioned this a little bit yesterday. The bats are doing a pretty good job getting on base. They're just there's not getting them home. I mean, you have the amount of hits you have last night. You should you should have what we talked about yesterday, five, six, seven runs in this game. Like because you had you had so many hits and they just they they can't they can't get guys home. It, it's it's that's what's the most baffling about it because when you look at the amount of hits they have, the Astros are up there in Major League Baseball, so they're getting guys on base. They just they can't get him across the plate for whatever reason. And sometimes it's plays like Bobby Witt Jr. in the 10th, like you mentioned. But other times, it's just it's Alex Bregman with a pop-up with bases loaded and just and not getting guys in. And that's what's – it's hard It's hard to explain because it really – it makes no logical sense. Like, even if you just look at a box score, you go, how do they, how do they score f- three runs in last night's game? Uh, from the 8-3-2, flat-out bats. Again, they're struggling. The pitchers need to get healthy, but will it matter if the bats stay this inconsistent? It's a good question. Um, I would say, no, it won't matter. Uh, not that the Astros aren't going to make the playoffs and not that they're not going to probably win at least one series in the playoffs, if not two, and everyone's going to look back at these moments and just say, we were talking about, like, raining cats and dogs, and they'll figure it out. I'm, I'm still very, very convinced they will, but... If this doesn't improve, then what you're probably looking at is what you saw last year in the postseason, that when it mattered most, they just failed to get guys. Good luck getting home right now. Good luck getting there. You're playing like ass, and I am getting annoyed with Joe Espada or Dana Brown repeating the same stuff over and over to us, whether it's, hey, look at the back of the baseball card for our bad player that we signed to a bad contract, or on top of that, saying that, yeah, we'll rip off eight to ten in a row. You said that last week. Can we get some original content for the spin zone? Can we get something original out there? You're saying the same thing over and over to me. I'm going to notice. Lie to me in different ways, okay? If you lie to me in different ways, then you might throw me off the scent. 
But when you're just saying the same thing over and over again, eventually people are going to tune you out entirely, and all of a sudden, the pitchforks and the torches will be coming for you. Probably first for Joe Espada, who I really have a hard time buying anything that he's saying right now. But then Dana Brown, who I've always had a hard time buying anything that he says. You're four and eight. Do not tell me that you're just going to rip off eight to ten wins in a row. You might. Sure. Do it. Before you talk about this, the Royals are up and coming. Blah, blah, blah. Shut up. They're still the effing Royals. They beat you five out of six times last year. You should be taking them seriously. What's going on here? Yeah, 281, Dana Brown's a joke. 409, it's Dana and Jim's fault for letting Naris, Stanek, and Maton walk. Uh, I, yeah, Dana Brown's going to catch the most heat. He should because he's full of it. Yeah. He's full of it. Look at the back of the baseball card. Shut up. Yeah, so this is so this is my interpretation. You should of, never of, talk again. This is my interpretation of that. I'm stuck with Jose Abreu. I don't want him on this team. And the only thing that I can tell you is that he once was good. And it's what Sean mentioned yesterday. Is Jim Crane really going to admit that in his offseason or three months as the general manager of the Houston Astros, he signed two players to two terrible contracts and he's going to eat one of them. He's not. Like, that to me is what Dana Brown's telling us, Paul, is I don't know what to do. Like, they're talking about, Dana Brown's talking about timing. But okay. He's, but he's not, though, because he's doing it with this sing-songy BS. Yeah. Like, he, he mentioned, he said timing today was an issue for Jose Abreu. Because he's old, he can't catch a fastball. Like, like that's really, that's the issue. His bat speed's gone. Like, everything that made Jose Abreu a great player once it's it's gone. I don't know how it comes back. We saw it last year when everything he wasn't pulling anything to start the year. And yes, they blamed the back injury that we found about like six months into the season, but it was he couldn't pull anything because he couldn't get on top of a fastball. And that is the same thing here. These guys, when they were throwing ninety six at him last night, it, he looked he just looks nowhere close. He doesn't look lost. This doesn't look like a minor league baseball player who has no business being on the big league roster. This just looks like an old guy who just he can't he can't catch it. He anymore. looked lost when he got pinch hit for. He was in the dugout. Oh, he this stare, this dead stare ahead, and he I looked mean, stunned. You're probably going to be second guessing yourself now, and and, and I mean, he, he's dead weight in the lineup, and you don't have any alternatives right now. And, I mean, hey, cool, Spencer Aragetti, he's on the hill today. That's fun. We'll but, see how that goes. But, exactly. I, mean, I hope it goes better. It'll, it, hopefully it goes better than it did for Blair. Um, that's all I know. Uh, but, hey, look, he's he's a good pitcher. He's had good success in the minors, but it's still it's the minors. You know, going back, mentioning Chandler Rome's piece that I brought up, Chandler points out he's thrown he threw 124 innings last year, I believe it was. So this is not exactly a guy that, like, is a long-term solution for this season. He's going to get gassed out pretty soon, so they're going to have to be careful about how many innings Eric Getty even pitches long-term. So what do you get out of this guy Let's see if he's even tonight. Good. Let's see if he's even good. You know, there's there's been so many Astros prospects that have been hyped up. They get up to the majors, and they are not all that they were hyped up to be. And I, I just go back to John Singleton, who, by the way, is back on your roster, or mm. um, some of the other guys that uh, were hyped in the minor league system. Who was that first baseman that uh, played all so long ago? I don't even remember his name anymore, but I I've, I always hear hype about prospects. I, I mean, if, if Spencer Arrogetti can get you 100 innings this year, great. Yeah, but I mean, that'd be great. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not even thinking about getting to 100 innings. I think we have this nonsense. Like, don't be a, I'm going to be sure. Don't be a coward. Don't be a coward. Who? Uh, this one, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give the area code because I want to make sure I specifically point this person out. Uh, well, you should give the area code. Don't give the last four digits. Out. I'm giving the last four. Give one. both, okay. and then the middle. Three Honestly, two. right now, because like full I, hate, <laughs> I hate, I hate cowards like this. A coward. Nine nine four zero. What's it? So last year, everything was Dusty's fault, and now everything is Dana's fault. I'm sensing a powder. Don't be a bitch. If you want to call us racist, and that's oh. what you're trying to ensue, there, just do it. Because here's the thing. I'm sorry. Like I can't help the fact that the the GM and the last manager are black. We're going to criticize people equally. We've been criticizing oh. Joe Espada oh, Joe, on you're, this you're, show. You're, you're, but, but we're all over the, the, the black guys. Dude. But like, Dana, I think that's a you problem. Man. Je, if Jeff Luno was the GM right now, we'd be crushing him. I don't know. Just like James Click got crushed last year. Dana Brown is the general manager of this team. Let 200 innings walk away from his bullpen. Replaced it with one guy. 
and he's got an awful first baseman on his roster. His manager is making the decision to use John Singleton instead of Mauricio Dubon yeah, for whatever guy. reason. It's probably another black guy show. Like, it, it is, he failed as a general manager this offseason to set his team up for success. You knew going into the year and into the start of the season that you were missing four starting pitchers. They chose not to sign someone after they pursued Blake Snell, which means they had money, but it's not a shiny object that Jim Crane's going to love and sell jerseys with. So Jim Crane will not invest in pitchers and go over the luxury tax and players if you're not going to buy their jerseys. It is not all on Dana Brown, but Dana Brown is the general manager of this football team. Of this baseball team. And Jesus football. Christ. But like Dana Brown He's is at of- fault for a lot of this stuff. The other black guy I- you don't like. Yeah, <laughs> come on, Joe. Nick Casario, the robot. I was black? thinking D'Amico. <laughs> I know. I, 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 was, I was hoping he said basketball so we could rope in Rafael Stone. I know. I, I don't see color. I, wait, so Jeff Luno, he wasn't black? No, he's also a robot. Is James Click black? I think he's Mexican, actually. That's true. Hey, you can't say that. Wait, I didn't know that. You can't say you can't say the word Mexican, Sean. You can't say that. What are I you just, doing? I hate stuff like that because it's just it is it's cowardice and just because you're blaming someone. Well, as an ally of the black community, I'm gonna say Dana Brown, uh, he is paying uh the Houston Astros more money than all but two teams in, in baseball. He's signing those checks. <laughs> He, they are. Or maybe Jim Crane is. I don't know. <laughs> well, and to be fair, I, I I was the one that was brave enough to criticize a white man, Jim Crane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, Good job, Sean. And, and call out the Jose Abreu and Rafael Montero contracts. Yeah. As like, hey, these guys both uh, stink out loud. <laughs> I like this t- this text, 832. I'm black, and it's definitely Dana Brown's fault. I don't know. That sounds like a white guy <laughs> yeah. texting. Uh, we I don't believe That's that That's true. Guy. We can't validate we can't, that. How do we know? I could text that in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was just Sean. Let me, let me double check Sean's Joe, phone. Joe just, te- Joe just texted that in. Because no, 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 because I, no, I don't have a Houston area code still. You could have a burner phone. Yeah. they want. I, try, I was going to make the switch, but then it was, what's that new area code? 469 or whatever it is. It's not it, because if it was 6'9", I, I might get it. I, I think this one texter is right, though. 409. It's Gary from the Gary. barbershop, who's, who, who always talks about the barbershop and what guys talk about at the barbershop. <laughs> Including, like, quarterbacks with T-Rex arms. Oh, man. Can we criticize Alex Bregman? Yeah, he stinks. No, but, I mean, he's Jewish. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. That's true. You <laughs> don't came at Alex Bregman earlier in the week. Knives out. Good point. <laughs> that, Sean, that's problematic to say. What? I said he came out with the oh, knives out. Yeah, knives. You can't. You can't talk about knives out for the for the Jewish community. No, you can't do that. Oh. Hundred years. Come on. What are you doing? All right. He did a sweep of the of stop. The team. We, we we need to stop before we're canceled. Uh, cancel us if you can. That would be the no, name. don't. <laughs> Please don't. Everything that was bad that was said in this segment, Joe, just go back. Just go listen. Uh, racist Joe. Oh, man. All right. Who do you blame the most of the Houston Astros? We'll continue that. Talk more about last night's game on Glott and George here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5.
It's Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul Gallant and Joe George. 713 says, a spot that gets most of the blame for me. I think last night there were two places that you can pin the blame on him. It's the idea that pinch hitting Singleton ever works. Mm -hmm. And two, I don't know why you didn't walk Salvador Perez. Yep. You were past Bobby Witt. The lineup for the Royals, I'm assuming after Salvador Perez, is going to get a little bit easier for whoever was out on the hill. And you start the inning with the runner on second base. You may as well create a force out situation and get away from the guy who you know over the course of his career has been a power hitter. Yeah. Uh, Alex Bregman gets a lot of blame for last night. The error that he had in the game, one for five. Opportunities to drive in runs with the bases loaded. Other opportunities in the game as well. He did save a run, so I can't get too mad yeah, at Bregman. And also, he had, a little bit. he had three hits the night before, yeah. too. So, I, I'm I'm not pointing it at him. Uh I, I also feel like with Christian Javier, we might be facing an uncomfortable reality that perhaps Javier is better as a reliever hmm. because I think as these games go on, when he has these long, brutal innings, feels like he doesn't recover from them. Maybe that has to do with the pitch clock. Hmm. His stamina, though, I, I, I noticed it brought up on the postgame show in Space City Home Network. It, after those long innings, got away from him. And, I mean, he's got electric stuff, but the Ks per nine are down. And and maybe this is a guy who's better in a two- or three-inning kind of role. Maybe when everybody's healthy, that's somebody that you think about moving into uh, the bullpen spot where he, he thrived uh, a couple of seasons ago. And I hate to say that because you look at Javier and the stuff that he's got, but there's too many times where it feels like getting even into the fifth inning for him is a chore. Yeah, his pitch count gets pretty out of control pretty fast. It's very it, – he doesn't do it as ugly as – sometimes Lance Lance McCullers always does that that song and dance where he just puts you in the most stressful situations possible. He'll, like, load the bases with one out, but then he'll get a double play, and he'll have walked two of the three guys that are on. And it's just high stressful situations a lot of times. It feels like when McCullers – when he would pitch. But McCullers – I mean, but Javier, to your point, you know, in three starts this year – has gone six innings, five innings, 5.1 innings. And it's this is not an early season, you know, keeping him at 70, 80 pitches. It's he's getting to 93. And and typically, you know, just we know this from watching Javier, to your point, there's oftentimes one inning that balloons it. Yeah. And I think it even his last start, he had I think it was he had 24. Um, I feel like it was his last start before last night. He had 24 pitches in the first inning. And you go, okay, well, this is might be a short out, and then he kind of rolled through the rest. But his pitch count does get out of control a lot of times, and it does a challenge. Uh, to- an option I hope that they think about is that when everybody's back, that this is maybe the middle reliever who you're using regularly. Is he up for that? I don't know, but he does have that kind of stuff that you've seen before where he can pitch for two to three innings and give you probably the best version of himself where as a starter, it just is not the same for really a, a long stretch of time now. Well, I mean, that's for, well, living, you know, positive fairy tale land here for a second. Um, it's July, and Lance McCullers, uh, Luis Garcia, Justin Verlander, Fran Valdez, Christian Javier, Jose Arquiti are all healthy. Like, and you've got Hunter Brown. You've got seven oh. pitchers right there. Yeah. I don't know about Hunter Brown. So anymore. Hunter Brown's the easiest one, the Let's first what, one that you move to the bullpen. <laughs> and then the conversation would be who the who the next guy would be. Now, Espada, to his his positives of what he's done a little bit, I I appreciate that he wasn't afraid to take Abreu out last night for Caratini. I like the fact that he's dropping, you know, Abreu down in the order and instead of just leaving him in the fifth spot like past managers would have potentially done. When everyone's healthy, if someone were to be a little bit more radical about who they choose to put into the bullpen and choose Christian Javier, I actually think it might be, um, it might be Joe Espada. The problem is, is you paid him as a starter, 
And that's where I, I can't imagine they would actually go down that path. You're, pay, you're paying Josh Hader the, the same kind of money. That's true. That's a good point. So a pitcher is a pitcher. And if that is a better role for him, it should be something at the very least you consider. Yeah. I'm spitballing at this moment. No, time, no, you know? it's I'm just a simple high school football legend. <laughs> this baseball confuses me, frightens me. I, look, they're going to have a lot of options in theory. When people get healthy, you know, Justin Verlander could be back in two weeks. You know, they, while they said, Joe Spada said they don't have any news about the ligament for Framber Valdez, uh, the hope, the portrayal that Spada and Dana Brown are giving off right now is that, you know, 15 days, maybe 20, 25 days could be what you're looking at for, you know, for Framber Valdez, that it might not be a serious injury they won't really know until the inflammation in his elbow goes down and then they go so they'll, they'll find out what's next but they I mean, you're still talking about a month and they went from saying yeah we might not have to put him on the injured list to a day later putting him on the injured list yeah i i do get what's next he's back in july i get more verlander vibes uh when verlander got hurt in 2020 and after the first game of the season and everything was like we're just going to wait. We're going to wait for the inflammation to go down. We're going to wait. We're going to wait. We're going to wait. And then he had Tommy John. Mm. I hope I'm wrong, but it, maybe it's, it's it's not just it's not the negativity of what's happened with the Astros doctor staff, actually, this time. It's just what's happening in baseball. Every single time you see a pitcher get hurt, I'm just like, well, he's done. Like, his season's over. We'll see him in 15 months. Like, it's just the way I feel watching the game. Every single time a pitcher leaves the game, you go to ESPN.com, click on the MLB tab, and every single day there is just a new pitcher with elbow injury lands on IL. It's just it's so bad. They've gone from having rubber arms to being like horses. And I'm not saying that pitchers are getting euthanized when they suffer an injury, but... It wasn't that long ago where these guys, some of whom were throwing some real gas, were able to pitch seven innings regularly. Maybe the best pitchers in the game. And I understand the game's changed and the spin rate's up and people are throwing harder and harder and harder. But uh, you are right. It's, it's hard to feel optimistic about any injury that involves an elbow, especially when right here on this roster, we're talking about so many guys with varying degrees of, of arm issues, none of which we know a damn thing about. I mean, I mean, and let's Astros be perfectly honest, to go back to what you're saying, okay, maybe you're not hating on the Astros training staff. I have zero faith in that unit. I, I, I tend to agree. I'm not a doctor. I'm just a high school football player. This, doctors confuse me, and doctor, me with their witchery. Now, you are like Dr. Adjacent. My sister is a doctor. So That's true. I mean, but I mean. Could you maybe like move some, you know, move some papers around like, hey, sis. What, do you, what yeah. do you think about this guy's elbow? I, I, I could do that. And she goes, oh, my God. She would explain it to me in, in, in big terms. You see, I'm just the dumb son. Big words confuse me, frighten me, you see. Mm. Medulla oblongata. I don't know if that's in the elbow. I don't know if it's in the back of the brain. Oh, man. Oh, there's, so, there's so much going on with the Houston Astros. My, my sources tell me. That uh, someone on the show is panicking, and maybe maybe in the next segment, uh, we'll we'll really panic. But also, who would panic? It's the, it's the, our beloved Astros. Look at the back of the baseball card. But yeah, so let's talk about mansplaining or baseball splaining because we're getting baseball splained by Dana Brown, by uh, clowns on television. Ooh, so clowns. Let, yeah, Jeremy Booth. Um, so oh. let, let's get some baseball splaining in when we get back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. I'll uh, tell you about my friends at O Athletics, 767 North Shepherd. We'll be in the area on Friday when we're in Jack's Grill. So if you come hang out, we'll be there broadcasting from noon to 6. We'll be about a mile and a half away from O Athletics. So great time to come hang out with us at Jack's Grill. And then head on over to O Athletic and sign up for a membership. They got over 100 classes per week starting early in the morning, late in the afternoon. So just depending on your work schedule and, and, and what your day-to-day -day life is like, 
They have time for you to get classes in. You can sign up for personal training, whether it's one a week, two a week, three a week, whatever plan you want to do, or you can spread them out like I'm doing. I'm doing my personal training just once every two weeks just to kind of check in on my progress and, and get some assistance moving forward on you know what kind of workouts to do and check in my progress on my weight loss. So whether you want to be like me and try to lose some weight in 2024, lean out, gain some muscle, O Athletic is a great gym for you to go to 767 North Shepherd, oathletic.com. And when you sign up, tell them that Joe George sent you by. You are back with Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul and Joe. You know, the other player we haven't really talked about from last night's game, Jeremy Bram just tweeted this one out, just reminded me. So it's the top of the, or bottom of the fifth, and uh, Adam Frazier hits this pop out, just right to foul territory. It's close to the... It's close to going out of play, but Bregman's right there. And he just just misses it. And then Javier walks Frazier the next play after Bregman doesn't make the catch. And then by the end of the inning, the game is tied. So just kind of another thing with Alex Bregman. Yes, he made a great play defensively last night, but just some some frustrations um, with, with the way Breggy's been playing so far this season. Young Bregman gets to that ball. That's Young what, Bregman that's does. What, that's what Joe's saying. And yeah. now some people are wondering if people like Alex Bregman can play baseball. Yeah. That was Paul, not me. No, it wasn't. Uh, no, Joe's, Joe's may, maybe he got a slow jump because he's counting his money on his next contract, right? Oh, that's, what, that's, that's what Joe's saying. That's true because he is in a contract year. Guess what? What? Contract not looking great. <laughs> okay. Contract. Like, Astros might be able to get them. He, yeah, <laughs> they might not be out of the Astros price range. Yeah, <laughs> not a good sign. Do you want them right now? <laughs> they walked Kyle Tucker to get to him at once. <laughs> yes, that's that's not a great sign. And and then he, I mean, did nothing in that spot. He struck out. I think. 
Yeah, it was just a not not a good one. So we're getting baseball splained again. Uh, we've mentioned a couple times, but Dana Brown was on the flagship this morning, and he once again, when talking about Jose Abreu, said, quote, we have a first baseman, Jose Abreu. If you flip his baseball card, he's a notorious slow starter, but I believe he will get hot. He's 34 at-bats in. Ultimately, we believe in Abreu. We'll give him time to work things out. I find this ironic because last night, Will Kunkel, uh, Fox, tweeted this you know, similar thing out. Talked about, just talking about Jose Abreu's slow start. So let's, let's, let's hear some statistics. Buying into that baseball slow card starts. narrative. Let's talk about March and April. You must have a lot of them. Jose Abreu, in his career, is a slow starter. Absolutely. There's no denying it. He hits 247 and has 38 home runs in March and April. So that's not a great start. Typically, when he gets to May, he'd be 260, and then June, it's 288. July, 290. August, 327. September, October, 286. So, like, yes, he is a slow, slow a starter. Of, a lot of home runs, though, right? A lot of home runs. 37? That's not bad. But this is a slow start is averaging 247. This is .088 into the season in mm. 34 at bats. I get it. One five for five day, and all of a sudden his batting average looks so much better. Let me do a little but, math here. Point zero eight. Oh, it's just it's, oh, so that's sub one hundred. Yes. Okay, well, that's that's not what you want. In a sport in which you're, like, the best player in the league, if you just get on base three and a half out of ten times, or three out of ten times, and you hit 300, because no one hits 350 anymore, he, he's getting on base less than one out of ten times. Mm-hmm. And he's batting still in a position in your order in which there are guys left on base, and he is not the only one to blame. But the idea that he's just going to figure this out at his age, and it's even worse of a slow start, then this year, and the difference between his slow start and what he's done in his past is last year, it didn't just click in May and June and July. It really clicked towards the end of July and August. So it's not like he's just going to wake up in 20 days from now and start to turn it around. The slow starts are becoming slower. So, yes, will he be really good at some point this season? Probably. Is it going to take us Probably. five months to get there? I think so, if we're lucky. I like that you're saying probably, though. Because I, I, he see, is a that's, starter. That's the kind of hope we can believe in. Yeah. He's probably going to do better at some point. That, that, that's the kind of hope that a Bears fan has to have. <laughs> You know what? <laughs> Maybe it is. That, that is a, it's a specific type of hope. He's that, batting point oh eight eight. He's probably <laughs> going to get better. You're right. You're right. I mean, Joe George. Almost definitely going to get better. Yeah. You said, is he going to be good again? I mean, I'm still, I'm standing by what I said yesterday. If at some point his batting average is over 260 for a day, for an at bat. <sighs> One at bat. He needs to go eight for ten. <laughs> He's over two. You're gonna rock the Jafar beard. Yeah, we we need to determine how I will and I will rock it for as long as he is over two. over two sixty. <laughs> well, what, so, no, 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 no. What no. if he pops <laughs> up and goes under before you can grow it? Because there's gonna be a time. No, that's why. Like, I'll have to grow it, and we'll have to like we'll have to like do the math. Oh, okay. hard challenge. Okay, so we'll have to. It'll have. Oh, it's gonna be a later payoff bet. A, it's not gonna be an immediate the, turnaround. He gets a hit in the second inning, and he goes over 260 for the year. I'll, I'll then, show up with it then, to start the show. Two and a half hours later, he strikes out looking. Yeah, then I'll, then I'll get rid of it. Okay, that. got it. So, like, by the end of the show, it'll be there at the start of the show. It'll be gone by the end. Well, think about it from this perspective. How about when he gets to that number, you just have to wear it for the rest of the year? Because he's not going to get to 260. <laughs> but if he goes, like, 10 for 15. And Joe. Like, He's batting .088 right now. He is not going to get to 260. I don't care what you tell me. It's not going to happen. I know. They are pinch hitting Victor Caratini for him. They have pinch hit John Singleton for him, for God's sake. Okay, if he gets to 260 at some point this season, I will... My no, wife, no, 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 no. It's my just, wife is no, going to kill you me. Do it's it for not going to happen. <laughs> this is why you made the bet. It's not going to happen. Just in the off chance it happens. Joe, I, it's not going right, to happen. Because, okay. Because if he gets to 260, I will have the Jose Abreu goatee thing for the rest of the baseball season. Sure. So as soon as I can grow it. The the thing is, is that he has his best chance to get over 260. <laughs> right now? Right now, because there's just so few 
uh, at bats. Yeah. So the like that's the baseline that we're starting at is he needs to do it quickly. Yeah. The window of opportunity is now. Now the problem is he's playing like absolute hot ass right now, <laughs> and he well, is, some hot asses are nice to look at. Yeah. I, hot steaming. Ass. Hot steaming turd. Yeah. I think that's better. Well, because I can't. I'm an ass man. I can't say the actual. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. You can't say that. <laughs> yeah. So he's he's playing like crap right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the likelihood that he rips off a hot streak to get over 260 is low because he's probably going to stink for a while, and then he'll, he'll have to be so much better over so much longer to actually have this bet cash. But it wasn't the only baseball explaining we got, the baseball card. Yeah, you— you called this person a clown. I think he is a called clown. Him the C word. You, you called him the C word, Joe. Yeah, I think I think Jeremy Booth's a clown. A clown. Yeah, I don't know why. That's 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 my friend, Jeremy Booth. Fake news. That's uh, not fake news. I, I'm a beloved member of the KHOU sports community. Yeah, and regularly for, on sports action. And I would love for them to just dump him. Why? Because you're calling for another man's job in our industry. It's not a real job. Yes, it is. He analyzes baseball. He's on like once a week. Joe, I'm just a it's simple a part-time gig. I'm just a simple high school ex-football player. Baseball is frightening to me. I need people that have been a part of the game to explain it to me. Well, he's been part of the game and well, he he uh he had a take. He had a take about the Houston Astros and their their batting order. Can can I say this before we hear it? There's a part of me that likes this because I like the baseball nerds. I like it when they get mad. I like it when they get mad. They're insufferable, and they have no idea how to talk to other people, and it's always just condescending talking down to them. So there's a part of me that actually likes it when Jeremy Booth says stuff like this because it riles them up. Whether he's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. I just don't like those people. The nerds online who are jerks when they talk to other people. I feel if like you were, I'm being attacked here. No, 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 you're not. <laughs> we're gonna play the we're gonna play the clip in a second. All I'm saying is what I don't like about the diehard baseball fans out there are the ones who will bring up all the advanced numbers all the time, and then when you ask questions about it, they talk down to you. They only do it on Twitter. Yeah. You do it in person. They wouldn't be able to because they'd probably be a st- 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 stuttering Stanley. So to bring it back to Chair Bear, okay, I just like it when some people bring some militant old-school violence online that riles these dorks up. We want to put guys who are innate run producers, some of the best hitters in the game, in a spot to set the table. If it's not working other places to win, then you don't do it here. If it's working other places to win, okay, I get it. But if you look at some of these other clubs, we'll go with Philadelphia for a second. The lineup is longer than here. I don't trust some of the guys they have in this lineup. Diaz, believe it or not, is still unproven, although I really like what he can do. Right. And when it comes to Jeremy Pena, we have a real bit of a rebirth that we can protect him. If you want a Brady to be productive, you got to protect him. Tucker's going to hit, but you still got to protect him. And when it comes to Altuve, he's probably the only guy that doesn't need any protection. Right. right. He's at the top of the right. order and be him. I think that while some of these pieces are interchangeable, you'll see the comfort level, the energy, the excitement come back once they're able to, able to uh, play productive baseball and win games. No one likes losing. And for all the, the, the stuff we see on, is it X? Are we calling it X? I still X, call it X, Twitter. X, formerly known as yeah, Twitter. For, for all the stuff we see on X, if you, do you guys want to hit somebody second and have a bunch of L's, or do you want somebody second and have another parade? To me, that's just the way I look at it. I, I, I want to have somebody hit second and have a parade. Yeah, I just... I... I think his take is just so. What's what is specifically wrong about it? Because the idea because, that they have uh, because the Yankees don't win because Aaron Judge bats second because the well, they didn't win last year because the Angels don't win because Otani and Trout let off that like some reason Jordan Alvarez betting also second true. is some flawed philosophy. It, it might be they are four and eight with him batting second. You're right. I mean they are. <laughs> See, I mean that's the best part about this. And now, is this argument you can disingenuously make yeah. is, is it's, technically true. It's, it is technically true, but as Jeremy Brandon points out on Twitter, the Jeremy that I like, uh, not to, he says not you to be like on it? pace oh. guy, but Jordan Alvarez is on pace for 148 and a half RBIs batting second. Well, because where I strongly... Third. Could yeah, be how many wins? How many wins though? How four. many wins are they on pace? Four for? wins. Uh, well, they have four wins. We, are the, you know, what I know they're not on pace for for Sean, Brian, and I to win money. That's mm. what I know they're not on pace that's, for. That's not good. But I just, I don't like the four argument times because sixteen is like about. Let's just say, you know, you played twelve games. So it's twelve out of 
12 out of 162. It's about it's about one sixteenth of the season or so. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, if you multiply that four by sixteen, Joe. <laughs> no. The, out. The the the, it's the like Astros, sixty wins. Right. So so they are on pace. I will be on pace, guy Jeremy Brand. I'm going after my guy Jeremy Booth to be on pace, guy here. Okay, I'm I'm making this argument seriously. There's not even a twinkle in my eye. I would never be sarcastic. Never happened in my life. But they are on pace right now for four times 16, 64 wins. Now that is bad. 64 and 102. All right. No, 98. 98. It wouldn't be 100 losses. There we go. Yeah. No, I'm not the only bad math person on the show. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm just using the data available to me, just like these dorks do. And the yeah, best yeah. part is, you can use this and rub it in their face, even though it's completely wrong. It's fun. Yeah, I just, I don't, I just don't enjoy. Fight it. the nerds with yeah. fire. And then, and then, like when the Take Astros are good, better, bitch. <laughs> when the Astros are good in June, you'd just be like, "Hey, happy it all worked out." <laughs> <laughs> Jordan, what a beast! This is see, like a lot of my, a lot of my defense of Dusty Baker last year and defense of Martin Maldonado last year was because these people suck. You know, even if I they're right, that. they suck. Yeah, screw them. So I, I'm I team Jeremy that. Booth here. Uh, Jeremy Booth. He knows what he's talking about. Well, Th- these that is true. The Astros are not on pace for a parade right now. Yeah, they're not. Um, but also, my, my issue, I just, I don't like the argument because, well, it's first right. of all, well, I'm going to say it's factually incorrect because there is a team that had their second best, that had their best hitter batting second win the World Series last year. Corey mm-hmm. Seager is by far the best hitter in the Rangers lineup. No, no he's he no Dolores Garcia, so that's wrong. I think Corey Seager's better. Adoles Garcia. Well, I only watch Astros Rangers games, and guess what? Uh, Adoles Garcia kills the Astros. I would never watch another Rangers game because I have a life. But uh, based entirely off of Astros Rangers games, Joe, you're wrong. Adoles Garcia is the best you're Rangers right. hitter. True. So again, who knows ball? Paul knows ball. <laughs> Baseball, Paul. Only if it happens in an Astros game, <laughs> right? And the nerds are against it. It's true. I just, yeah, I don't like Jeremy Booth's argument. I think it's very flawed. But at the same time, if Joe Spotty changed the lineup today, whatever. I'm not going to like die on the yeah. hill that Jordan Alvarez has to bat second. Yeah, at put the same Bregman time. in the two holes so he can like, get on base in front. Oh, no, wait. Have him lead off guy. <laughs> Bregman's your lead off guy. Just let him sit there for four pitches and try to get a walk. Like, just make Alex Bregman, John Singleton to start the game at this point. <laughs> I'll take it. Just to run up the pitch count. Yeah, just run up the pitch count, Alex. <laughs> That's your job. Don't swing at the first pitch. All right, it's time. It's it's Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? It's, it's Wednesday. Wednesday. It's time for Soft Boys here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. First, let me tell you about my friends at Pendleton Whiskey. Some of you guys might be thinking, hey, Paul, did you have a few too many Pendleton before the show with that support of Jerry Bear Booth's argument? No. No, I would never do that. But after the show. You know what I'm going to do. One raw, two fingers worth of that smooth, refreshing goodness. You see, Pendleton whiskey is forged in the fires of one of the oldest rodeos in North America, the Pendleton Roundup. And it gave birth to a whiskey that is made with some fantastic stuff. Glacier water from Mount Hood, the finest northern grains. It's barrel-aged in American oak. You blend it all together, and you've got something that's going to help you unlock your inner cowboy. You can find Pendleton Whiskey wherever you get your liquor, also at drizzly.com. They have all sorts of options that you can use Pendleton Whiskey to make different cocktails on their website. Check them out, pendletonwhiskey.com, something that I've been really enjoying recently, the iced coffee with a little splash of Pendleton in it in the middle of the afternoon on the weekends. Ooh, it blends really well together. It's Pendleton Whiskey. So many ways to enjoy it. It's true Western tradition.
Soft boys here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. It's time. Who's soft? Let's start with the world of rap, Joe George. Mm. Now, I'll be honest. I know less about music than I do about baseball. This, this hoodlum music frightens me. It confuses me. Careful calling it hoodlum music. My bad. Especially with the, all the Dana Brown slander Joe's been throwing around. This and ru- Jeremy Booth I'll, now, too. This, this ruffian, this ruffian music. Rough and tumble. This street urchin music. Oh, okay. So, I don't know who J. Cole is. I do know who Kendrick <laughs> Lamar is. Kendrick Lamar, right? One of the best rappers of all time? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you can't read, but yes. You, well, his name is Kendrick Lamar. I'm just Do you not know how it. to say the word Lamar? Um, what do you think Lamar Jackson's name is? It's Lamar Jackson. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Kendrick Lamar and somebody named uh, K. Cole, uh, Coles, they got into a beef, and this is something you don't do in the rap game, Joe. Mm-hmm. When you throw a diss track at somebody, you don't apologize afterwards. And J. Cole, who made a diss track about Kendrick Lamar, well, he was lame himself. And actually apologize for it. That's soft. Definition of soft. You ain't going to last in the streets. If you do that, y'all mean? Yep. Why are you, why are you not responding to I just story? don't know what to say. Is it soft to <laughs> apologize the, after a diss track? Uh, yes, 100%. You can't apologize. Here you go. Yeah. The, 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 it's honestly crazy that he did that. He did it at his own, like, yeah. at his own uh, festival. I think Eminem apologized for some of the stuff like he put out in the early 2000s, and that just kind of pissed me well, off. Well, normally, like Eminem, yeah, apologized 20 years after the fact. Yeah. <laughs> J. Cole apologized 48 hours after the fact. Yeah, I don't. Before anyone like responded, too. He's I, I like, know. put out the song. People were like, oh, all right, it's fine. It's not, not really that good. And then he was like, you know what? I'm sorry. I wasn't true to my soul. And like, yeah, that's also lame. And if you're not true to your soul, <laughs> yeah, like, you can't go back to the streets. <laughs> he, he threw out a lot of therapy words in, in there. He, well, would you rather someone apologize or be true to their soul, Paul? I would rather them be true to their soul. You know, like Jennifer Lopez, for example. Mm. You know, don't be fooled by the rocks that she's got. She's still 30 years after that song, you know billionaire that she is Mm -hmm. she's still jenny from the block and she's she wants people to know that you know she is from the block do you see that video the other day where she's looking at the mirror it's part of this documentary for a terrible movie that's coming out and she also directed this documentary and she's looking in the mirror and her hair is curly she's like yeah i see a young girl who's you know was was on the block running up and down the block it's like hey jennifer it's been over half your life since you've even been in that realm let's uh let's move on yeah, when's the last time you watched like a good uh jennifer lopez movie jiggly well when what, what are the jennifer lopez hits <laughs> that, i don't know that, anaconda i assume that you have do you have her uh I'm trying, well, her page the, up well, she's one... always in movies where she is getting engaged especially the more recent movies which w- include a yes jennifer lopez who is still s- smoking hot for 50 years old, but she's 50 yeah. years old. It's like, what, oh. what are your thoughts on Shotgun Wedding from 2022? Oh, with Josh Duhamel? Yeah. <laughs> Duhamel? It's Duhamel's. <laughs> Kendrick Lamar. Uh, Soft Boys continues. Did you see... The Wedding Planner? Greg oh. Doyle. That was good. Greg Doyle... 2001. ...wrote a column, There's no hiding in the NCAA tournament on the court. I saw this. Or off. And Purdue just showed the country what we've known around here. Boilers are all class. So he's doing the all pander to your local market because he yeah. writes for the Indie Star. But in this article, he also ripped Dan Hurley for playing a, excuse me, coaching a style of basketball that he finds unbecoming. The arrogance of Dan Hurley, wrote Doyle. Did you know? Not me. Yeah, sure. We've seen the clips of him getting into it with fans on the road. But those clips come without context and aren't fair to judge. Any idea what people say to Hurley to make him hold up his hand and point to his ring finger, referencing the national title he's won and your team hasn't? Again, not me. Do you think that Purdue, like the Indianapolis Colts, raising a banner for AFC finalists are going to raise a banner for final 
two finalists. Okay. Uh, yes, but being classy in a loss. I think they should. This is actually the only time where I think it's okay to lose and to celebrate it. But it has it's to be a, making the final four. Yeah, yeah. It's not getting the champion. It's just fi- like a final four banner makes sense. It's a sixty-eight team tournament. It is not easy to get to the final four. It's the only sport in which you can lose and still like be viewed as very successful. That, that's what uh, Dell and I were talking about before the tournament. We we're like, is it unfair? It's kind of unfair to be like, you have to win this tournament, U of H. <laughs> Otherwise, it yeah. is a failure. Well. And uh, we decided that like making the final four is like the benchmark of like, okay, then what happens happens. Yeah. But making the final four is the accomplishment. Now they 